What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to, What If I Was in Marvel as Spider-Man? Conqueror of Multiverse. Part 9. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story, link in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Focusing on the mental link that he just established with Jean, Peter visualized his mind as a small glowing orb, and Jean's mind as a vast, swirling mass of energy. He pushed his orb toward the center of the mass and felt himself being pulled in. And when he opened his eyes again, Peter was no longer in his own body. Jean's mind was extremely hectic at the moment, filled with nothing but flames and darkness. Peter could feel the raw power of the phoenix coursing through every neuron and synapse of her brain. Hello? He called out tentatively. Is anyone there? Peter didn't expect to be meeting an entity like the Phoenix Force anytime soon. For the first time in a long time, he was nervous about possibly losing a fight. After all, Thanos may be strong, but he's nothing more than an ant in the eyes of the Phoenix, the universal force of creation and destruction. Suddenly, a female voice answered his call, but it wasn't Jean's. It was a voice that seemed to come from every direction at once, booming and echoing like thunder. Hmm, interesting. The voice spoke with a soft interest. I can feel the presence of an Infinity Stone. Who are you, mortal? I'm a... I'm just your friendly universal Spider-Man. I'm here to help Jean. Peter turned in a circle, looking for the origin of the voice, but he couldn't find anyone in his surroundings. Does she sense the reality stone? Your help is unneeded, the phoenix said. This isn't necessarily a bad thing. What do you mean? Peter asked in confusion. The phoenix force seemed pretty relaxed. That telepath teacher of hers sealed my power and inadvertently turned my host into a dark phoenix, a being of pure destruction. It said, its voice echoing across Jean's mind. But a dark phoenix has its uses. Stagnation is rampant in this universe, after all. Peter kept a watchful eye on his surroundings, in case the phoenix tried to attack him. I understand your point, but I can't just allow her to go mad like this. Peter cuts in before the phoenix could continue. Jean wouldn't want this. She's supposed to be your host. Don't you want to help her? The area turns silent for a moment before Peter continues. Based on what I understand from the situation, Jean's currently going mad with power while also being influenced by your destructive nature. The best way to solve this would be sealing your power to dash before Peter could finish what he was going to say, the flames in his surroundings gravitated into one fiery being, which loomed over him with a fierce glare. The phoenix appeared in all of its fiery glory. Insert picture of the phoenix force here, I will not be contained any longer. It said, its voice menacing. Can you let me finish? Peter asked in annoyance. This isn't going as I originally hoped. Peter felt as though he was talking to some indifferent god who hasn't interacted with others in millennia. Wait. That's probably exactly what this is, Peter thought with a sigh. The phoenix stared down at him, waiting for Peter to speak. What I meant earlier was that you would have to seal a portion of your powers. Jean can't handle all of this right now. With a lower output from you, she can slowly grow accustomed to everything without going insane. This is the most peaceful resolution. Peaceful. The phoenix asked uncaringly as its flames shine brightly. This isn't about peace. It's about balance. Creation and destruction. It just so happens that this host was set on a darker path. Peter sighed in resignation. He knew where this conversation was headed. If the phoenix refused to reconcile the situation, then it can only escalate in one direction. Peter would try one last time before giving up hope at a peaceful resolution. Please he pleaded which was something he rarely ever did. Think of your host. Jean doesn't want to turn into some angry destroyer. We can fix this before it gets any further out of hand. There's nothing to fix, mortal. And you are a fool to think otherwise. The phoenix shook its head at him. And before Peter could react, the phoenix unleashed a blast of flames at him. He dodged as best he could, but the heat singed his skin and he felt himself being pushed back toward the edge of Jean's mind. He tried to reason with the phoenix, to plead with it, but it was like talking to a haughty hurricane. In the end, he had no choice but to retreat, pulling his consciousness out of Jean's mind before the phoenix could destroy him completely. Opening his eyes and gasping for air, Peter felt the weight of his own body once more. Before him, stood Jean, covered in searing hot flames, which slowly burned away the restraints that he placed on her. He had failed. He wasn't able to reason with the phoenix, as he hoped. In fact, his interference seemed to have made matters worse. Well, I guess now it's time for the hard way, Peter thought as the easy route failed spectacularly. On a large floating asteroid in the deep reaches of space, a group of long-neck alien doctors crowded around a large floating figure. Thanos, the invincible mad titan. Though he didn't fit that image anymore. 
Unlike his usual strong and healthy presence, Thanos currently appeared weakened and frail due to his poisoning and subsequent coma. His once imposing physique appears shrunken and emaciated, his skin pale and dull, and his breathing rough and labored, giving the impression that he is barely clinging to life. Can you heal him or not? A shrill menacing voice asks. The poor doctors jumped in fright as they turned and bowed their heads. Across from them stood a tall, slender alien with pale skin and dark eyes. He has a bald head and a prominent nose, with sharp, angular features that give him a somewhat menacing appearance. He wears a long, flowing robe that drapes over his body and reaches down to the ground, made of a dark, silky material that seems to shimmer in the light. Insert picture of Ebony Ma here. The scared doctors didn't dare to speak. Though Ma knew the answer already. Useless. He bellowed angrily as the doctor's head snapped backward like an owl, killing them in an instant. Although Ma was able to remove the poison from his father's body, thanks to his fine control and telekinesis, that didn't completely solve the problem. The poison may be gone, but the damage it did seem to be irreversible. No doctor, specialist, shaman, treasure, etc. could recover the mad titan's condition. He was at a complete loss. Despite his vast knowledge of the universe, Ma had been unable to find anything that could reverse the damage. But just when he thought all was lost, a massive humanoid figure, standing around 28 feet tall, appeared floating before him. This man possesses an incredibly muscular and imposing physique. His skin is a deep, metallic purple, and his eyes glow with an otherworldly intensity. Insert picture of Galactus here, it was Galactus, the devourer of worlds. Galactus wore a distinctive, silvery suit of armor that covers his entire body. The armor is made up of intricate plates, each one overlapping the other to create a seamless, impenetrable defense. Atop his head, Galactus wore a towering helmet that resembles a crown. The helmet has a pair of long horns that curve upwards and outwards, giving him a very intimidating appearance. Ebony Ma was taken aback by the sight of the cosmic entity, but he soon composed himself and greeted Galactus. Galactus, what do you want? Ebony Ma asked as he stood protectively in front of his father's motionless body. I've come to offer you a deal, Galactus replied. A deal? Ebony Ma asked, intrigued. I can heal the mad titan, but there is a stipulation. Galactus watched as Ma fidgeted under his gaze. After all, Galactus is someone that even his father wouldn't risk offending. At least, not without a few infinity stones on hand. What stipulation? Ma tried not to get his hopes up. Thanos must give me the infinity stones after he's completed his objective with them, Galactus explained magnanimously. Ma hesitated. He knew that the infinity stones were a powerful tool, and he wasn't sure if he could trust Galactus. What do you want with the infinity stones? Ebony Ma asked in suspicion. That's none of your business, Galactus refused to answer. Though I will promise not to undo your father's work. Ma thought for a moment. He knew that Thanos valued the Infinity Stones above all else, and he wasn't sure if he could convince his father to part with them. Very well, I accept your offer. Ma ultimately gave in. If his father wanted to back out of the deal later on, then they would simply cross that bridge when they got to it. For now, his father needed healing. Excellent. Galactus smirked as he reached down toward Thanos' frail and unconscious body. Peter stood in the mirror dimension, his spider sense tingling as he sensed Jean's powers continue to grow with no end in sight. Now, how should I handle this? Peter wondered as he watched Jean slowly burn her way out of his reality stone-powered spell, her red hair glowing with fiery energy while her eyes burning with an otherworldly intensity. She turned to face him, her expression cold and unyielding. Don't worry, Jean. Peter spoke warmly, hoping the same portion of her mind was listening. I won't hurt you too badly, but I'll have to get a little rough nonetheless. Jean didn't answer, instead lifting her now free hands and unleashing a wave of telekinetic energy at him. Peter dodged and weaved, narrowly avoiding the blast, and shot a web at her, hoping to immobilize her. Sadly, she easily burned it away with a flick of her wrist. Peter leaped forward, aiming a kick at her head. Jean, empowered by the phoenix, tried to catch his leg, but he wouldn't allow that. Spinning midair, Peter kicked her hand away with one leg and kicked her head like a soccer ball with the other, sending her crashing into a nearby building, shattering its windows. Peter landed perfectly on his feet and watched as the entire building Jean was in exploded in red-hot flames. Jean's eyes flared with even more power as she stepped out of the burning building, eyeing Peter angrily. What's with that look? Peter asks tauntingly before giving her a shrug. I tried to do things peacefully. If you can't handle the heat, then step out of the kitchen. In response, Jean unleashed a barrage of telekinetic attacks at him, sending him sliding back across the street. Though thankfully, Peter was able to stay on his feet. He thought of counter with his web-slinging skills, but Jean would probably just burn them again. Finally, Peter saw an opening and charged forward, aiming a punch at Jean's face. But Jean was too quick, and she caught his fist in mid-air, crushing it with her rapidly increasing strength. Ugh. Peter grunted in pain but didn't give up, jabbing with his other fist, surprising her. That wasn't very nice? Peter commented as Jean tumbled across the street and landed on her back. Of course, Jean wouldn't stay down for long, using her telekinesis to climb back to her feet, glaring at Peter with her brows furrowed. Though it wasn't just a simple glare. 
Since physically fighting wasn't producing the results that she was hoping for, Jean decided to unleash a massive blast of telepathic energy in his direction. Her goal was simple. Destroy Peter's conscious and unconscious mind, turning him into a vegetable for the rest of his life. And although Peter was caught off guard by this form of attack, his many defenses weren't, easily deflecting everything right back at her. Ag. Jean screamed as she collapsed to her knees, cradling her head. Oops, that's gotta hurt? Peter muttered as his defenses acted on their own. Hopefully, I didn't scramble her brains. Pushing through the pain, Jean picked her head up and glared at her opponent, her eyes still burning with the power of the Phoenix Force. You fought well, Jean. Peter said, his voice calm and understanding. But we should stop this now. I can help you learn control, but you have to take hold of it yourself first. Don't let it sweep you away like this. Jean tried to get up, but her body wouldn't cooperate, stumbling to the ground once again. Summoning all her strength, Jean burned brightly as she rose to her feet once again, ignoring the throbbing pain in her head. You don't give up easily, huh? Peter commented with a sigh. Kicking off the ground, Peter used the opportunity of her hurt mind to unleash a final punch to the side of her head, hitting her with all the strength he could muster. After all, the phoenix should be able to keep her alive. Once again, Jean flew backward, her eyes flickering for a moment, returning to the old Jean before burning brightly once again. Peter seized the chance, grabbing her by the back of the head and slamming her into the concrete sidewalk, hoping to awaken her fully this time. But Jean wouldn't let that happen and used her telekinesis to fling him away, break her fall in the process. That telekinesis of yours is really useful? Peter said as he landed on his feet. Maybe I should evolve with her blood next? After all, telepathy and telekinesis would be good additions to his growing list of superpowers. And if he's lucky enough, he might even get some of her phoenix host abilities as well. As the fight continued in the mirror dimension, Peter could see that Jean was completely consumed by the phoenix force. He knew that reasoning with her was no longer an option and that he had to find a way to subdue her and free her from the phoenix force's influence. That might work? Peter thought as he dodged another telekinetic blast. Hey, I'm going to try something new so try not to die, okay? Since the spell he used to bind her was burned away, Peter put his mystic arts on the back burner and pulled out his newest trump card. Of course, he could have tried a couple more advanced spells or even fall back on the reality stone, but he also wanted to test out a theory of his. Question mark. Jean stilled as she wondered what he would do. She watched as her opponent swelled and grew, muscles bulging and expanding. Peter's spider suit stretched alongside him, perfectly containing his giant figure without a single tear in its fabric. The most menacing addition to his transformation was most definitely the glowing eyes. His mask's white eyes seemed to glow, signifying a bright light underneath. Remember, don't die, okay? Peter repeated as he kicked off the ground and disappeared. Jean's glowing eyes widened as he appeared before her in a burst of pure speed. How his huge body could move so quickly was truly a mystery. Swiping his hand at her, Peter easily swatted Jean away like a fly, but she quickly regained her sense, unleashing a barrage of psychic attacks while soaring through the air. Peter's spider sense tingled, warning him of each attack, but he didn't bother dodging this time around. Huh? That tickled? He commented as her attacks hit his body, doing absolutely nothing to his new hulking frame. Seeing this, Jean felt genuine fear for the first time since unlocking her phoenix powers. Launching another telekinetic assault out of fear, Peter simply shook his head and stomped over, taking the attacks with ease. He swung his hand forward and grasped her entire body, binding her burning form. Picking her up and holding her at eye level, Peter felt the heat from her flaming figure warming his hand. Struggling to free herself, Jean continued to lash out with her telekinetic powers. Hmm, you'd make a good space heater. Peter said as he gave her a quick squeeze HHHH. Jean screamed in pain as her bones creaked under the pressure. Stop struggling. Peter warned as he eased up on his grip. Of course, Jean's mind was filled with nothing but fury and destruction, so she didn't listen. But Peter managed to keep hold of her, squeezing once again to teach her just how useless it was. As she struggled, a bright light began to shine from within Jean's chest, emanating from the Phoenix Force. Question mark. Peter watched in interest as he felt her begin to pry his fingers apart. I should test it now. Activating his most precious Red Hulk ability, Peter waited and hoped that his hunch was correct. Suddenly, just as Jean was about to escape his grasp, Peter felt a surge of hot energy rush into his hand and spread throughout the rest of his body. Hee <laughs> hee, it worked. Peter laughed as Jean's strength swiftly drained, leaving her trapped in his hand once again. Jean's eyes widened in confusion as her powers were sucked away from her. It started with the Shroud of Flames, which extinguished rather quickly and moved on to the rest of her phoenix energy. Slowly, the light began to fade, and Jean's struggles lessened as her mind calmed at a rapid pace. As Peter continued to hold on to her, he felt the phoenix force's hold on Jean weaken, until finally, it dissipated completely. Lastly, Jean's eyes dimmed and returned to their normal look. Panting heavily, Peter sat back, watching as Jean slowly awoke in his grasp, looking around in confusion. Taking in all of that energy was exhausting, Peter thought as his body glowed in a bright orange sheen. As Spider-Man? Is that you? What happened? Jean stuttered in complete confusion as she grimaced in pain, 
wondering why Earth's favorite hero was so big. That's a long story. Peter sets her down and shrinks back to his normal form. Ignoring the confused and shocked look she was giving him, Peter waved his hand and opened a golden portal. Come on, I have a bald idiot to yell at. As Peter stepped through the portal with a disbelieving and confused Jean Grey following close behind, he couldn't help but feel relieved that he had managed to save her from the destructive influence of the Phoenix Force. However, as they approached the X-Mansion, his relief turned into shock as he saw the extent of the damage. The mansion was partially burned, though it looks like they were thankfully able to stop the fire before it could spread too far. Peter walked across the front lawn and quickly drew the attention of the students, who were gossiping about the whole situation. They were about to rush over and excitedly bombard him with questions, as they did earlier, but they stopped in their tracks when they saw Jean standing behind him. It didn't take long for word to spread about the cause of the fire. After all, gossip always travels fast in schools. Although the little girl that Jean initially protected kept her mouth, to protect the big sister that stood up for her, the same couldn't be said for the bullies who started all of this. No, they practically screamed Jean's name from the mountaintops, making sure that every child knew it was her who went crazy and set fire to their precious school. And now, no one wanted to go anywhere near her. Well, except for one person. Big sister. The bullied little girl who kept her mouth shut all this time rushed out of the crowd of students. Are you okay? The little girl stood in front of Jean and tilted her head questioningly. Yeah, I'm okay now. Jean answered uncertainly. She couldn't remember anything after stepping in front of the girl, separating her from the school's known bullies. Tears started to form in the little girl's eyes as she smiled and jumped forward, wrapping her arms around her savior's waist. Jean's eyes widened as she hesitantly returned the hug. What the hell happened? Leaving Jean behind for the time being, Peter walked over to the front of the mansion. There, he saw Professor X, standing near the entrance, looking worried and guilty. Although he didn't fully understand the situation, Charles felt that this was somehow his fault. Of course, he was right. Storm, Wolverine, Beast, Nightcrawler, and a few other teachers stood alongside him, questioning him about today's incident. Even Magneto was among them. Professor, Peter called out as he walked over. Charles and every teacher beside him turned to Peter with hopeful looks in their eyes. Where's Jean? Is she alright? Yeah, she's over there with the other students. Peter points over his shoulder. Instantly, Storm paced past Peter without a single word, rushing to check on her student. As the head of the girls' dormitory, Storm is partially responsible for every female student's well-being, and she took that responsibility very seriously. Soon enough, every other teacher followed after her as well, leaving only Charles, Magneto, and Peter behind. What happened? Eric asks as he knew even less than Charles. This idiot. Peter gestures toward Professor X locked away Jean's powers without knowing the full scope of the situation. I didn't mean any harm. Charles spoke up in defense of himself. Eric smirked as he found himself enjoying this conversation. It's not every day that the great magnanimous Professor X gets something wrong. If I didn't come visit today, the whole school would have probably burned to the ground and it's very likely that students would have died, Peter says matter-of-factly. This wasn't just some small mess up, Charles. If left unhindered, Jean would have burned this entire planet to ash. Professor X looked at Peter, his expression sad and regretful. I know you're upset, but I had no choice. Jean's powers were too dangerous, and I couldn't risk letting them get out of control. I did what I thought was best for her and for everyone else. Yes, but you should have contacted the Avengers for this sort of thing. Peter rolls his eyes under his mask. You had no idea what you were dealing with. This isn't just some powerful ex-Jean. Jean is the host for the universe's embodiment of creation and destruction. What? Jean exclaimed as she walked over with her teachers following closely behind. Peter let out an exasperated sigh as he turned to see Jean's shocked and confused expression. I might as well explain now that everyone is here. Peter quickly explained Jean's situation. As soon as Peter was done speaking, everyone turned to Charles with a disapproving looks in their eyes. And God, Magneto was loving this. Jean spoke up, her voice weak but determined. Wait. It's not his fault. Like you said, the Phoenix is a force of nature. I'm the one who should be blamed. I let it influence me, and I nearly destroyed everything I care about. Her nightmares almost came to fruition, leaving a self-deprecating frown on her face. Peter turned to Jean, his expression softening. No, it's not your fault whatsoever. You're just a victim of something that's beyond your control. I'll help you control the Phoenix's powers, but it's going to take a lot of time and dedication. Jean seemed eager to get her newfound powers under control, though she did feel a bit of hesitation as she didn't want to go crazy again. Turning back to Professor X, Peter's tone was less angry but still firm. If you ever come across something that you don't understand, I expect a council meeting to be called immediately. Am I clear? Yes. This won't happen again. You have my word. Professor X nodded, his eyes filled with determination. Good. Peter said as he turned back to Jean. Go inside and pack your bags. What? Jean wasn't expecting that, nor did her teachers. You'll be staying in the Avengers Tower until I'm confident that you can control yourself. Peter explains, not taking no for an answer. But what about school and my friends? 
Jean argues as she turns to look over her shoulder. Standing across the yard, she could see Cyclops, Kitty Pride, X-23, Angel, and a few others worriedly waiting for her. You can still attend school as long as Nightcrawler is willing to ferry you back and forth, Peter said, placating Charles before he could argue as well. As for your friends, you can see them during school hours? Fine. Jean was hesitant, though she ultimately gave in. Walked into the mansion alongside Storm, Jean went to pack her things, ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. She knew it wouldn't be easy, but she also knew that she had Spider-Man at her side, which was a very big confidence booster. Are you sure this is a good idea? Charles asks hesitantly. Although he doesn't like that his student is basically being poached right in front of him, Charles also knows that he has no room to complain. After all, he is the cause for all of this, and still wouldn't know where to begin with her training. When it comes to metahumans and X-genes, the professor can be said to be a world-renowned expert, but this wasn't in either of these categories. This was an issue that only the mystic arts could solve. At least, as far as he knew. Yes, staying at the tower will be much safer, and I'll be able to set a strict training schedule for her. Peter explains as Charles frowned, sad that his prized student was being taken away. Though he understood that it was in her best interest. You're welcome to visit her whenever you want, Peter added as he noticed the professor's predicament. You can even continue to teach her outside of classes, but you'd have to do so at the tower. We can add a slot for you in her new training schedule. Suddenly, a small bit of hope returned to the professor's face. Thank you, I'd like that very much, Charles said gratefully. He didn't expect Peter to trust him so much after his mistake. Minutes later, Storm and Jean returned with suitcases in hand. Is that everything? Peter asked and received a nod. All right, then let's go and get you settled back at the tower. As a portal appeared and Jean followed Peter inside, her friends couldn't help but frown as they watched her disappear along with her luggage, leaving them and every other student wondering if she was expelled. Sighing to himself, Charles looked over at his slightly burned mansion. This is going to be expensive to fix. After settling Jean into an apartment and showing her around the tower, Peter portaled back to his empty bedroom, feeling drained and exhilarated at the same time. He had absorbed a lot of Phoenix Force energy, and now he felt a strange, pulsing power coursing through his veins. Am I evolving? Peter wondered as he quickly portaled into his Avengers penthouse, where Jeannie was cooking up some food, looking like a blue Gordon Ramsay. A slash N, it's freaking raw. Hot, Jeannie grunted in confusion as Peter tumbled out of a portal and fell at his feet. You alright, pal? Evolving, Peter muttered in exhaustion. Based on how hot he was feeling right now, Peter half expecting to see flames or some other sign of his evolution. But everything looked normal, except for the fact that his body was beginning to glow in a red hue. Peter closed his eyes and tried to remain calm. After all, he's been through a couple of evolutions already. As his eyes closed, he felt a surge of energy, like a thousand suns burning inside him, crisping his body from the inside out. I wasn't cooking pork, was I? Jeannie wondered as the smell of cooked meat filled the kitchen. Though he soon noticed where it was coming from. Don't worry. Jeannie's got you. Jeannie exclaimed as he summoned a giant block of ice under his master and about ten floating air conditioners, which all blew chilled air in his direction. Is that better? Peter wasn't able to respond verbally, but the eased look on his face said it all. Hours later, once the heat in his body died down, Peter sighed in relief as he enjoyed the cold feeling on his reddened skin for a moment. You okay, pal? Jeannie asked worriedly. Yeah, just give me a minute, Peter said as he melted into the ice. Okay, I made some food if you're hungry, Jeannie offered as he took off his chef's hat and transformed into a waiter. Is it hot? Peter asks as Jeannie gives him a nod. Then no thanks. You got any ice cream? Snapping his fingers, Jeannie summoned a giant tub of ice cream alongside a large spoon and handed them over. Still laying down on the ice, Peter quickly shoveled spoonfuls of deliciously chilled ice cream down his face hole. Oh, that's so good. Once he had enough of the cold and finished his ice cream, Peter hopped up to his feet and got right to work. He had new powers to test after all. He immediately realized that he could control fire, as that seemed like the easiest thing to test after his heated evolution. But that wasn't all. Cosmic fire manipulation, Peter tested his fire and found that it wasn't any ordinary flame. The fire that he could produce and control was on a whole other level. It was so strong that it could incinerate anything that it touched. Flight, shrouding himself in flames, Peter learned that he could fly at incredible speeds and even travel through space without the need for oxygen. Telepathy and telekinesis, Peter can read and control the thoughts of others, as well as move objects with his mind. Though these powers are incredibly weak at the moment. After a short amount of practice, Peter was able to control and read the minds of a few animals, and as for his telekinesis, he is only able to lift about a pound. I'll have to make a new training plan for these. Peter thought as he knew these powers were very useful. Healing and regeneration, Peter's healing factor increased yet again, allowing him to heal extremely quickly. Immortality, this one is just a guess, as Peter found that his cells are no longer aging. More testing would be needed to confirm this. If there were any other powers, then Peter didn't notice them, but he was more than happy with what he got. Even if he has to train them up to be usable in combat. 
For a moment, he was tempted to let himself go, to revel in this new, godlike power. After all, he just evolved using the Phoenix Force's energy, a being far above Celestials and other puny godlike beings. And best of all, Peter wasn't actually a host of the Phoenix, so he didn't have to worry about some overpowered entity in his head, watching his every move or telling him what to do. He he ha 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 ha, Peter laughed madly. Bonked though, before he could go too crazy, Genie snapped his fingers and dropped a cartoon-style anvil on his head. Arg! Peter grunted as it bashed him in the head and toppled to the floor by his feet. What the hell was that for? You were going all Jaffer on me, so I had to knock some sense into you, Genie says as he summons a mirror in front of him, which showed him dressed as the villain from Aladdin. You're really obsessed with that movie, aren't you? Peter asked as Genie pretended not to hear him. Peter walked through the quiet corridors of the Avengers Tower, his mind focused and ready. It's been a week since he saved Jean from becoming a dark phoenix and now he planned to meet the phoenix force for a second time. Throughout the week, Peter has been teaching her the basics of energy control that he learned in Kamartage, but no matter how much she tried, Jean found it almost impossible to control even a speck of the phoenix's flames. After only a week, Peter didn't expect any huge advancement from her, but he expected advancement nonetheless. And there was only one reason that he could think of for his new student's lack of progress. The phoenix is interfering? Peter came to this conclusion yesterday. Either it wasn't happy with Peter's meddling, or it didn't approve of Jean anymore, as she couldn't produce a single spark of its power. Reaching her apartment, Peter knocked and waited patiently for her to answer. And as the door swung open, Jean couldn't keep the smile from forming on her face. Hey, she said softly. After a week of tutelage under Peter, Jean's hero worship deepened even further. She officially had a crush on Spider-Man. And Peter was completely oblivious to her infatuation, not that he would reciprocate her feelings either way. He's a taken man after all. Hey, Jean. Can we talk? Peter stepped inside, his mind focused on the task at hand. Of course. She nodded, locking the door shut as they made their way to the living room. I'll get straight to the point. Peter took a seat on the sofa and looked at her seriously. I need to talk to the Phoenix. Instantly, Jean's happy mood swiftly disappeared. Oh okay, but are you sure it's still inside of me? Jean asks hesitantly. I've tried communicating with it like you taught me, but it feels like I'm talking to a brick wall. I know, Peter said. But I think it's just playing hard to get. We need to convince it to help you control its powers. Jean looked at him skeptically. But if it's gone, can't we just forget about it and move on? She asked hopefully. After all, the phoenix has brought nothing good to her life whatsoever. We don't know that. Peter shook his head. And we can't risk everyone's safety on a hopeful guess? Jean looked at him, her hopeful eyes turning somber in an instant. All right, let's do it. Jean begrudgingly agrees. Good, now let's see what's going on. Peter stands from his seat and walks up to Jean, placing his hand on her forehead. Ready? Why yeah? Jean squeaks as her face turns a bright shade of red, matching her hair. He's touching me. Peter took a deep breath and closed his eyes, reaching out to Jean's mind as he did in the mirror dimension. Suddenly, Peter found himself back in Jean's mind, though this time it was much more normal. Instead of the former darkness and fire, he was met with a calm and sunny meadow. Beautiful, Peter thought. He looked around, taking in the surreal landscape of Jean Grey's unconscious mind, trying to figure out where he needed to go to find the Phoenix Force. And as if on cue, he felt the fiery presence of cosmic energy and walked in its direction. Soon enough, Peter found the source, an enormous lake of fire, surrounded by swirling flames that danced and crackled around the whole area. As he arrived, he heard a familiar voice calling out to him, echoing through the flames. Spider-Man. I have been expecting you. Peter turned to see a bird-shaped figure emerging from the fire, striding towards him with a regal air. I sense a wisp of my power in you. The Phoenix Force spoke to him, its voice echoing in the surroundings. First an infinity stone and now my own energy. You are quite the anomaly, aren't you? Peter stood in front of the Phoenix Force, its energy crackling and pulsing in the air around him. I sense a wisp of my power in you. The Phoenix Force spoke to him in interest, its voice echoing in the surroundings. First an infinity stone and now my own energy. You are quite the anomaly, aren't you? Well, I try. Peter shrugged, taking her words as a compliment. Peering down at him, the Phoenix began to shrink as its energy coalesced and took on a humanoid shape. Peter was surprised to find a beautiful, shining woman standing before him, cloaked in a fiery dress. You seek my help? She said, her voice like a chorus of flames. Peter nodded, taking a deep breath to steady himself. Usually, he had no fear when facing things like this, but when it comes to the Phoenix Force, he couldn't help but feel the pressure of her presence. After all, she could kill him at any moment. Reality stone or not, the Phoenix Force was far too high up on the food chain compared to likes of Peter, Thanos, and any other universal powerhouse. Yeah he said with a nod, hiding his nerves behind a confident persona. Jean is having trouble with your powers, and if my guess is correct, then you're the reason behind that, right? The phoenix tilted her head, studying Peter with her shining eyes that burned like the heart of a star. I can help her, she said, ignoring Peter's accusation completely. But I require something in exchange. What do you want? 
Peter frowned as his hypothesis was proven correct. She knew I would come. It didn't take a genius to figure out that she orchestrated this whole meeting. Since you caused me to lose a dark phoenix, you will become my destroyer in Jean's place the phoenix said matter of factly. You will eliminate the growing stagnation in this universe in my name, so that new seeds of creations may grow and rise from the ashes. Huh? Peter grunted in shock as he shook his head in disbelief. I can't do that. I'm Spider-Man. I can't go around destroying the universe. I have a reputation to uphold, you know? The phoenix chuckled in amusement. Don't play innocent with me. You know what it is to hunt, to kill, to eliminate. And most of all, you know what it means to do what must be done. She stated. All right, you got me there, but Spider-Man is nobody's lackey. Peter says as his face hardened under the mask. I won't do your bidding. The phoenix smiled as her eyes shined with interest. Very well, she said with a mocking hint in her voice. You are free to go. But know this, if you refuse me, I will find another to take your place. And they may not be as morally sound as you. Peter took a step back, his eyes locked on the phoenix. He knew he couldn't defeat her, at least, not with what he currently had in his arsenal. Even Red Hulk's absorption wouldn't be able to do much. After all, this wasn't Jean he was dealing with. If he were to take in even 1% of the phoenix's energy, Peter had a feeling that he would explode like a firework on the 4th of July. But he also knew that he couldn't betray his own principles. Peter stood in front of the phoenix force, his heart pounding in his chest as he watched the fiery entity stare at him expectantly. Fine, I'll do it, he said, surprising himself with his own words. But I have a few stipulations, go on. The phoenix arched an eyebrow, intrigued. First, Peter said, I will not take innocent lives. And I won't be a mindless weapon for you to use as you please. The phoenix nodded, seemingly satisfied with this condition. And the second? I work on my own time, Peter states clearly. I have no intention to be bossed around, nor will I be given any timetables. All you have to do is give me a list and I'll get it done. Once that list is taken care of, then my side of the deal will be complete. I see. The phoenix muttered to herself in thought. And in exchange, I help Jean, correct? Yes, Jean needs to learn how to control her phoenix powers, Peter said with a nod. I want her to be able to use it without being consumed by it, like last time. The phoenix regarded him for a moment, considering his request. Finally, she nodded. Very well. I agree to your terms. Peter felt a weight lift off his shoulders, knowing that he had done the right thing. Then I guess we have a deal? Peter nodded. Good, the phoenix replied as she snaps her fingers, creating a puff of fire and smoke. Then let us begin, and out of that fire appeared a singed scroll, which quickly unraveled to the floor before rolling all the way to Peter's feet. Peter couldn't help but sigh in resignation. As you can see, I have a long list of planets, moons, black holes, ruins of forgotten civilizations, and other universal bodies that need to be destroyed. It is your task to carry out this destruction. Seriously. Peter looked at the list, feeling overwhelmed by the sheer scale of the task ahead of him. How am I supposed to do all of this? I should have asked for more. He thought, realizing that he may have gotten the short end of the stick in their deal. You are Spider-Man, aren't you? Where did all of that confidence go? The Phoenix Force chuckled in amusement. Though if you want to back out, then that's fine. Perhaps Jean would be up for the challenge? After all, she's only one burst of power away from turning into a dark phoenix. Okay, just stop. Peter sighed as his shoulders slumped. I'll get it done. With those words, Peter walked over and took the scroll before raveling it back up. So, it's settled then? Peter asked, his voice tinged with uncertainty. It is, replied the phoenix, sounding very pleased with herself. But before leaving Jean's mind, Peter had one last thing to ask. You said that my acts of destruction would allow for new creation or something, right? How does that work? He asks. The Phoenix Force stood before Peter, her fiery aura casting a warm glow over him. I am a being of creation and destruction, she explained. When I destroy, I also create. Every act of destruction allows space for new creation to emerge. Peter thought about this for a moment and immediately started feeling much better about his new task. So, you're saying that when I destroy something, it's actually making room for something new to be created? He clarifies. Yes, exactly, replied the Phoenix Force. And as my destroyer, you will be the catalyst for this process. Your acts of destruction will pave the way for new beginnings, new growth, and new life. Peter nodded slowly. He had always known that the universe was full of mysteries and wonders, but he had never imagined that he would be a part of something so vast and profound. Okay, he said, taking a deep breath. I think I understand. Do I get any powers or help for this? You want more powers? The Phoenix asks incredulously. You greedy little boy. I've already overlooked the fact that you've stolen my energy and possess an infinity stone. What more could you possibly need? Instantly, Peter turned sheepish as he scratched the back of his head and turned to look the other way. That's what I thought. The phoenix scoffs and vanishes, returning to the burning lake in Jean's mind. Opening his eyes, Peter awoke in the real world with a scroll in hand. How did it go? Jean's ask, noticing the scroll in his grasp as he stepped away from her. What's that? Nothing that you need to worry about? Peter quickly stashed the scroll into his pocket. The phoenix agreed to help you. 
Try pulling on its energy and create a flame as I taught you. Peter stood patiently to the side as Jean squinted her eyes and held her hand at eye level, putting on a constipated look in the process. I don't think this is. Jean spoke waveringly as a tiny spark manifested in the palm of her hand. It worked. It wasn't much, but it was a start. Good, at least she kept her end of the deal. Peter muttered as he made his way to the door. Meditate tonight as I taught you and she should appear. Be respectful and diligent. And if there are any problems, contact me immediately. Wait. What if Dash Jean called out as Peter closed the door behind him, leaving her alone in her apartment? I go crazy again. Hesitantly eyeing the spark floating in her grasp, Jean found herself quickly becoming determined, as she stormed off to her bedroom, ready to meditate and meet the Phoenix Force for the first time. Entering his penthouse, Peter sat down on the couch beside Jeannie, staring intently at the list in front of him. It was a list of all the places in the universe that needed to be cleansed, a list he had received from the Phoenix Force. He knew that it was now his duty as her destroyer to carry out this mission, but he couldn't help feeling a sense of apprehension. So, Jeannie peeks over his shoulder at the list. You going grocery shopping or what? No, I made a deal with the Phoenix Force, Peter says as he continues to read down the list. Huh? What for? Jeannie asks fearfully, recalling some bad memories of his past encounters with the angry bird woman. Well, Peter gave him a brief synopsis of Jean's situation. Wow, you got ripped off. Jeannie commented in amusement. How is it that you made me sign a whole contract just so I couldn't rip you off, but some flaming beauty appears and you crumble like a house of cards? Well, for one. She can erase my existence with a simple thought. Peter admitted his fear without shame. Compared to her, you're about as scary as a housefly. Hey, I can be scary too. Jeannie floats into the air in front of Peter and turns red as he glares down at him, flames dancing along his body. Are you shaking in your boots yet? Yeah, it's just not the same. Peter looked unimpressed and unafraid. Seeing this, Jeannie shrouded his body in a cloud of black smoke before revealing himself once again. This time, he changed his appearance into a clown with a large head and a mouth full of razor-sharp teeth. How about now? He asked creepily. Have you been watching IT? Peter asks curiously. Jeannie instantly deflates as he falls to the floor in defeat, turning back to his normal self. I can be scary, right? To a child, maybe. Peter's unneeded words struck his blue friend like bullets, tearing through his fragile ego. Ignoring Jeannie's existential crisis, Peter leaned back into the couch and read over the many names and coordinates that it held. As he scanned the list, his eyes stopped on the name, Morag. This planet was an abandoned wasteland that had once held an infinity stone. It was a familiar planet for Peter, as he was the one to take the power stone from it. It's also the planet where he met his vice-captain, Peter Quill. Morag is as good a place to start as any, I guess, Peter thought as he found the first planet that he would destroy. Taking a deep breath, his heart pounding with anticipation. He knew that this would be a crazy experience, but he was ready for it. Rising from the couch and stepping around his dejected genie, Peter waved his hand and opened a portal. Wait! Genie called out, his somber mood completely gone. Are you going to destroy something? Can I tag along? As he asked, all sorts of firepower appeared on Genie's body. From a giant alien bazooka to all sorts of bombs, Jeannie was ready for some mayhem. Sure, let's go. Peter nods as he shrouds himself in flames and steps through the portal, followed by an excited Jeannie. Of course, he had to use his flames as on the other side of the portal was nothing but open space, outside the atmosphere of Morag. You know, you could wish for all of the names on that list to be destroyed and be done with it. Jeannie offers as the portal snaps shut behind them. After all, Peter still had a single wish remaining. Using it would save him a whole hell of a lot of work, though it would also mean losing Jeannie. What? Are you getting bored or something? Peter asks, wondering why he would say that. Ready to return to your lamp for a few millennia? No, I quite like the life that I live now, but you do have the choice. Jeannie shook his head. Then nah, I'm good. Peter refused easily. After all, I can't have my newest friend disappearing on me. Besides, who knows what kind of nut job will get a hold of you next. The consequences could be rather fatal. Jeannie smiled warmly, ignoring everything but the fact that Peter just called him his friend. While Jeannie was off in his daydreams, Peter got straight to work. Using a quick spell to see if anyone was currently visiting the wasteland that is Morag, Peter thankfully received no feedback, meaning the whole planet was empty. Which was perfect for his plans. Hmm, how should I do this? He wondered and quickly came up with a good idea. That could work? Pulling on the reality stone inside of him, Peter tried making the largest structure that he has ever made. A slash N, can anyone guess? Suddenly, as if being built right in front of him, a massive orb-shaped construct appeared. Its spherical shape measured over 160 kilometers in diameter, making it one of the largest thing that he has ever constructed with the reality stone. The surface of it is covered in a matte gray metal, with large trenches and concave surfaces creating a labyrinthine maze. These surfaces are studded with thousands of laser turrets and tractor beam projectors, creating a formidable defensive network. At the center of the giant sphere is a huge concave dish, surrounded by multiple rings of docking bays and service ports. 
These provide access to the sphere's numerous levels and chambers, which house crew quarters, control rooms, detention cells, and other facilities. Though Peter wouldn't be using any of this. After all, the whole thing would disappear without the help of the Power Stone anyway. As for the thing that Peter would be using. The giant sphere had many weapons, but the main weapon happens to be a super laser, housed in a dish at the station's equator. This weapon is capable of destroying entire planets with a single blast, and its sheer power would make the sphere an object of fear and dread throughout any universe. Peter marveled at his latest creation. I is that what I think it is? Genie asked in shock. Yup. Peter nodded as he let out a tired breath. My own personal Death Star? Insert picture of the Death Star here, the Death Star, a massive and devastating weapon that has become one of the most iconic symbols of the Star Wars franchise. Of course, its creation wasn't so easy. Peter was absolutely exhausted. He just used almost every bit of his power to fuel the creation of what's basically a man-made planet, so of course he would be tired. Genie was speechless. After all, he just finished all of the Star Wars movies, so he knew the significance of this weapon. Does it work? Genie asks in awe. Let's find out. Peter says as he shoots off toward one of the many docking entrances. First one to the main control room gets to fire the laser. No teleporting or portals! Exclamation point. Genie's eyes widened as he swiftly shot after Peter, ready to play with their new toy. After entering the giant space station, Peter and Genie raced through the halls until they finally found the main control room, which looked exactly like the one in the Star Wars movies. And sadly, for Genie, Peter was the first one through the automatic doors, leaving him completely in the dust. It looks like I'm the winner? Peter smirked as Genie's shoulders slumped. Best two out of three? He asked hopefully. Sure. Peter smirked confidently. Rock, paper, scissors? Genie nodded as they squared each other up and moved their hands into place. Rock, paper, scissors? Shoot. They kept their eyes on one another and spoke in unison. Peering down, Genie crumbled to the floor as Peter's smirk grew larger. Genie, rock, Peter, paper, they always go rock on the first round. Peter nods to himself as he leaves Genie behind and starts going over the controls. Soon enough, he was able to understand the foreign universe's controls and got straight to work. Flipping a few switches and inputting a bunch of coordinates, Peter aimed the planet-killing weapon perfectly. Now, all that was needed was to push a big red button. It's always a big red button. Peter thought as he turned to Genie, who was still sulking on the floor with a small rain cloud above him. Don't be so dramatic. I'm about to fire this thing. Don't you want to watch? Exclamation point. Genie hopped to his feet and rushed over as he shooed the cloud away. You know what? Peter turns to Genie as he held his hand over the left side of the button. We can both press it together. Hee hee. Genie laughed as he followed Peter's lead. Let's do this. Three, two, one, go. Peter counted down as their hands descended, pushing the big button in unison. Outside, the giant satellite on the side of the Death Star charged as it began to glow in a bright green light. Quickly, that green light condensed into a single point, shining brightly before shooting out in a single line. The thick super laser moved with incredible speed before touching down on Morag's surface, drilling into the heart of the planet with ease. Seconds after the laser struck the planet, Peter and Genie watched through the large window of the control room, as Morag cooked from the inside and began to swell. Its surface cracked and broke apart as what appeared to be hot magma could be seen bubbling from the inside. Though this didn't last long. Asterisk boom. Asterisk before either of them knew it, the planet exploded in a bright light, sending tiny bits of planetary dust in all directions. Morag had completely vanished, leaving nothing but open space in its place. Damn. Peter muttered as he powered down the laser. Damn. Genie nodded in agreement. It has been a few months since Peter obliterated Morag into dust, though he didn't stop there. Using some very large portals, Peter moved the Death Star to 28 other empty planets, destroying them all before his planet-sized weapon disappeared. Of course, he made sure to double-check that each of them was completely empty before blowing them to smithereens. After all, Peter refused to accidentally kill anyone that didn't deserve it. Even animals and insects were accounted for, and thankfully, the Phoenix Force seemed to keep her word, only giving Peter locations without any innocent life. And after making a tiny insignificant dent in the very long list that was given to him, Peter went back to living his life as usual. At this very moment, Peter patrolled New York City for the first time in a long time, as he had been too preoccupied with other duties, leaving all of the work to Ned, MJ, the Avengers, and any other heroes that popped up now and again. The sun was setting behind him as he swung through the bustling streets, catching the attention of everyone below. With his second to last year of high school coming to an end, Peter had finally found some time to focus on being the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man again. As he soared through the air, he couldn't help but feel a sense of peace wash over him. It was the same feeling he got whenever he swung through the city, the wind on his masked face and the thrill of the unknown around every corner. Enjoying his relaxing patrol, Peter thought back on the months past. Now that he thought about it, Peter realized that a lot of his free time was spent with Jean Grey, helping her learn to control the Phoenix Force's energy. It had been a challenging experience, being a teacher, but Jean seemed to learn rather quickly. 
After all, this was the first time that Peter actually taught someone the mystic arts. Tony doesn't count, as all he did was hand over a bunch of books and give the man a few pointers here and there. When it came to Jean, Peter might as well be her teacher, similar to the relationship between himself and the Ancient One. She even called him Master once, but for some reason, she started blushing and ran off. That girl can be weird sometimes, Peter thought to himself. Of course, at this point, he completely understood that the girl had a crush on him, as thankfully, someone pointed it out a couple of months ago. As he swung through the many skyscrapers of New York City, Peter couldn't help but laugh as he remembered Jean and Silk's first meeting, which subsequently was the day that he realized Jean's feelings. Or rather this was when her feelings were pointed out to him. Flashback after taking on Jean as his student for a few weeks, Peter stood in the middle of a spare room in the tower, his hands moving in intricate patterns as he instructed her on the basics of the mystic arts. The young telepathic metahuman struggled to control the powerful phoenix force that resided within her, and Peter had taken it upon himself to teach her how to harness its energy. As Jean focused on her training, MJ, also known as Silk as she was currently in uniform, quietly entered the room eager to meet her boyfriend's new student. Peter turned to greet her, but his attention quickly returned to Jean as she stumbled over a particularly difficult spell circle. Let's try that again, Peter said, his voice calm and reassuring. That spell line is three inches out of place. Start again. And remember, you need to focus the eldritch energy. Let it flow through you and into the spell. As the lesson continued, MJ couldn't help but notice the way Jean kept stealing glances at Peter, blushing red like a tomato as she did so. It was obvious to her that the teenage metahuman had a crush on her boyfriend, and she couldn't believe that Peter hadn't noticed it yet. After the lesson ended, Jean awkwardly bid them farewell and left the room, leaving MJ alone with Peter. Of course, Jean knew the rumors floating around, saying that Spider-Man and Silk were dating, which is why she could do nothing but leave the room as quickly as possible, hoping that her newfound nemesis in love didn't notice her odd behavior. And as soon as she left, MJ wasted no time in telling her boyfriend what she had observed. Hey, were you patrolling? Peter asks as he walks up and pulls MJ into his arms. Sadly for him, MJ wasn't having any of this right now. Peter, did you notice the way Jean was looking at you? She asked, separating from him and crossing her arms. Peter looked at her for a moment. What do you mean? He asked, confusion clear in his voice. I mean, she has a crush on you, MJ said, her voice tinged with annoyance. After all, Jean is only a year or two younger than them, so she actually had a chance if Peter was a big enough scumbag. Peter's eyes widened in surprise. Really? I had no idea he said, scratching the back of his head. MJ rolled her eyes. Well, maybe you should pay more attention to your students, she said, a hint of playfulness in her voice. Peter chuckled at her choice of words. Yeah, maybe I should pay more attention to her, he said, flirtatiously. MJ instantly swatted him across the side of the head. Don't joke about that, she exclaimed, her former playfulness disappearing. I'm just joking. Peter laughed as he grabbed her arm and pulled her into his chest. You'll always be the first wife. She would only be a concubine at best, MJ struggled in his hold, trying her best to hit him for a second or third time, hoping to vent her anger and knock some sense into her boyfriend. Relax, Peter pulled her close and whispered in her ear. I'm just kidding. You're the only girl for me. MJ smiled under her mask, satisfied with his response. Good. Now, you need to talk to Jean and set things straight she said, looking at him intently. Peter sighed, knowing that this was going to be hard. Ah, uh, how am I supposed to do that? You need to let her down easy, MJ said. She needs to understand that you aren't going to reciprocate her feelings, or else who knows how long she'll pine after you. Peter hesitantly nodded. I know. But do I have to be the one that does it? Although he was very forward and quick with the way he asked MJ out in the beginning, Peter didn't have any other relationship experience. Not only that, but he has never been in a situation like this, where he has to turn down a very kind and beautiful girl's feelings. They both looked at each other, unsure of who should take the lead. Finally, MJ spoke up. I think it should be you. I mean, she barely knows me and she would probably take it better coming from you. She explained. Peter nodded again, but he wasn't convinced. I don't know. Isla. I'll see what I can do, flashback end. And Peter, being the type of person to get things done rather quickly, found Jean the next day and had the most awkward and uncomfortable conversation of his entire life. Is this how women feel when guys ask them out, and they turn them down? Peter wondered as Jean ran off, upset. Of course, Jean avoided him for a few days after that, but that didn't last long. After getting her emotions under control, Jean seemed to bounce back rather quickly, which saved MJ a lot of trouble as she was about to talk with her next. I'm just glad that the Phoenix agreed to help her, or else Jean might have gone all Dark Phoenix again. Peter thought. And thankfully, after some awkward moments between the two, Peter found that he had grown closer to Jean in the process. As he landed on a rooftop, Peter took a moment to survey his surroundings. He could see the city sprawled out before him, a vibrant tapestry of light and sound. But beneath the surface, he knew there was always danger lurking. Launching himself off the rooftop and back into the fray, Peter got straight to work. 
For the next few hours, Peter swung through the city, stopping muggings and robberies and helping those in need. It was a welcome break from his many responsibilities, and he relished every moment of it. Eventually, the sun began to rise over the city, and Peter knew it was time to head back to his own life. As he made his way home, he couldn't help but feel grateful for the experiences he had had over the past few months. He had grown stronger as both Spider-Man and Peter Parker, and even his relationship seemed to prosper. Especially after returning to school and hanging out with Ned more often. Life is pretty good. Peter thought as he crawled into bed next to MJ and fell asleep. An elderly man made his way through the bustling streets of San Francisco, his mind buzzing with curiosity and dread. He was dressed in casual clothes and prescription glasses, his gray thinning hair slicked back, feeling like a relic from another era amidst all the sleek suits and designer bags of those around him. As he approached the towering glass building before him, which housed PIM Technologies, he couldn't help but feel a surge of pride. This was his legacy, his life's work. Insert picture of Hank Pym here, stepping through the sleek, modern lobby, Hank couldn't help but feel a bit out of place. Dr. Pym. An older security guard asked in shock. After all, Hank hadn't visited the company in a very long time. Yes, I'm still alive. Hank Pym smiles, remembering the security guard specifically. John, right? The guard smiles and lets Pym enter the building without any trouble, though he didn't make it very far before he was stopped once again. ID. A much younger security guard stated as he stepped in Pym's way. Is that old fossil just letting anyone through? He had no idea who he was blocking. Hank smiled as he pointed to the massive painting of himself in his younger days hanging on the wall. Perhaps that will suffice? The young guard's eyes widened as he hurriedly stepped out of the way. I'm very sorry, sir. Please come in. Is that Hank Pym? It looks like it. He's much older than I thought he would be. I've worked here for over 10 years and this is the first time that I've ever seen him. Ignoring the stares and whispers, Hank took an elevator up to one of the higher floors, where a professionally dressed woman stood, waiting for his arrival. She has a heart-shaped face, striking blue-green eyes, and straight shoulder-length brown hair. Insert picture of Hope Van Dyne here. Good morning, Hank. She spoke indifferently. Hope. Would it kill you to call me dad? Hank frowned sadly. Hank's daughter, Hope, was the main reason that he hasn't been to his own company in such a long time. Due to her anger toward him for abandoning her after her mother's heroic death, she eventually rose to a high level in the company and wound up casting the deciding vote that kicked him out of PIM Technologies. Well, Dr. Cross will be so pleased that you could find the time to join us today. Hope completely ignores his words and walks off, expecting her father to follow. And so he did. Hope led Hank to a hallway outside of a large boardroom, filled with all sorts of high-level people of not only PIM Technologies but other large companies as well. Even the military sent a few people. Outside the room, a tall and slender man with slick back blonde hair and piercing blue eyes smirked as he saw Hank walking over. The combination of his smirk and the sharp, tailored suits that he wore made his presence menacing and almost downright villainous. Insert picture of Darren Cross here, Cross walks over to Pym and shook his hand, and although Hank didn't pull away, he most certainly wanted to. I was surprised to receive any kind of invitation from you, Darren. What's the occasion? Pym asked. The tension between the two of them was most certainly palpable. Oh, you'll see. Won't he, Hope? Darren's smirk seemed to grow as he turns to Hank's daughter. Hope gives Pym one last cold look before entering the boardroom, leaving the two men behind. We're ready for you inside. Ouch, I guess some old wounds never heal, huh? Don't worry, she's in good hands now. Darren comments as he follows after Hope. Sighing to himself, Hank reluctantly follows after them, wondering where he went wrong. Now before we start I'd like to introduce a very special guest, this company's founder and my mentor, Dr. Hank Pym. Darren introduced as he walked in and everyone clapped. At the same time, Pym noticed a miniature building of Pym Technologies on the table, which now has the logo for Cross Technologies on it. This power-hungry kid really wants to take everything from me. Hank thought as he took a seat and the presentation began. Darren stood in front of the large group of executives, a charming smile on his face. When I took over this company for Dr. Pym, I immediately started researching a particle that could change the distance between atoms while also increasing density and strength. Why this revolutionary idea remained buried beneath the dust and cobwebs of Hank's research, I couldn't tell you. But just imagine a soldier the size of an insect. The ultimate secret weapon, Cross explained, instantly catching everyone's interest. Especially those from the military. Next, a footage reel of soldiers getting killed by a tiny little speck of a man played on the TV behind him. An Ant-Man? Crow said as he pointed to Pym. That's what they called you. Right, Hank. Silly, I know. Maybe even propaganda. Tales to astonish. Trumped up bullshit to scare the USSR, perhaps. Soon, every gaze turned to poor old Pym. Hank, will you tell our guests what you told me every single time I asked you, was the Ant-Man real? Cross asks knowingly. No, it's all fake. Pym shook his head. Right. Because how could anything so miraculous possibly be real? Cross smirks as he presses a button on the table. Suddenly, a small hole opened up on the table, revealing a tiny glass canister with a yellow insect-styled suit inside. 
Upon seeing the suit, Hank's eyes widened in alarm as he turned to his daughter, who merely turned her head away. Well, I was inspired by the legend of the Ant-Man. And with my breakthrough in shrinking inorganic material, I thought, could it be possible to shrink a person? Could that be done? Well, it's not a legend anymore. Distinguished guests, I am proud to present the end of warfare as we know it, the yellow jacket? Cross spoke grandly as he gestured to the insect-sized suit. The yellow jacket is an all-purpose weapon of war capable of altering the size of the wearer for the ultimate combat advantage. Cross explained and took a seat as an advertisement video for the suit played behind him. We live in an era in which the weapons we use to protect ourselves are undermined by constant surveillance. It's time to return to a simpler age. One where the powers of freedom can once again operate openly to protect their interests. An all-purpose peacekeeping vessel. The Yellow Jacket can manage any conflict on the geopolitical landscape, completely unseen. The video showed an animation of the suit being used for things like spying, assassination, and even wiping out an entire army. Practical applications include surveillance, industrial sabotage, and the elimination of obstructions on the road to peace. A single yellow jacket offers the user unlimited influence to carry out protective actions and one day soon, an army of yellow jackets will create a sustainable environment of well-being around the world. Just watching the end of the video, where an entire army filled with thousands and thousands of these yellow jackets were shown, sent a shiver up Pim's spine. This is exactly what he didn't want to happen. After all, he buried all of his research and hid the truth of his former heroism for a reason. So it's a suit? One man asks. Like Stark in his Iron Man armor? Don't be crude, Frank. It's not a suit, it's a vessel. Cross clarified. What's the matter? Not impressed. I think that I can speak for everyone and say we're all impressed. A man dressed in a high-level military uniform spoke. But I'm also concerned. Imagine what our enemies could do with this. Hank nodded, agreeing completely though he didn't have a chance to speak. We should have a longer conversation about that. I really value your opinion. Thank you for coming. Cross spoke quickly as he turned to Hank's daughter. Hope? Understanding what he wanted, Hope stepped up and opened the doors. I want to thank everyone for coming. I will escort you out now. Thank you. She said as everyone left, leaving only Cross and Pim behind. You seem a bit shocked? Cross states, enjoying the look on his mentor's face. Darren, there's a reason that I buried these secrets. Pim tries to reason with him, though his words only seem to brighten Cross' mood. So you finally admit it. We could have done this together, you know? But you ruined that. That's why you're the past and I'm the future. Cross says as he turns and walks out of the room. Don't do this. Pim stands from his seat and practically begs, but Cross doesn't listen, leaving the old man alone in the boardroom. After personally escorting everyone out of the building, Hope bumps into her father on his way out. We have to make our move, Hank. Hope spoke in a hushed tone. Although she may hate her father for abandoning her when she needed him most, she most certainly didn't agree with Darren Cross stealing her parents' heroic legacy and selling it to the highest bidder. How close is he? Pim asks. He still can't shrink a live subject. Just give me the suit and let me finish this once and for all. Hope seemed ready to fill her father's shoes. Though he didn't agree. Pim flat out refused. I have crossed complete trust. It's now or never. She wasn't happy with her father's response. It's too dangerous? He shook his head, resolute in his answer. We don't have a choice. Hope said heatedly. Well, that's not entirely true. Pim said with a far off look. Question mark. Hope raised a brow in question. I think I found a guy. He cryptically revealed. Who? A prisoner in an orange jumpsuit sat on his bunk, staring at the calendar he had marked off with a crayon, as he wasn't allowed any sharper utensils, when suddenly, his cell door swung open, revealing a familiar guard on the other side. Lang, get up, the guard shouted. It's your big day. Time to grab your stuff and get out of here. Hold your horses. I'm coming. Insert picture of Scott Lang slash Ant-Man here. Peter was sound asleep in his bed with MJ curled up next to him, resting her head on his shoulder as she slept peacefully. It's been a few months since school started again, and the two have been enjoying their senior year of high school to the fullest. Throughout the summer, Peter stayed on Earth and mainly spent time with his family, though of course, he had to check in on the Guardians every once in a while. Who knows what would happen to them otherwise. After all, they tend to piss off a lot of people, especially when it comes to money. While the couple slept soundly in their bed, Peter's phone suddenly started ringing. Groaning in annoyance, Peter reached over without looking and pulled the phone to his ear, answering the call. What? Peter asked groggily. Good morning, Spider-Man, a very recognizable voice said. Did I wake you up? What the? Peter checked the caller ID and realized who it was. Hello, Mr. President. Is an asteroid headed toward the planet? To Peter's complete surprise, it was the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Peter rubbed his eyes and sat up in bed, gently pushing MJ back onto her pillow, his mind still foggy from sleep. Ah, uh, no, the President answered hesitantly. Is nuclear war breaking out? Peter asked again and received a no. Is Yellowstone about to erupt? Did someone finally make their own version of Skynet? No matter what Peter asked, the answer was still the same. Then why the hell are you calling me at 4am in the morning? 
Peter asked as it was the weekend and he had no business being up this early. I apologize for waking you up, but I have some urgent news to share with you. Peter sighed as he knew the sweet confront of his bed would disappear soon enough. If the president was calling him this early in the morning, it had to be important. What's going on? Peter asked. I've received some disturbing information from some of my top military officials, Obama explained. It seems that PIM Technologies is working on a project that could be extremely dangerous. Peter froze for a moment. He knew that name. PIM Technologies is a company founded by Hank Pym, the man responsible for creating the Ant-Man suit, which allowed the wearer to shrink to the size of an ant while retaining their full strength. It was an incredible piece of technology, and certainly something that shouldn't be allowed to fall into the wrong hands. I completely forgot about the Ant-Man movie. Peter thought. What kind of project, sir? Peter asked, his mind racing. The yellow jacket suit, Obama replied. Its creator, Darren Cross, plans to mass-produce it and sell it to the highest bidder. If this technology falls into the wrong hands, it could be catastrophic. That's why I'm reaching out to you. You're one of the few people that I trust, who can stop this from happening? Peter nodded, his brain already working on a plan of action. I'll look into it. Good, Obama sighed in relief. Contact me if you need anything and stay safe. With that, the call ended. Peter sat there for a moment, trying to process the plan that was forming in his mind. I should go meet with the old and new Ant-Mans. Peter thought as he climbed out of bed and made his way to the bathroom. But first, a nice warm shower. After cleaning himself up and eating a filling breakfast, Peter managed to track down the soon-to-be new and improved Ant-Man, and boy was he in a sorry situation. What are you doing here, Lang? You haven't paid a dime in child support. You know, if I wanted to, I could arrest you. A middle-aged man crosses his arms and glares at Scott Lang, the soon-to-be Ant-Man. The man stood at the front door of his suburban house, blocking Scott from entering. It's good to see you too, Paxton. Lang smiles awkwardly, trying to be the bigger man in the situation, but it didn't seem to be working. Suddenly, a cute little brown-haired girl squeezed past Paxton's leg and stood between them with a smile on her face. Mommy's so happy you're here that she choked on her drink. The girl laughed happily, oblivious to the tense atmosphere between the two men. Cassie, look what I have for you. Scott ignores the man blocking his way and hands over a gift bag to the little girl. Can I open it now, daddy? She asked Scott. But Paxton spoke before he could say anything. Of course sweetheart, it's your birthday. Lang frowned uncomfortably as his daughter pulled out an ugly-looking rabbit plushie, unaware of the father-versus-stepfather battle that was going on around her. What is that thing? Paxton asks in distaste. He's so ugly. I love him. I have to show my friends. Cassie exclaimed as she rushed back inside, ugly bunny in hand. Look, the child support is coming. All right? It's just hard finding a job when you have a record. Scott explained his situation. I'm sure you'll figure it out, but for now I want you off of my property. Paxton shooed him away uncaringly. Wait, it's my daughter's birthday. Scott didn't want to miss any more of her birthdays. After all, he's already missed a lot while in prison. It's my house, Paxton replied with a shrug. So what, it's my kid. Scott was finding it harder and harder to be the bigger person. Peter lay on the roof of the house across the street and watched the drama unfold. Soon enough, Cassie's mother showed up and some more arguing ensued before Scott was officially kicked out. Get an apartment. Get a job and pay child support. Then we can talk about visitation. She said as he was forced to leave. This is messed up, Peter thought. After all, they seem to be using this moment to punish or lay down some sort of law with Scott, but it's not his birthday that they're ruining. Today isn't about any of them. It's about their daughter and having her father at her birthday party is probably something that she wanted. What are they going to tell her when she asks where her dad went? Peter thought sadly as he watched Scott drive off, looking devastated from the entire encounter. Maybe I should give him some space. As Scott drove further down the street, Peter could hear him dial a number on his phone. What's up, Scotty? A man answered. Tell me about that job again? Scott asked. And he definitely wasn't referring to a normal legal job. That's for sure. In the beginning, Peter planned to introduce himself, but now that he thought about it, maybe it would be better to meet with the old Ant-Man first. And as Peter was leaving, he heard an excited voice from inside the house. Where'd daddy go? Cassie asked, tightly clutching her ugly bunny. He left. Her mother answered hesitantly. He had some work to do. The silence that followed was enough for Peter to understand that Cassie's birthday was now officially ruined. Pym Estate Hank Pym sat comfortably in a hidden camera room, waiting patiently for his would-be successor, Scott Lang, to arrive. He had been preparing for this moment for a long time, carefully orchestrating everything to ensure that Scott would take over the mantle of Ant-Man. Though he certainly had some time. After all, thieves tended to work at night, so he had nothing but downtime until dark. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to Hank, a dark shadow had snuck into the room, leaning against the wall behind him. Yo! The shadow called out, causing the Pym to nearly fall out of his seat in fright. A Spider-Man. Hank whipped his head around and stuttered in surprise. Peter waved in a friendly manner. I'm here to talk about Darren Cross and the yellow jacket suit. Hank's eyes narrowed. 
I've been keeping tabs on Cross for a while now. How do you know about this? I have friends in high places. Peter shrugged as he looked at the many monitors in the room. What's with the crazy security? Is Cross trying to steal the original Ant-Man suit? Pym seemed surprised by Peter's knowledge, though he soon shrugged it off. As he said, Spider-Man has friends in high places, so someone high up in the government must have to told him everything. No, though I wouldn't put it past him. I have someone else who can help us with Cross, Hank admitted, finding no reason to lie to Peter. After all, this was Spider-Man that he was dealing with. Pym wasn't exactly happy about his arrival, but it technically wasn't a bad thing. And who might that be? Peter asked, though he already knew the answer. His name is Dash Hank stopped as he caught sight of some movement on the cameras. Before he knew it, the sun had set and an unfamiliar car was parked outside the front of his house. Though it was certainly familiar to Peter. Isn't that Scott's car? Peter thought as he wondered if Scott was actually a good thief or not. Who brings their own car to what's about to be a crime scene? As they gazed at the monitors, Hank and Peter watched as a masked man exited the car and walked up to his house. In the executive bathroom of PIM Technologies, Darren Cross leaned against the wall as he stared fixedly at a high-level member of the board of directors, who was currently washing his hands in the sink. I'm sorry you have such deep concerns about the yellow jacket, Frank. Cross says with false sympathy in his voice. Frank turns back in surprise to find Cross standing there watching him creepily. Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, we can't just do whatever we want. Would be nice though, right? Frank laughed awkwardly as he shook his hands clean before drying them with a nearby towel. Sadly, there are laws. Cross didn't seem to agree as a mad gleam shined in his eyes. What laws? Of man? The laws of nature transcend the laws of man, and I've transcended the laws of nature. Darren, I don't think you understand. Frank turned to look at him weirdly. Suddenly, Cross pulled out a small handheld device from his suit jacket and turned it on Frank, vaporizing him into a blob of human goo in an instant. Cross sighed uncaringly as his eyes moved between his former co-worker and the device. Hmm, we still haven't worked out all of the bugs. Before leaving the bathroom, Cross used a tissue to wipe the goo off the floor and unceremoniously dumps it into one of the toilets. Goodbye, Frank. He says without pity as he flushes the toilet, watching the goo disappear down the drain. Are you just going to let this guy rob you? Peter asked as they watched the masked man, Scott, break into the house with ease. I can stop him if you want? It's what I do, after all. No. Pim jumped as he realized that Peter could ruin all of his carefully laid plans. Just stay here and don't mess anything up. Sure, if you want to get robbed so badly, then who am I to stop you? Peter shrugged uncaringly as he smirked under his mask. Seeing as Pim had cameras for every angle in his house, the two of them were able to watch every step that Scott made. After easily bypassing the front door, Scott swiftly started searching the house and found exactly what he was looking for behind a painting in the living room. Scott had hoped for cash, jewels, or anything else that he could sell to pay for an apartment and a small chunk of his owed child support, but when he broke the safe open, all he found was a strange suit that looked like something out of a sci-fi movie. Confusion, disappointment, and anger swirled around in him all at once. He had risked everything for this heist, and now he had nothing to show for it. After all, he was currently on probation. If Scott was caught committing even the lowest level crime, then it was straight back to prison for him. And at that point, he can say goodbye to ever seeing his daughter again. Not because he would spend the rest of his life in prison, but because her mother wouldn't allow him anywhere near her. And the courts would easily agree. After all, why would they side with a felon? What is it? Cash. Jules. A voice spoke to him over the earpiece he wore. There's nothing here. Lang replies dejectedly. What did you say? The voice asks in surprise. Scott notices some blueprints next to the suit when he took another look, but what the hell was he supposed to do with that? It's just an old motorcycle suit and some papers. He reiterated. There's no cash, no jewelry, nothing? The voice asks in shocked disappointment. No. It's a bust? Scott sighs in defeat. I'm really sorry, Scotty. I know you needed this. Remembering his daughter's radiant smile and his desperation to see her again, Scott started to consider the suit's worth and wondered if he could sell it for even a small amount of money. After all, he was desperate and the rich owner of this house went through the trouble of locking it away, so the suit had to at least be worth something, right? As he stashed the suit into his duffel bag, an ant with a camera on its back climbed up his shoe and found a good spot on his laces to grab hold as Scott left the house and drove off. So, you let yourself get robbed. Why? Peter asks as he has to pretend to be oblivious. Who said I was robbed? Pim smirked back at Peter. My successor was merely picking up his uniform. I see. Peter nodded as he noticed a few monitors that still had an image of Scott in his car. Did you plant cameras on him too? Peter asked in genuine confusion. Wait, they're moving. Well, they didn't call me Ant-Man for nothing. Pim revealed. Immediately, it dawned on him. I forgot that he could control ants. Peter remembered as he felt the urge to slap himself on the forehead. Back at his friend's shitty apartment, which he was staying in until he had the money for his own place, Scott quickly said goodnight and locked himself in the tiny guest room that he was currently occupying. Why would you lock this up? He took out the suit and eyed the oddly shaped helmet curiously. So weird. 
Shrugging to himself, Scott tries the suit on, swatting away the annoying fly that was buzzing around his head in the process. I thought flies were supposed to have extremely short lifespans. He thought, as he glared at the fly that's been haunting his room for the last few days, unable to ever land a clean hit on it. Ultimately deciding to ignore it, Scott dons the helmet and looks at himself in the mirror. Insert picture of Ant-Man suit here, I wonder what this is? He looked down at his hands and found two red buttons, matching the red and black color scheme of the suit. Pressing the buttons at random, Scott suddenly shrunk down to the size of an ant, falling to the scuffed hardwood floor below. What the? In his tiny form, Scott stood up and looked around in shock. The small shitty apartment bedroom somehow turned into a huge towering open area, which could hold almost a million people with ease. Meanwhile, before shrinking, he couldn't walk two steps without hitting a wall. Out of nowhere, Scott heard an unfamiliar voice speaking into his ear through the helmet. The world sure seems different from down here, doesn't it, Scott? What? Who, who said that? He jumped and started looking around once again. Buzz, suddenly, that familiar incessant buzzing returned, though it sounded much louder this time around. Even now, this damn fly won't go away Dash Scott said in anger, though that anger swiftly vanished as he peered upward and found a giant flying monster eyeing him dangerously. What the hell is that? It's the size of an elephant? It seems to be angry with you. The voice from the helmet spoke again. Scott panicked for a moment, realizing that he was in grave danger as he saw the giant fly buzzing his way. The fly seemed to be attracted to him for some reason, and it started circling him, getting closer and closer with every passing moment. Scott knew he had to defend himself or he would be killed in seconds. Dashing away as quickly as he could while avoiding the fly's aerial attacks, Scott could see a sharp pin in the distance. Seeing as that was the only weapon that he could find, Scott ran from the huge insect, making his way to his only hope of survival. After all, right now it was kill or be killed and he's wanted to kill this fly for a few days now. Of course, the fly didn't give him much time, as it kept buzzing around him, trying to bite him every time it passed. But Scott was determined and kept pushing forward. Finally, he arrived at the pin though it was much bigger than he expected. Damn it. He thought as he lifted the pin, which was more than 10 times larger than himself, and threw it at the fly. Catching the insect by surprise, the pin flew like a spear and pierced the fly right in its open mouth before continuing through the rest of its body. Suddenly, the fly started screeching in agony as its wings flapped erratically, sending it crashing to the ground directly in front of Scott. Scott watched in shock as the elephant-sized fly bled out and died before his very eyes. Ha! Huh? The voice from his helmet spoke again. You know, you're a lot tougher than I thought. After finally figuring out how to grow back to normal size, Scott bent down and found a tiny dead fly on the floor with a small needle running through its entire body. Not bad for a test drive. Keep the suit. The same voice spoke over the helmet once again. I'll be in touch soon. No, no. No, thank you. Denied vehemently as he packed the suit up and rushed out of the apartment, surprising his friend with his odd behavior. But before he could say anything, Scott was already rushing down the stairs and headed to his car, where he would quickly peel out of the area, burning tire marks onto the street on his way out. Him and Peter watched the entire battle with the fly, both shocked by the former criminal's ability to handle the situation. Quite a show, isn't it? Pim said with a small smile. It seems that my choice for a successor was spot on. Peter nodded, still a bit in awe of what he had just witnessed. Yeah, I never thought I'd see something like that. But I don't think he plans on accepting the position. Peter and Pim watched a few of the ant cameras, which showed Scott speeding through traffic, driving in their direction. Yes, that is a valid concern. Pim replied, turning to face the young superhero. But of course, I have a backup plan. Pim reached across his desk and pressed a button before relaxing back into his chair. Now we wait. Peter nodded slowly. Okay, so how did you set him up to steal the suit? Peter knew that Pim masterminded all of this, though he wasn't sure how exactly. Well, there's very little that money can't buy. And it also helped that I could shrink myself down and go just about anywhere. Pim answered with a shrug. Well, I don't mean to be rude or anything, but I have to ask. Why Scott? Peter asked curiously. After all, the man is a criminal. I needed someone to take up the mantle of Ant-Man, and I saw something in him that made me believe he was the right person for the job. He may stumble a bit at first, but I have faith that he'll get the hang of it. Pim answered, putting his hopes and expectations on one man. Pim sighed, knowing that this was a conversation he had been dreading, though he expected to have it with his daughter. I understand your concerns. Scott has a criminal record, and he's not exactly the most trustworthy person. But I believe in him. I believe that he has the potential to be a great hero if he's given the chance. Pim chose Scott Lang as his successor because of his skills as a former thief and his willingness to do the right thing. He was reluctant to let his daughter become the next Ant-Man because he was still grieving over the loss of his wife, who was also a superhero named the Wasp. Enter Scott Lang, a recently released ex-convict who had a daughter and was struggling to find work. He has a background in breaking into high-security facilities, which made him a valuable asset for Pym's plan to stop Darren Cross and his Ant-Man copy. Time would have to tell if Lang can truly prove his worth or not, but Pym seemed to be convinced already. Overall, 
Pim chose Scott Lang as his successor because he sees potential in him as both a skilled thief and a hero and believes that he has the character to use the Ant-Man suit for good. Okay, sounds good to me. Peter shrugged in agreement, as he was never worried about Scott's criminal record, to begin with. And if he does well against Cross, I wouldn't mind recruiting him into the Avengers. After all, Scott needs a job and who would turn down a high-paying position in the world's first and foremost superhero organization? Peter grinned under his mask at the idea. Question mark. Pim wasn't sure how Peter was so easily convinced, but he didn't care. As long as his plan was in motion, then he was happy. With that, the two of them watched as Scott parked outside the house, still clutching the bag with the Ant-Man suit inside. Sneaking back into the house, Scott returned the suit to the broken safe and sighed in relief as he washed his hands of this whole situation. I don't know what the hell is going on, but I want no part in it. He thought as he walked out of the living room and made his way to the front door. But before he could make his second getaway of the night, flashing red and blue lights could be seen approaching the front of the house. This is the NYPD. Put your hands above your head and exit the home immediately. You are under arrest. One cop spoke over a megaphone. Knowing that he didn't take anything this time, Scott exited the house and tried to explain himself. Wait, I didn't steal anything. I was returning something I stole. Of course, he instantly regretted saying anything, as he inadvertently admitted to stealing. Watching the police arrive, Peter wondered whether he should step in or not. Although Scott shouldn't have reverted back to thieving, he did it in hopes of making enough money to see his daughter again. Peter could definitely sympathize with his situation. Dang it, I might as well help him out. Peter shrugged as he portaled out of the room, unnoticed. Pim was far too busy watching the monitors with a victorious smirk on his face. After all, his carefully made plan was working perfectly. And once Scott was in police custody, he could use that as leverage to make him officially become his successor. I love it when a plan comes together. Scott stood nervously on the front porch of Hank Pym's house, staring at the police cars in front of him. As he saw uniformed figures approaching him, Scott's heart sank. He knew he was about to be arrested and charged with theft and he couldn't bear the thought of it. After all, this could cause him to lose his daughter forever, not to mention the time that he would spend behind bars. Does the universe hate me? He couldn't help but curse his luck. Just then, a red and blue figure swooped down from the sky and landed between him and the police officers. A Spider-Man. One of the policemen stuttered in surprise. Hey, what's going on guys? Peter asked the approaching police officers. We received a report of a breaking and entering, one of the higher-ranked officers replied. Once we arrived on scene, the front door was open and this man came walking out. I see. Peter nodded as he turned to Scott, who looked even more depressed than before. After all, what would his daughter think when his name is plastered all over the news as a thief caught by Spider-Man himself? Look. Peter scratched the back of his head awkwardly as he turned back to the cops. I need this guy for a separate investigation. Can you guys just leave him to me? Question mark. The officers exchanged looks with one another. Of course. One of the more overzealous officers agreed excitedly. We'd be happy to help. Do you need anything from us? Peter shook his head. Just return to your normal patrol. Thanks for understanding. Um, can we get a picture? Another officer hesitantly asked as she pulled out her phone. Sure, no problem. After taking a few selfies with the one and only Spider-Man, they all got back in their cars and drove off, leaving Peter and Scott behind. And once the police were out of sight, Peter turned to Scott. Hey, man, you okay? Scott stood frozen in front of the house, wondering what the hell Spider-Man could possibly want with him. Uh, yeah. Good. Peter nodded with a grin. Follow me. Peter walked back into the house and took a seat in the living room. Of course, Scott followed closely behind, as he had no way of escaping someone like Spider-Man sorry about the police, Peter said as he leaned back into the couch. I didn't know Pim's plan, so when they arrived, I came out to help. Question mark. Scott looked about as confused as anyone could possibly be in this situation. Well, how about I offer you a job? Peter offered. I can also assist with your legal troubles. With my help, it should be easy to get joint custody of your daughter. Scott was taken aback by the offer. He had no idea what was happening and even less of an idea as to why Spider-Man was helping him. More than anything else, he wondered why Spider-Man knew so much about him, a no-named criminal. Why are you doing this? He asked hesitantly. Do we know each other or something? Spider-Man chuckled. No, but the man who owns that suit you took seems to like you. He thinks you have what it takes to become his successor. Successor to who? Scott asked in confusion. The more Peter talked, the more questions Scott had for him. Suddenly, footsteps could be heard as a new yet familiar voice filled the room. Successor to me. As Pim entered the room, he made sure to glare at Peter, showing his annoyance at his interference. But rather than complaining, Pim turned to Scott and smiled. I told you I'd be in touch, Scott. He sat across from Peter, leaving Scott to stand in confusion. Oh, shit. Scott instantly realized why this old man's voice sounded so familiar. You're the guy from the helmet? Pim merely nodded as he settled into the couch, resting his old tired body. Look, I'm sorry that I stole the suit. I won't ask any questions, so let's just go our separate ways, okay? Scott offers as he eyes the exit, hoping to get the hell out of this place. 
Looking at him for a moment, Pim shook his head in disappointment. You know, your ex-wife was right about you. Scott froze as his eyes went wide. How do you know about that? Did he have ants watching Scott earlier as well? Peter wondered as his impression of Pim changed a bit. This guy is one hell of a spy. As he thought this, Peter couldn't help but wonder whether the old man had ordered some ants to spy on him as well. I need to be careful on my way home, he thought as he eyed his body, looking for any stowaway insects. I understand why she's trying to keep you away from Cassie. After all, the moment things get tough, you turn right back to crime. Pim's correct assessment hit Scott right where it hurt. The way I see it, you have two choices. You can either waste the rest of your life as a criminal, watching your daughter grow from a distance, or you can take this opportunity. What opportunity? Scott needed some time to process everything. I don't understand. No, I don't expect you to. But you don't have many options right now. And quite frankly, neither do I. Why do you think I let you steal that suit in the first place? Pim revealed. What? Scott asked in shock as he realized that all of this might have been a complete setup. Scott, we need a new Ant-Man. And we think you're the man for the job, Peter said, confusing him even more. What the hell is an Ant-Man? Scott asked skeptically. I've never heard of it. Although Ant-Man was a well-known legend among spies and those with enough power and money to acquire the information, the normal population have never heard this name before. Hank sighed, knowing this wouldn't be easy. Well, Ant-Man was the alias I'd use back in the day. A reminiscent smile formed on Pym's face. I created a suit that allowed me to shrink down to the size of an ant while maintaining my full strength. With this suit, I was able to fight crime, serve the country, and perform miracles. He explained. So you're saying you were like an old version of him? Scott raised a brow as he turned to Peter. Hank nodded. Yes, but it wasn't just about stopping crime or stopping war. My work as Ant-Man allowed me to do something even more important. Scott looked intrigued as he inched forward in interest. Pym continued. It allowed me to help people on a microscopic level. I was able to explore the world of atoms and molecules, and I discovered things that no one else had ever seen before. I used this knowledge to help develop new technologies and medicines that could save lives. Scott looked impressed. So what happened? Why aren't you still Ant-Man? Pym's expression darkened. I don't know if you've noticed, Scott, but I'm a bit past my prime these days. Of course, that wasn't the real reason. Whenever Pym even looked at his suit, let alone wore it, he couldn't help but think of his beautiful wife. His wife, Janet Van Dyne, disappeared during a mission in the 1980s. Her husband was the Ant-Man, making her the Wasp, a team that battled everything together on a miniature scale. During a mission to disarm a Soviet missile, Janet had to shrink down to a subatomic level to disable the missile's trigger mechanism. However, in the process, she became trapped in the quantum realm, a dimension that exists at a subatomic level, and was presumed dead. Hank was devastated by Janet's loss and blamed himself for not being able to save her, leading him to subsequently retire from his superhero duties and refuse to let anyone else take up the mantle of Ant-Man or Wasp, out of fear of losing them as well. Maybe I should drop some hints about her survival? Peter wondered. Scott nodded, understanding now. So that's where I come in. You want me to take your place as Ant-Man? Hank smiled. Yes, exactly. I believe that you have what it takes to be a great Ant-Man, and I want to train you to use the suit safely and effectively. Scott blinked. But, I'm just a petty thief. Exactly, Hank said, his eyes twinkling. You have the skills we need. And we're willing to offer you the opportunity of a lifetime? Scott looked at them skeptically. Why me? Why not someone else? Hank leaned forward. Because I think you're the only one who can handle it. And I'm willing to sweeten the deal? Peter cut into the conversation, piquing Scott and Pim's interest. As I said, if you impress me enough, I'll hire you as an official Avenger. And let me tell you, the pay and perks that every Avenger enjoys are very generous. Scott seemed interested, as he needed a job and no one else was hiring ex-cons. But most of all, this was a very well-respected legal job that he wouldn't be ashamed of. And secondly, I can help with getting joint custody of your daughter, Cassie. Peter threw out the real bait. Instantly, Scott's heart skipped a beat. This was everything that he ever wanted. H. How, he stammered. Peter grinned. Let's just say I have some connections, but most of all, the Avengers have some very good lawyers on retainer. With Nelson and Murdoch on the case, Scott can rest assured. Though, he would probably have to call in a few favors as well. After all, with Scott's record it'll be an uphill custody battle. Scott stared at Peter, unable to believe what he was hearing, his eyes slightly misty. I? I don't know what to say. Hank smiled. Say yes? Scott hesitated. He didn't know what it meant to be a superhero or the responsibilities that came with it. He wasn't sure if he had what it took. But then he recalled the perks of the deal, and thought of his daughter, knowing that he had to take this chance. Yes, he said, looking between Hank and Peter. I'll do it. Hank grinned. Excellent. Welcome to the team, Scott. Peter stood up and clapped him on the back. We're gonna have some fun, you and me. Scott smiled, feeling like a weight had been lifted from his shoulders. Maybe things were finally starting to look up for him. In a very expensive restaurant, Cross and Hope sat across from one another, enjoying their meal in silence. Though, that silence didn't last long. Cross looked up from his plate. 
You know I've been thinking a lot about gratitude lately, and today during my morning meditation, an interesting thought occurred to me and I think it might apply to you as well, how's that? Hope asked, hoping that this dinner would end quickly. Although she didn't want to be here, it was necessary in order to keep her cover as cross-loyal supporter. If she had things her way, Hope would already be wearing her father's suit, warding cross plans and sending him to prison. But sadly, her father refused her request over and over. Gratitude can be forgiveness, Cross says as if he were some Buddhist monk. I spent years carrying around my anger for Hank Pym. I devoted my genius to him. I could have worked anywhere and I chose my mentor poorly. He turns a sympathetic look toward Hope, though she couldn't tell if it was genuine or not. You, on the other hand, didn't even have a choice. He never believed in you. It's a shame what we had to do, but he forced us to do it, didn't he? But we shouldn't be angry. Instead, we should be grateful. Because of his failures as a mentor and a father, him forced us to spread our wings on our own. Although his words were meant to be comforting, Hope couldn't help but feel an odd air to them, as if she were talking to a sociopath, who only spoke what he thought others wanted to hear. You deserve everything coming your way, Darren, Hope said with a smile, a hidden meaning hidden behind her words. Scott Lang groaned and rubbed his eyes as he slowly awoke from a good night's sleep. He was disoriented and confused for a moment, unsure of where he was when he was met with an unfamiliar ceiling. After agreeing to spend the night at Hank Pym's house, in order to start his training bright and early, Scott retired to a guest room and awoke to the sun's rays beating down on him. Ha! Huh? Scott grunted as he found an unknown figure leaning against the wall by the door, staring at him. Who the hell are you? Scott's sleep-dazed eyes adjusted to see an unfamiliar woman. She was wearing a sleek black suit and had a stern look on her face. Scott couldn't help but feel intimidated by her. Have you been standing there watching me sleep this whole time? He asked, creeped out. Yes. She replies uncaringly. Why? Scott couldn't help but ask. Because the last time you were here you stole something? She answered, eyeing him as if he were a kleptomaniac, who would steal everything her family owned if she wasn't keeping watch. Who are you? Scott asked groggily. The woman's expression turned even colder. I'm Hope Van Dyne, she said curtly. Hope continued to glare at him. And you're the man my father chose over me to become Ant-Man? Scott blinked in surprise. He had no idea that Hank Pym had a daughter, let alone that she was upset with him. I'm sorry, he said tentatively. Hope shook her head, clearly not interested in hearing his apologies. You shouldn't be here, she said pointedly. My father made a mistake in choosing you. You're not fit for the job. Scott bristled at her words, feeling defensive. I did what I had to do to see my daughter again, he said firmly. And I'll prove myself one way or another. Hope turned to face him. Proving yourself to my father is one thing, she said icily. But proving yourself as Ant-Man is another. And you haven't done that yet? Scott opened his mouth to argue, but before he could say anything, he noticed something odd and terrifying that he didn't notice earlier. Oh. What the hell? As Scott was about to get out of bed, he recoiled in fright when he saw large insects crawling all over the floor. Whoa. Are those ants? Hope continued to stand calmly among the bugs. Paraponera clavata. Giant tropical bullet ants. Ranked highest on the Schmidt pain index. They're here to keep an eye on you when I can't. Without another word, she turns and walks out of the room, leaving Scott alone among the insects. How am I supposed to get out of here? Scott called out but received no reply. Looking down at the floor full of giant ants, Scott swallowed a mouthful of saliva as he eyed them warily. Although he was never afraid of bugs, being surrounded by so many of them was a lot different than dealing with a few flies or other household annoyances. Even spiders weren't a problem for him, that is, as long as they weren't poisonous. Ugh. You don't bite me, and I don't step on you, deal? Scott negotiated as he tentatively puts his foot down on the floor, carefully maneuvering his way out of the room. Downstairs, Hank sat happily in his kitchen, enjoying a warm cup of coffee with Peter sitting across from him, dressed in his usual spider suit. You arrived earlier than I thought you would, Hank comments, as Peter didn't spend the night like Scott. After Scott accepted his offer, Peter left immediately so that he could make it back in time for dinner with his family. Well, I was excited to start Scott's training. Peter shrugged as he seemed to remember something and opened a portal above his outstretched hand. Here, I think these belong to you. Pim watched as a corked glass vial fell into Peter's hand. Inside this vial were six tiny ants, all with even tinier cameras strapped to their backs. Aye. Pim had no excuse to speak as Peter places the vial down in front of him. Obviously, he tried to spy on Spider-Man, but what is he supposed to say now that he was caught? Tense silence filled the room as Peter watched the elderly man squirm in amusement. But thankfully, before Pim could say anything, his daughter Hope came walking in, followed by Scott, who looked weirded out by the colony of giant ants marching behind him. Scott. Good, you're awake, Hank said, glad that he could find something to change the subject. Are you ready for your first day of training? Hope rolled her eyes and crossed her arms. I've already told him he shouldn't be here, she said, glaring at her father. All we have to do is take down the company servers and Cross wouldn't even know what happened. Hank sighed and rubbed his forehead. I assume that you've already met my daughter, Hope? Yeah, she's great by the way. 
Scott held back his real thoughts, though the sarcastic tilt to his tone surely made his feelings known. She doesn't think that we need you, Pim says. We don't. We can do this ourselves, Hope said as she turned to the world-famous superhero, who she still couldn't believe was in her father's kitchen. And even if we couldn't, Spider-Man is involved now, so I see zero reasons why we need this thief. Hope, please. We can discuss this later. Right now, Scott needs to train, Pim says in a lecturing manner. Hope didn't look happy about it, but she didn't protest any further. With one last scowl in Scott's direction, she turned and sat at the table across from Peter. Pim shook his head at his daughter's behavior. Don't mind her, he said with a small smile. She's just a little bit anxious. It has to do with this job, which, judging by the fact that you're still here, I take it that you're interested in. What job? Scott asked in confusion. Based on last night's conversation, he only knew that he would be training to become Pim's successor as Ant-Man. After Pim explained the situation with Darren Cross and the yellow jacket suit, Scott had a full grip on the situation. So this guy stole your company and is recreating your suit? He summed it up simply. Yes, and we need you to break into the company and destroy the suit alongside all of his research. Pim nodded. Is that why you chose me? Because I have experience in this? Scott asked, as breaking into companies was a specialty of his. It's one of the main reasons, yes? Pim nodded his head. Scott frowned. It might have been wishful thinking, but last night when they were convincing him to become Ant-Man and join the Avengers, he couldn't help but feel as if they saw something in him. Some kind of heroic quality that no one else could see, but now he found out that they only needed a good thief. Scott couldn't help but feel a wave of disappointment wash over him. Seeing this, Peter spoke up. I just want to make it clear that I'm not recruiting you into the Avengers because of your criminal skills. Scott turned to him doubtfully. We already have many agents who are far more skilled than you when it comes to theft. Peter says, thinking of the top-level S.H.I.E.L.D. agents in his employ. I'm recruiting you because I think you have what it takes to be an Avenger. It may sound a bit cringe, but I think that you have what it takes to be a hero, Scott. But you don't even know me. Scott replied hesitantly. I don't. Peter asks as he whips out his phone and taps it a few times. Scott Lang, 35 years old. Date of birth XX slash XX slash 19 XX. Social security number ends in 5124. An ex-con, who has already been fired from two separate jobs since his release four days ago. Ex-wife Maggie Lang and daughter Cassie Lang. Peter says as he gives everyone a brief glimpse of Scott's profile and records before getting to the good stuff. Before prison, you had a high-paying job at a company called Vistacorp, though you were fired when you tried to expose their unethical and illegal practices. Desperate to support your wife and daughter as well as find proof to take down the company that wronged you and so many others, you turned to burglary and were caught stealing from the company's CEO, Peter explains. Scott's mouth dropped open in shock. Although he tried to explain all of this in court, everyone simply wrote him off as a lying criminal. Did I miss anything? Peter asks. No, that's all correct? Scott nodded dumbly. Wait. Hope cut into the conversation with a deep frown. I looked him up and his records say nothing about any of that. Well, the Avengers have access to a lot more information than you, Peter answered with a shrug. Meanwhile, Pim simply smiled as he watched his daughter's impression of his chosen successor slowly change. Of course, he knew everything that Peter just said was 100% true, as he personally investigated using his Ant-Man suit, which is why he was so dead set on Scott taking his place. Now that we're all on the same page, I believe it's time to start Scott's training. After eating breakfast, Pim and Hope led Peter and Scott to the basement, where everything they needed to train a new Ant-Man was waiting, including the suit. Hey, Earth to Scott, Peter waved his hand in front of Scott's dazed face. H hey, Scott replied, trying to hide his anxiety. He looked at the Ant-Man suit, which was placed on a nearby table. It looked harmless, but he knew better. Are you ready to get started? Hope asked him, her arms crossed. Scott nodded, not sure if he was ready but willing to give it a shot. All right, let's start with the basics, Hank said, picking up the suit. The first thing you need to know is that it works with PIM particles, which allow you to change your size. He explained the mechanics of the suit to Scott, who listened intently, focused on the suit that scared him half to death. Okay, let's try it out, Hank said, handing Scott the suit. Put it on. Scott put on the suit, which was surprisingly comfortable. He looked down at himself and couldn't help but feel that at least he looked cool. Pim steps forward and begins instructing him. Now, in the right hands, the relationship between man and suit is symbiotic. The suit has power, the man harnesses that power. You need to be skillful, agile, and above all, you need to be fast. You should be able to shrink and grow on a dime, so your size always suits your needs. Walking over to a nearby door, Hope closes it and motions toward the keyhole. Dive through the keyhole. You charge big, you dive small, then you emerge big. She may not like that her father chose someone else, but she would at least give him a chance. Especially after learning that his criminal record wasn't as black and white as she originally thought. Nodding, Scott puts on the helmet and takes a few deep breaths before charging at the door. Bang! Ow! Due to his nervousness, Scott forgot to hit the shrink button, which immediately caused him to smack into the door, breaking it off of its hinges. Useless. Hope commented under her breath. 
Scott, just relax and watch. Peter says as he waves his hand, instantly reverting the door back to its original state. Everyone in the room watched in awe, as they had no idea that Spider-Man had this sort of power. Now watch carefully. Peter says as he jumps forward, aiming himself at the keyhole of the door. Now, everyone was even more shocked, as they wondered how he was going to shrink himself without the Ant-Man suit. Suddenly, Peter's body lit up in a faint red light, as he activated the reality stone and shrunk himself down, mimicking the function of the Ant-Man suit. And with Peter's pinpoint precision, his now tiny pin-sized body slipped right through the door's keyhole and flew out the other side. What the? Hope uttered with her eyebrows extended upwards. Seconds later, the door swung open and a normal-sized Peter walked out, smirking under his mask at their shocked faces. See? It's not that hard. H. How? Pim asks, flabbergasted by what he just witnessed. After all, he spent all of his life keeping his precious Pim particles out of the hands of others, and now someone he barely knew either stole them, discovered them on his own, or had some sort of metahuman ability that allowed him to mimic their use. I have many powers that the public doesn't know about. Peter shrugged as he closed the door again and patted Scott on the shoulder. Give it another try. Feeling a sense of competition, Scott stepped up to the door once again and prepared himself for another try. After all, he can't fall too far behind Spider-Man. His manly pride wouldn't allow it. While listening to Scott continue to fail several times, bashing himself against the door as he tries to shrink and dive through the keyhole, Hope and Pym stared at Peter questioningly. No, I didn't steal or use any Pym particles just now. Peter explains, making them wonder if he can also read their minds. It's just an ability of mine. That's all. With their mind set at ease, everyone returned their attention to Scott's training. And just as they started paying attention, Scott leaped at the door and shrunk, flailing his arms and legs as he flew through the keyhole. Seconds later, the door opened. Whoa, Scott breathed heavily, back to his normal size. That was weird. Just focus on your breathing, Pim said calmly. Are you alright? Yeah, I think so. Scott nodded as he regained his breath. Good, you'll get used to switching back and forth like that soon enough, Pim said reassuringly. And when Scott could finally breathe normally again, Hope stepped up. All right, let's move on with the lesson. When you're small, energy is compressed so you have the force of a 200-pound man behind a fist a hundredth of an inch wide, you're like a bullet. You punch too hard, you kill someone, too soft, it's a love tap. In other words, you have to know how to punch. Scott scoffed. I was in prison for three years, of course I know how to punch. Show me. She says as she puts up her hands, oh, this is going to be fun. Peter comments as he materializes a bucket of popcorn in his hands and turned to Pim. You want some? Hesitantly taking a handful of the food, and studying it to see if it was real, Pim couldn't help but be amazed by Spider-Man's spectacular powers. Just how far do his abilities actually go? He wondered in awe as he ate a piece of buttery popcorn. While the two spectators were munching on their snacks, Scott wound his arm back, balled his fist, and hit Hope's hand seriously. She raised a questioning brow as his limp fist hit her outstretched hand. That was terrible. Your daughter can probably hit harder than that. You want to show me how to punch? Scott asks as if she couldn't do any better. Go ahead. Show me. Just as she did, he puts up his open hand, waiting for her to hit it. Suddenly, Hope smirks as she steps forward and punches him in the face, knocking him off of his feet. That's how you punch. She comments as she stared triumphantly down at him. She's been looking forward to this. Him comments with a shake of his head. I can tell. Peter nodded beside him. Hope trained in martial arts at a difficult time. Pim reveals. By a difficult time, he means when my mother died. Hope corrects her father. We lost her in a plane crash. Pim says, eyeing Peter as if to say keep quiet. After all, if Peter had a high enough clearance in the government to learn about him, then he most likely knows what really happened to his wife. And of course, this look didn't go unnoticed by his daughter, though she decided to pretend otherwise, as she can ask her questions later when her overprotective father wasn't around. It's bad enough you won't tell me how she died, could you please stop telling me that lie? We're working here. She scoffs as Scott is still recovering from her punch. All right princess, let's get back to work. Were you even going for the hand? Scott asks in exasperation. You know what? Peter vanishes the popcorn and steps up. I should probably handle his hand-to-hand -hand training. Why? You don't want a girl teaching your future Avenger to. Hope asks sarcastically. No, in fact he'll probably receive basic training from a girl, Natasha, but as an Avenger we have to go through a bunch of specific high-level training, so it's best if I get him started on the basics early. Peter says as he reaches a hand out and helps Scott back to his feet. Thank you. Scott whispered as he knew Peter was saving him from getting used as a punching bag to release all of Hope's bottled up anger. I got you. Peter says as he waves his hand and heals Scott's bruising face. Now let's start with the basics. And so they trained for hours, practicing shrinking and growing, dodging obstacles, and sparring. Scott made mistakes and stumbled more times than he could count, but he never gave up. Hank and Peter encouraged him and gave him tips, and by the end of the day, he had improved a lot. He wasn't exactly ready to go out into the field, but he would be soon enough. Good job, Scott, Pim said, patting him on the back. 
You're a natural. Scott smiled, feeling grateful for their help. He knew he still had a lot to learn, but he was excited to keep going. He was finally starting to understand the power of the Ant-Man suit, and he was ready to use it. Let's not praise him too much. Peter cut in before the old man could feed Scott's ego any further. He had a very productive day and after a few more productive days, he might just be ready. Yes, you're right. Pym nodded in understanding. Peter turned to Scott seriously. Remember, confidence is good, but overconfidence is a slow and insidious killer? A slash N, darkest dungeon, all right? Scott nodded jerkily. Good, now let's retire for the night and start again in the morning? Pym nodded as well, wishing somebody would have taught him that crucial lesson in his youth. Maybe Janet would still be alive. After a few days, Scott and his team of personal trainers stood in the basement, finished with his usual daily warm-up. You know, I think this regulator is holding me back. Scott fiddles with the regulator on his suit. Do not screw with the regulator. Hank snapped in warning. If it's compromised, you'd go subatomic? Instantly, Scott stopped what he was doing and held his hands in the air. What does that mean? It means that you'd enter the quantum realm? Hank explains vaguely. Question mark. Scott continued to look at him, waiting for an answer that he could actually understand. It means that you'd enter a reality where all concepts of time and space become irrelevant as you shrink for all eternity. Pym explains in a grave tone. Everything that you know, and love, gone forever. All right. Scott nodded dumbly as he kept his hands far away from the regulator. Don't touch the regulator. Got it. Basically, the regulator controls the degree of size reduction, giving the wearer of the suit a sort of safety net from any accidents. All right, that's enough of that. Peter steps up. It's time for your hand-to-hand -hand training. Nodding with a bit of dread clear on his face, Scott followed Peter to an open space and prepared himself for the beating that was coming his way. Remember to go easy, okay? I'm old, you know. Scott asked hopefully. I always go easy on you. Peter shrugs as he motions for Scott to come forward. Now quit talking nonsense and start. Gulping anxiously, Scott let out a resigned sigh as he rushed forward and threw a fist at Peter's face. And before he knew what happened, Scott's fist hit nothing but air as he suddenly found himself flipped upside down, crashing face up on the padded floor. Up, Peter ordered as Scott's daily beating officially began. At first, Scott was happy with his training, as he knew Peter wouldn't just beat him for fun, like a certain woman in the room, but he was soon served a big helping of reality. As a man who would be an Avenger and go out into the field before his basic training was finished, Peter decided that he would take Scott's training very seriously. Of course, he didn't like that Scott would be going into the field so early, but he also knew that this was needed for Scott to officially become Ant-Man. Which is why Peter isn't going to do Scott's job for him. After all, he could easily handle Cross and the yellow jacket suit right now and still be back in time for lunch. Especially since Peter can easily shrink and grow himself with the reality stone. But sadly, this is a challenge that Scott needed to overcome on his own. Though Peter would be sure to watch carefully and provide assistance when needed. Once Darren Cross is taken care of, I'll make sure Scott's benched until basic training is finished. Peter reasoned to himself. Once Scott was beaten black and blue and healed back to brand new with a wave of Peter's hand, it was now Hank and Hope's turn to teach. You've learned about the suit, but you've yet to learn about your greatest allies, the ants. Loyal, brave, and your partners for every situation, Hank explains as various ant colonies crawled across the floor, each with their own unique characteristics. Hope stepped forward and pointed to a colony of ants that were crawling around in a frenzied manner. This is the crazy ant, also known as Paratrachina longicornis. They're called crazy ants because they move so quickly and erratically. Scott observed the ants for a moment before turning to Hank. What can they do for me? They're lightning fast, making them good mounts, but most of all, they can conduct electricity which makes them useful to fry out enemy electronics, Pym explained. Hope then walked over to another colony and pointed to a large ant with a menacing-looking stinger. This is the bullet ant, or Paraponera clavata. Yeah, we've met. Scott comments, as he woke up to them surrounding him only a few days ago. Hope continues. They're known to have the most painful sting of any insect. Scott nodded as he already knew this. The venom from these ants can be used as a powerful sedative, said Hank. If you need to take someone out quickly, just release a few of these ants near them. The sting will knock them out cold and even kill depending on how many there are. Hope then moved on to the third colony. These are carpenter ants, Campanotus pennsylvanicus. They're known for their strength and ability to tunnel through wood. Scott nodded like the good student he currently was. They can help you create tunnels and pathways through wood, explained Hank. I mainly use them for their flight ability, though not all of them have wings. Finally, Hope walked over to the last colony and pointed to a group of ants that were scurrying around in a frenzy. These are fire ants, Solenopsis geminata. They're called fire ants because their sting feels like you're being burned. Scott raised an eyebrow. What can I use them for? These ants can be used for defensive purposes, said Hank. If you need to create a barrier around yourself, just release a few of these ants. Their stings will deter anyone from getting too close. Maybe I should make some poke balls for him? Peter thought as he pictured Scott throwing a ball at his enemies and screaming fire ants. 
I choose you. After explaining everything about the ants, Scott was forced to shrink down and bond with them. After all, he would be taking up the mantle of Ant-Man, and the ants that Pym specially cultivated throughout the years came as a package deal. A slash N, I don't actually know how he controls the ants, but for now I'm just going to keep it vague. If anyone has some info for me, or a link to some info, I'd be very appreciative. While Scott was awkwardly bonding with the ants, and even named one of them Anthony, an alert could be heard sounding from the security room. Question mark. Everyone, including Scott who grew back to normal size, walked over to the usually hidden room to see what was happening. Peter hummed as he saw movement on one of the cameras upstairs. Isn't that your bad guy? Pim's eyes go wide. Wait here and keep quiet, he said and rushes away to deal with their resident villain. Pim emerged upstairs and paced to his living room to find Darren Cross standing there, admiring an old picture of them together, looking like a proud father and his son. Darren. How the hell did you get in here? Pim asked in annoyance. You left the front door open, Hank. It's official. You're old. Darren smirks. Well to what do I owe this pleasure? Pim said, though, with his tone of voice, Cross could tell that it was more of a displeasure. I have good news. Cross smiles happily. Pim raised a brow, waiting for him to spit it out already. Pim Tech, the company you created, is about to officially launch the first line of yellow jacket suits. Soon enough, every global power will be outfitted with at least one of its very own yellow jackets. We're anticipating 15 billion in sales tomorrow alone, he says, but Pim still didn't reply. You're welcome by the way, Pim refused to give him any satisfaction and kept his mouth shut. I should have shredded this little shit's resume the second I saw it. Cross smiled, enjoying this situation. The buyers will arrive tonight and I know this is odd, but I'd like you to be there. This is my moment and I want you to see it. Pim couldn't help but roll his eyes at his former assistant's sadistic attitude. Sure, I'll be there. After some more small talk, which consisted of Cross continuously rubbing dirt in his former mentor's face, Cross swaggered out of the house, happy with his visit. And when he was gone, Scott and Hope rushed up the stairs followed by Peter. He knows. He's baiting you. Hope paces up to her father in worry. We have to be careful. Realization suddenly flashed over Hope's face. Do you think he knows I was here? After all, her position as a double agent was very important. There's no way. Pim shook his head back and forth. It's possible. Peter added. It's better to be safe than sorry so if I were you, I'd avoid being alone with him from now on. Nobody doubted Peter's words. After all, he had the most experience in things like this. Well, technically Pim would be considered experienced as well, but he's been rather rusty ever since his retirement. I don't believe we have the luxury of training anymore. Pim said. I agree. Peter nodded as he took a seat on the nearby sofa. So, what's the plan? Well, hours later, as the sun began to set, a tiny ant-sized golden portal opened on the rooftop of Pim Technologies. As the portal formed, a red and black helmet poked out, cautiously surveying the area before stepping out onto the roof. All right, I'm on the roof of the target building, Darren Cross and Hope Van Dyne stood in the lobby of Pym Technologies, waiting for Hank Pym to arrive. The air was tense as they both knew that today would be a pivotal moment for their company's future, though for different reasons. Cross was basking in his success while Hope was secretly plotting his downfall. Suddenly, the doors opened, and in walked Hank Pym, looking as stern and determined as ever. Welcome, Hank, Darren said, stepping forward to greet him with a smirk. We're ready to begin the meeting. Hank nodded curtly and followed them to the conference room where the high-profile buyers were waiting. As they walked, Darren couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction knowing that he was selling the yellow jacket suit right under Hank's nose. Once they arrived, Hank was met with representatives from all over the world. Whether it be governments, companies, or organizations, everyone was interested in owning a yellow jacket. Welcome everyone! Darren smiled charmingly toward his esteemed customers. As Hope and Pim took their seats, a familiar voice echoed in both of their ears. All right, I'm on the roof of the Target building, Instantly, the father and daughter exchanged a knowing glance with one another, both hoping that their plan would go smoothly. Question mark. Cross seemed to notice this odd behavior. But thankfully, he had many buyers to deal with right now, so he saved his suspicions for later. Why don't we just skip the formalities and go straight to the product? Cross offers and receives nods all around. Good, then please follow me. The yellow jacket suits are too precious to bring out of the vault, after all. Meanwhile, Scott crouched on the rooftop of Pym Technologies, studying the building below. Behind him stood a battalion of ants that followed him through the portal, obediently awaiting his command. Okay, Scott, you ready? A voice crackled in Ant-Man's helmet. It was Peter, who was stationed back at Pym's security room. With his ghost laptop, he was able to easily hack into the building's security and act as Scott's eyes and ears. Ready as I'll ever be, he replied. What am I looking for? There should be a small exhaust vent on the south side of the roof. Peter answered readily. Asterisk munch, munch, munch asterisk are you eating? Scott asks in disbelief. Yeah, munch I ordered pizza. Peter answered between bites. Seriously. Scott sighed in exasperation as he hopped on Anthony and went searching for the vent alongside his ant army. 
As Cross lead the group of buyers toward the vault, he turned to Pim, a smug smile permanently gracing his lips. You know, I'm really enjoying myself. He says tauntingly. You tried to hide your technology from me, and now it's gonna blow up in your face. How great is that? Pim merely scoffed and ignored him as they drew closer to the vault. Found it Scott called out as he spotted the pipe-sized vent. Scurrying over, Scott swiftly rode his ants inside. It was dark and dusty, and Scott had to rely on Peter to guide him through the maze of ductwork. Good, follow this vent down as far as it goes and then make a right? Peter's voice echoed in his ears, giving him directions and shutting down any sensors or defenses along the way. As they made their way through the maze of vents, they started finding signs of old spider webs here and there. Ah! Scott grunts as he watches the webs cautiously. Spidey, we may have a problem. What's up? Peter answered as he turned to watch the camera on Scott's helmet. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, Scott agreed. I haven't seen one yet, but you don't happen to control spiders, do you? No, no I can't. Peter answered negatively. Well, I might be able to, but I've never tried. Great. Scott commented sarcastically. Some Spider-Man you are. Hey, I can do a lot of other dash Peter complained, though he stopped as he caught sight of something in Scott's camera. That doesn't look good. Shit. Scott blurted out as he saw what was at the end of the vent. Across from him stood a spider. The spider was an enormous behemoth, towering over everything in its path. Its body was the size of a few elephants, with springy, jagged legs that seemed to stretch on forever. Its exoskeleton was a deep, glossy black, shimmering in the dim light, while its eyes were beady and menacing, glowing an eerie red in the darkness. As it moved, the spider emitted a low, guttural growl, which sent shivers down the spines of Scott and his army of ants. Its legs made a crunching sound as they hit the metal floor, and its sharp, jagged fangs were visible, dripping with discolored venom. Though that wasn't even the scariest part. As soon as the spider noticed their arrival, it fidgeted in surprise, which wasn't good, as it immediately released its offspring. That's right, it pretty much gave birth in an instant. A slash n, Google spider gives birth. It's freaky. Scott couldn't believe his eyes as he watched the spider give birth, releasing countless smaller spiders that were still twice the size of his ants. The swarm of spiders immediately rushed toward Scott and his battalion of ants, followed by their much larger mother. Scott. Peter called out over the comms. You may want to use what I gave you. Snapping out of his shock, as the herd of newborn spiderlings stampedes his way, Scott reached down and grasped a Kree blaster pistol on his hip. Knowing that the yellow jacket suit had built-in lasers, Peter thought it best to give Scott his own blaster in order to even the odds. Without a word, as he didn't have the time, Scott pulled his sleek blaster from its holster, turned it to fully automatic, and opened fire. Pew 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 pew, a slash n, the pews are back, one by one, the red laser bolts tore through the spiderlings, butchering them right in front of their mother. This feels wrong. Peter commented as his fellow spiders were slaughtered. Of course, the ants alongside Scott weren't ones to back down from a fight either. Avoiding the area with the most lasers, they bravely charged toward the spiderlings, biting and stinging them with all their might. The ants' fierce attacks were enough to slow down the swarm, giving Scott enough time to pick them off from a distance. But the mother of these depleting spiders wasn't going down without a fight either. Although she didn't care about their deaths, as she truthfully planned to eat many of them when they hatched, that didn't meant she wouldn't avenge her children. Seeing that the mother was about to make her move, Scott left the few remaining spiderlings to his ants and ran forward, shooting in the giant spider's direction as they grew closer to one another. Maneuvering his way through the battlefield, Scott was protected by his ants as he arrived face to ugly giant spider face with the mother. And when he was within range, she stomped her spiky front legs down at him, hoping to end the fight with one simple move. Of course, Scott wasn't stupid enough to remain still. No, he continued forward under the pitch black spider's body, and held his blaster upward, opening fire toward its underbelly. Pew 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 pew, by the time Scott ran out from under the backside of the towering spider, its body was full of smoking holes, producing a cooked meat smell throughout the vent. And as the mother spider collapsed to the ground, twitching until its inevitable death, the last of its children were swarmed by the ants, officially ending the battle. Scott and his battalion of ants emerged victorious, but not without a few battle scars. Scott looked down at his ant friends, proud and sad at the same time. Although they won, not all of them managed to make it out alive. Among the spider carcasses lay eight fallen ant brethren. Wine, wine, the ants belonging to the colonies of those that died mourned their deaths before turning back to Scott, waiting for his orders. Great job, team, he said, smiling warmly at them. Now let's go finish the job. Back in the security room, Peter felt a little jealous. Maybe I should build a loyal spider army too, outside of Pym Technologies' high security vault. This is a little over the top, don't you think, Darren? Pym commented as he watched his former assistant go through a dozen different security hurdles to open the imposing vault door. Confirming authorization? Cross answered as the vault's computer scanned his eyes and hands at the same time. You can never be too safe these days. Access granted. Suddenly, the vault door swung open, revealing a high-tech bank-style vault. At the back of the vault stood a sealed set of shelves, filled with dozens of tiny capsules. 
and each capsule contained its own tiny action figure-sized yellow jacket suit. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce the first line of yellow jacket suits, Cross spoke grandly. Feel free to take a closer look. Instantly, the buyers eagerly rushed inside and inspected the yellow jacket suits, nodding in approval as they admired the capsules. Darren was all smiles, enjoying the success of his creation. Meanwhile, Hank watched with a scowl on his face. Is this it? Scott asked as he and his aunt stood above an especially thin vent pipe. Yup, that should lead to the vault. Peter's voice answered in his ear alongside the clacking of fingers on a keyboard. You can jump down whenever you're ready. I already disabled the defenses. Scott turned to his army of ants and gave them a quick salute. Well, here goes nothing. He said as he hopped down the hole. Embarking on one of the most dangerous heists of his life, Scott Lang leaped down the narrow pipe, readying himself for whatever he would find on the other side. Thankfully, Peter already shut down all of the sensors and lasers. Otherwise, Scott would have tripped the alarm before being sliced into finely diced pieces. Will it be a trap like in the movie? Peter wondered as he watched through the monitors. The wind whistled past Scott as he plummeted through the darkness. Suddenly, he saw a glimmer of light ahead and he braced himself for impact. He shot out of the bottom of the pipe and performed a perfect superhero landing. His heart raced as he looked around, though he didn't like what he saw. Immediately, Scott realized he had been caught in a sealed glass box at the center of the vault with everyone inside staring at him, including Darren Cross, who had his face rather close to the glass. Hi there, little guy, Cross said, a wicked grin on his face. I knew you would come. Scott tried to bang on the glass, hoping to break it open, but it seemed to be bulletproof. He looked around for a way out and noticed that the pipe up above was still open, though it was supposed to have closed by now. Don't worry, I won't leave you trapped. Peter's reassuring voice echoed in his ear. He tried to reactivate the lasers, but I kept them off. Does he know? Scott asks in a hushed whisper. He shouldn't. Peter replies. As Scott was whispering to himself in the miniature cell, Cross turned to his former mentor. I always suspected that you stashed away a suit somewhere, which begs the question, who is the new Ant-Man? Who is the man that my beloved teacher trusted even more than me? Cross pauses for a moment and looks expectantly toward the glass cell. Seeing the bad guy call him out, Scott reached up to open his helmet. Stop. Peter called out over the helmet. Huh? What? Scott whispered as everyone around watched him in interest. He doesn't know who you are, so why are you about to reveal yourself? Peter was shocked that he had to explain this. First rule of being a hero. Keep your identity a secret? Huh? What about Stark? He doesn't hide. Scott asks in confusion. Does Stark have a daughter that he has to protect? Peter asked as if Scott were a blubbering idiot. You do know that revealing yourself could put her in danger, right? In the movie, Cross managed to figure out that it was Scott who was in the Ant-Man suit, which subsequently put his daughter, Cassie in danger, but luckily, that didn't seem to be the case anymore. It's probably because I saved him from getting arrested. Peter thought. Oh, right. Scott muttered as he quickly removed his hand from the button that opens his mask. What? Feeling shy? Cross asked sinisterly. Well, that doesn't matter. I'll just have to look you up after peeling that suit off your rotting corpse. Darren, don't do this. If you sell to these men, it's going to be chaos. Pim spoke, eliciting cold glares from the many buyers. I already have. Cross scoffed with a smirk. This was all just a show to draw you out. The money was already transferred and all that's left is for them to take their property. He motioned to the wall filled with yellow jacket suits. But before that, Cross reached into his pocket and pulled out a small capsule full of a luminescent yellow liquid, showing it off to the buyers. But I'll be keeping the particle to myself. After all, they don't run on diesel. If you want the fuel you'll have to come to me, Cross says as he turns to Pim. What do you call the only man who can arm the most powerful weapon in the world? The most powerful man in the world? Pim answered in dread. While Peter was watching all of this happen from the safety of Pim's security room, he couldn't help but eye the shelves filled with yellow jacket suits, as well as the fuel, which was on display next to them. I'm sure he won't miss a suit or two, Peter thought as he waved his hand. Instantly, four tiny portals opened in front of him, depositing four capsules into his lap. Two sets of yellow jacket suits and the fuel to go along with it. With the goods in hand, Peter pulled out a flash drive and opened yet another portal. This time leading to Darren Cross' personal lab slash workshop. Reaching his hand in, Peter plugged the drive into Cross workstation and watched as the screens lit up, bypassing every bit of security before downloading a copy of everything that he wanted. Minutes later, Peter's theft was finished and he took the drive back before closing the portal, leaving the lab exactly as he found it. I'll have to study the fuel and make some alterations to the suit before finding two people worthy enough to use them, Peter thought as some ideas came to mind. One of which is Natasha, who would make good use of this type of tech. Especially after he alters the suit to fit the Black Widow aesthetic. Hiding his spoils in a portal, Peter turned his attention back to the monitors, where chaos was starting to ensue. Darren, what are you doing? Hope exclaimed as she watched cross men pull their guns and take aim at her father. It's too late for him, Hope. Your father sealed his fate when he lied and refused to pass down his research to me. Now, he's going to pay for his mistake. Cross said indifferently. 
Hank stood his ground, determined not to show any weakness. Of course, I wouldn't give you my research, and it seems that I made the right decision. The only regret I have is taking you in. I should have wiped my ass with your resume as soon as I saw it. His former mentor's words seemed to strike a chord in him, causing Cross to grind his teeth as he turned to his men. Kill him. And just as they were about to pull the trigger, two bright golden portals opened up beneath both Hank and Hope, sending the two of them falling as they disappeared from the vault, leaving Darren and his men bewildered as the portals snapped shut soon after. What the hell just happened? One of the buyers exclaimed. Boom, but before they could think properly about what they witnessed, a loud explosion was heard from behind. Ugh. Hank grunted as he fell onto the padded training mat in his basement, his daughter beside him. As they landed on the ground, Hank looked around, trying to figure out where they were. We're back home. Hope muttered in confusion. Yeah, you're welcome by the way. A voice calls out from across the room. Turning their heads, the father and daughter found Peter peeking his head out from the security room. Instantly, they realized that they were saved by Spider-Man. If you can just open portals like that, why didn't we use that to steal the suits? Pim asked incredulously. If it was so easy to get into the vault, then they could have ended this days ago. Well, this is Scott's admission trial for the Avengers. If I helped him too much, then that would be cheating. Peter shrugs uncaringly. This is serious. Hope spoke up in anger. Scott's still trapped there. Yes, and those suits are about to be sold. This isn't a time for trials. Pim lectured. Well, to me this is a rather tame situation. As for Scott, Peter peeks over at the monitors. Who said he was still trapped? As Hope and Pim disappeared from the vault, Scott didn't seem to notice as he was too busy preparing his escape. Although the pipe leading to the glass cell was still open, going that way wasn't exactly viable, so he decided to do something rather dangerous. Pulling a small disc with a blue shine from his belt, Scott didn't think much as he tossed it at the glass wall. As he did so, Scott recalled Pim's earlier words. Here, use these if you need them. Just throw them at your target. Red shrinks and blue expands. Careful not to damage them. The outcome could be rather explosive. Don't die. Don't die. Don't die. Scott repeated as he pulled his Kree blaster and opened fire. As the blue expansion disc hit the wall, it was immediately struck by a bright laser bolt, breaking it in half. Boom, a loud explosion rocked the cell, shattering the thick bulletproof glass, and breaking it open. What the dash cross muttered as he turned just in time to see Ant-Man dive out of the destroyed trap, growing back to his normal size in an instant. Hey, mother schmucker. Scott greeted him with a heavy punch to the face, sending Cross falling to the floor. Suddenly, as Cross collapsed to the floor, holding his bleeding nose, his armed henchmen raised their guns once again, surrounding his attacker. What are you waiting for? Cross berated them as he picked himself off of the vault floor. Freaking kill him already. Without hesitation, the henchmen gripped their guns tightly and pulled the trigger, but Scott was too quick for them. He shrunk down to the size of a pinhead and watched as a barrage of bullets flew past his tiny body. Scrambling to search the vault, none of the gunmen noticed a small figure dashing between their legs, punching and kicking their lower bodies, which caused them to trip and stumble over. Ugh. Shit. Where is he? Some simply tripped due to the blow they took, but others wailed in pain as their legs broke in random places. And as they tried to regroup, Scott surprised them by growing to his full size, appearing out of nowhere and launching a quick punch before shrinking again, disappearing from view. Over and over, this continued as the highly trained PIM technology security team was made to look like inexperienced newbies in front of the power and abilities of Ant-Man. Meanwhile, Cross watched from the shadows, gritting his teeth in frustration as Ant-Man made quick work of his men. Realizing he needed to even the odds, Cross reached into his pocket and pulled out a capsule, which held his own personal yellow jacket suit. Cross scowled as he looked between the capsule and his diminishing security team. If you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. Rushing out of the vault, followed by his many buyers who didn't want to be Ant-Man's next target when the henchmen were finished, Cross quickly opened the capsule, enlarged the suit, and threw it on over his very expensive slim-fit business suit. All whilst listening to the many complaints of his customers. Of course, they wanted to take what they'd purchased and leave, but the case that held the first line of yellow jacket suits was locked up tight. So, they could only lodge their complaints and hope that Cross wasn't beaten. Or else their trip and payment would be all for nothing. And as his helmet locked into place, Cross stood menacingly in front of the crowd of clients, his two bug-like blasters arched on his back. Shut up! He yelled. Leave, I'll take care of it. Of course, they wouldn't argue with a man in a high-tech killing machine, so the group turned and left. But as they rushed out of the building, one giant golden portal opened up under their feet, dropping them into a big cell back at the Avengers Tower. Back in the security room of Pym Manor, where Peter, Hope, and Pym were watching the whole situation. Did you just do that? Hope asked in shock as they all watched the buyers get swallowed by a giant portal. Yup. Peter shrugged nonchalantly. Anyone who wants to buy something like this is probably up to no good. I'll have some agents at the tower check their backgrounds and interrogate them. Hope and Pim exchanged a look, realizing just how easy it would be for their web-slinging acquaintance to deal with this entire situation. After sending the complainers away, 
Darren Cross returned to the vault, donning in his yellow jacket suit, feeling dangerous. He had left his henchmen behind to distract Scott, and now he was ready to fight. As he entered the vault, he expected to see his men struggling against an unbeatable opponent, but instead, he found them on the ground, unconscious and injured. There was no sign of Ant-Man Darren knew better than to let his guard down. Ant-Man was probably still lurking around, waiting for a chance to attack him. And just as he thought, a tiny Ant-Man jumped down from the top of the vault door and attacked. He tried to swat his small assailant away, but Ant-Man was too quick. He was the size of a pin and darted around, avoiding cross blows. Frustrated, Cross shrunk down as well, hoping to get a better shot at Ant-Man. The two stood across from one another, atop the left but cheek of one of the fallen guards. There you are, Cross said. Are you ready to die all alone? The two antenna-style blasters on his back glowed dangerously. Without waiting for a reply, he started firing toward Scott, though his target managed to dodge the with a few sidesteps, each laser burning a tiny hole in the unconscious guard's pants, zapping his butt cheek underneath. Dodging one last laser, Scott turns to his enemy. Who said I was alone? Suddenly, a swarm of countless ants climb up the guard's body, surrounding the two of them completely. Oh, shit. Cross mutters, realizing that the fight might end up being more challenging than he originally thought. Get him. Scott ordered and the ants rushed forward. Go. 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 Cross tried to make a break for it, but the ants blocked his path, swarming over him like a living wave. Jumping all over the place, Cross did his best to run from the swarm as he unloaded his blasters on them, but they just kept coming, biting and crawling all over him. Even when he left the ground, hoping to get a moment of reprieve, Cross was surprised to find some of the ants taking to the sky, following him like fighter jets. Soon enough, Scott joined the fray among his insect allies. Riding Ant Thony, Scott joined his air team in the sky, chasing after their target in AV formation with Scott at the front. Where are you running? Scott asks as he pulls his Kree blaster and starts firing in Cross direction. I thought you were going to kill me? Is it just me, or is this a bit comical? Peter muttered. I mean, when they're so tiny it feels like it's not even real. It's like I'm watching a battle between the world's smallest action figures. Hope and Pym didn't know how to reply to that. In and out, Darren dodged the many lasers coming at his back. Where the hell did he get that thing? He wondered. Landing quickly, Cross understood that he was probably better off on the ground. Watching as a herd of ants rushed his way, while Scott and his air unit were a bit farther behind, Cross waited for the perfect moment before growing back to his normal size. And as he did, it just so happened that the army of flightless ants was only a step away. Take this, you little pests. Cross swiftly raised his leg, hovering over the ants. No. Scott screamed as he nudged Anthony forward. Hit the gas, buddy. As the bottom of Cross' boot descended on his army, Scott kicked off of Anthony's back, launching himself forward. Cross smirked victoriously, thinking he had won, though just as he was about to crush the weak little ants beneath his feet, Scott came flying over, grew to normal size in an instant, and used all of his momentum to send his boot into Darren's helmeted face. How? The hit connected and Cross was sent flying across the vault. Acting quickly, Scott reshrunk himself again so that his fall wouldn't cause any sort of friendly fire. Hitting the floor, Scott frantically climbed to his feet. Are you guys okay? He asked and turned to find his army in perfect shape. Letting out a sigh of relief, Scott turned to Cross, who was picking himself back up off the floor. It's time to end this. You guys can leave the rest to me. The ant seemed reluctant as Scott kicked off of the ground, launching himself at his opponent. And before Cross could fully balance himself on his feet, Scott crashed into the front of his knee with all his strength. Crunch, instantly, Darren's knee caved backward as his leg bent in a very wrong direction. After all, if Scott used all of his strength at this size, then his attacks would have the end strength as a fired bullet. Arg! Cross screamed in pain as the weight on his mangled knee sent him tumbling to the ground once again. Growing back to normal size, Scott looked down at his enemy. You know, our suits may have their differences, but one thing is the same. The armor on them is practically non-existent. Ugh! You mother of dash cross yelled as he cradled his contorted leg, though he couldn't finish speaking as he felt little legs climbing up his suit, seeping in through the cracks. Arg! Get them off! I told you guys to leave it to me. Scott shook his head, though a fond smile graced his lips. As the ants started doing their work, especially the bullet ants, whose venom could sedate their victims, Scott noticed cross reaching for something. In a last-ditch effort, Darren tried to shrink down, hoping to somehow escape while crushing the ants inside his suit in the process. But sadly, Scott was too quick. He darted to the floor and grasped cross hands, stopping him from hitting the button. Get off me! Darren screamed at the top of his lungs as he thrashed against his enemy's hold. Though it didn't last long. Within a few seconds, his arms and legs went limp, swiftly drifting off into a deeply sedated sleep. Okay, boys! Scott called out to his army. Bite him a few more times for good measure then come out. He's finished. As he spoke, a golden portal opened in the center of the room and out came the spectators, Peter, Hope, and Pym. Well done, Scott. Peter congratulated him as he stepped over a few of the unconscious henchmen. You passed the test. Welcome to the Avengers. 
The grand lobby of the Avengers Tower hummed with energy and purpose. Peter stands near the entrance, clad in his spider suit, his eyes scanning the crowd. Those passing by stare in awe, as Spider-Man very rarely ever comes to the lower floors of the tower, not to mention the main lobby, where thousands of people come and go every day. Finally, his gaze lands on a trio approaching him. Scott Lang, looked like a kid on Christmas morning, his eyes wide with awe as he looked around the building. Beside him, Hope Van Dyne, aka the Future Wasp, exudes confidence with every step she takes. And there, walking alongside them is Hank Pym, a skeptical expression etched onto his aged face. After detaining Darren Cross and all of his cohorts, Peter and the group celebrated their win before going their separate ways. But before they split, Peter invited all three of them to the tower. Of course, Scott needed to come, as he would be joining the Avengers, but Hope and Hank were a different story. Hank didn't want to come, as he barely agreed with Scott joining the Avengers in the first place. After all, he's never liked the Starks and Tony is a high-level member of the Avengers, which makes a Stark his successor's boss. What is the world coming to? Pym thought at the time. As for Hope, thankfully, she wasn't as pessimistic as her father, though she wasn't overly excited either. Hey, guys. Welcome to the Avengers Tower. Peter greeted them. Come on, I'll show you around. Scott takes in the splendor of the tower, his voice filled with wonder. Whoa, this place is amazing. What's is that? He eyed an odd-looking checkpoint that everyone had to go through in order to enter the rest of the building. People in business suits walked into pods, which sealed shut and seemed to scan them before opening on the other end, allowing them into the building. Just some needed security? Peter shrugs. Hank, however, remained skeptical. He casts a discerning gaze around the lobby, his voice tinged with doubt. Let's see if this place lives up to the hype, shall we? He knew that the whole building was built and owned by the Starks, and he refused to allow any of it to impress him. No matter what. Undeterred, Peter led the group through the bustling lobby, maneuvering through the security while admiring the cutting-edge technology displays that adorn the walls. After showing them around, Peter brought Scott to his new apartment. And finally, we have your apartment? Peter opened the door, enjoying the shocked look on Scott's face. And my apartment? Scott asked as they walked inside, eyeing the place in awe. Yes, your apartment? Peter smirked under his mask. Didn't I say that becoming an Avenger had many perks? Scott couldn't keep the smile off his face. With this, he completed one more of his goals. Now, all that was left to do was to pay off his owed child support. Then he should be able to at least spend a little time with his daughter. Thank you. Scott turned to Peter and said wholeheartedly. You're very welcome. Peter nods. But we're not done yet. Leaving the three of them in the living room, Peter walked over to the front door and came back with two other people. Matt Murdock, better known as Daredevil, and Foggy Nelson, his loyal partner. Both of them carried a pile of legal documents, looking ready for business. Scott, this is Matt Murdock and Foggy Nelson. Peter introduced them. They'll be representing you in court. They exchange glances. Aren't they a bit young? Pim asked as he had experience when it came to lawyers. In his experience, when choosing a lawyer, it's best to pick someone with more time under their belt. Yes, but I assure you, Nelson and Murdoch are the best lawyers in New York. Peter vouched for them. Scott nods, attempting to steady his nerves. There was nothing more he desired than to get joint custody of his daughter. After all, this was his chance to rectify the many mistakes he's made over the years. So, what's the plan? Scott asks eagerly. Foggy took a seat. Well, if we're going to reopen your criminal case, then we'll need solid evidence to prove your innocence. And not just for the theft charges, but for your intentions as well? He said, as Peter already explained the situation to them. Wait! Scott exclaimed in confusion. I thought this was about Cassie. Yes, but don't you think it would look better in court if you've been proven innocent? Matt spoke from the side, leaning on his walking cane. Yeah, but how long is that going to take? Scott asks worriedly. After all, he didn't care about his criminal record. All that Scott wanted was custody of his daughter. Peter stepped forward. You don't have to worry. I'll call in some favors to speed the whole thing along. Opening a small portal, Peter reached inside and pulled output a flash drive. I've gathered all the information that you'll need, Peter says as he hands the drive to Foggy. I've compiled evidence of the corruption within the company Scott was trying to expose. We can show that Scott was driven to commit those acts for the greater good. Matt's lips curved into a small smile, as he enjoys fighting corruption. Meanwhile, Foggy leans forward, his eyes locked on Peter. And if his ex-wife refuses to share custody even after he's acquitted and his record is cleared, he asks, his voice tinged with concern. Peter's face hardens under his mask. Then we'll have to take it to court, Peter says, his tone resolute. We'll fight for Scott's rights as a father and show all of the evidence of his changed circumstances and his commitment to his daughter's well-being. And if it comes down to it, we can invite some high-profile character witnesses to help things along. After all, what would the judge decide when Spider-Man comes walking into court? Silence filled the room as everyone absorbed Peter's words. Once Nelson and Murdoch took their leave after some necessary documents were signed, Peter introduced yet another member of the Avengers. Entering the apartment, Natasha Romanoff, the formidable Black Widow, approaches, dressed in her tactical gear. Hello. 
Natasha greets everyone with a nod. Ready to hand off our newest recruit? Peter turns to Scott, offering him a reassuring smile. Scott, this is Natasha Romanoff. She's going to take over your basic training from now on. Scott's nervousness becomes palpable as he addresses Natasha. Uh, hi, Natasha returns the greeting, her smile warm and comforting. Don't worry, you're in good hands. We'll get you up to speed in no time. Natasha is the best trainer that we have. She even taught me. Peter steps aside, allowing Natasha to take the lead. Why don't you show Scott the training facilities? After all, he'll be using them from now on. Natasha nods as she motions for Scott to follow along. Before they leave, Peter pats Scott gently on the back. Good luck, he says, his voice filled with pity. You're gonna need it? As Peter watched Natasha guide a nervous-looking Ant-Man away, he couldn't help but smile. The Avengers keeps growing, Peter thought pridefully. At this point, he was the official Avengers recruiter. Almost every member was recruited by him, which was an accomplishment that he was very proud of to say the least. Speaking of recruitment, once Scott and Natasha were gone, Peter turned to Hank and Hope. Dr. Pym, Hope? Peter began, drawing their attention. I've been meaning to ask, would you two like to join the Avengers as well? As scientists, of course. Your help would be invaluable. Especially you Hank. Hank raised his head, his eyes meeting Peter's, his expression tinged with a mixture of curiosity and skepticism. I appreciate the sentiment. Hank replied, his tone carrying the weight of his many years of experience. But I'm afraid my time has long passed. I'm too old for this anymore. Peter's face fell slightly, disappointment etching itself upon his masked features. He had hoped to convince Hank of the importance of his contributions, but he understood nonetheless. Hope, on the other hand, regarded Peter with a contemplative gaze. Though she shared her father's concerns, an undercurrent of secret desires and aspirations pulsed within her. Peter's eyes met Hope's, and he couldn't help but notice a glimmer of something hidden in her gaze. It was a mixture of determination and longing. Though it wasn't toward him. Hope took a step forward, her voice filled with resolve and determination. I'll join she declared, her eyes darting briefly toward her father before returning to meet Peter's gaze. I want to be closer to Scott, and this is an opportunity one can't ignore. Peter's eyebrows rose in surprise, a flicker of understanding lighting up his face. He had suspected that Hope's feelings for Scott were deeper than they appeared. And now, her small admission confirmed his suspicions. Although he knew this from the movies in his past life, he wasn't sure if they would still get together or not. And thankfully, her father remained silent, neither approving nor disapproving of her choice. Good, welcome to the team. Peter was happy to hire at least one of them. I'll have a private lab and apartment assigned to you by the end of the day." After talking for a bit longer, Hank was done with his visit and was ready to go. And of course, they escorted him out, as Hope would be staying to deal with the employment process. On their way out, Pim's eyes widened as a carbon copy of a young Howard Stark appeared before him. Ugh. Pim grunted in annoyance as he glared in Tony's direction. Hey, Webhead. Tony greeted with his trademark smirk. What's with the grumpy old man? I see that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Hank deeply frowned as he walked past Tony, groaning to himself about self-absorbed egotistic Starks. You don't have to show me out. I'll leave on my own. Entering the elevator alone, Pim ignored Tony and turned to his daughter. Be sure to call and keep away from any Starks. What the hell did I do to him? Tony asked as the elevator closed and Hank disappeared. Don't tell me I slept with his wife? No, but your father might have. Peter shrugs. Oh. After seeing Pim off and separating from Tony, Peter led Hope to a private laboratory within the Avengers headquarters. As they entered the large workshop slash lab, Hope's eyes widened with awe at the sight before her. The lab was a technological marvel, equipped with cutting-edge tools and machinery. Hope took hesitant steps forward, her fingers gently brushing against the sleek surface of a workstation. She turned to Peter, a mix of gratitude and anticipation on her face. This, this is amazing. Is all of this really for me? She asked hesitantly. Peter nodded with a smile under his mask. Yes, this lab is all yours. You're part of the Avengers now, and we treat our brainiacs very well, Hope's eyes gleamed with excitement as Peter continued. And speaking of everything you need, here's something to sweeten the deal? He handed her a folder containing documents. Hope opened the folder, her eyes widening further as she skimmed through the papers. It was a detailed breakdown of a generous research budget. A budget? She asked in shock. Aha, uh -huh, but that's just a copy of Dr. Banner's budget. I need to draw up yours and allocate the money. Though yours will be similar to his, of course. Hopefully, anything you research or create will help us in one way or another. Hope couldn't contain her joy, a wide smile gracing her face. Thank you. This, this means the world to me, she said. Suddenly, a mischievous grin appeared under Peter's mask, a playful glimmer in his eyes. Oh, and one more thing. Your living arrangements? Hope tilted her head, curious about what Peter was about to reveal. I checked and the apartment directly across the hall from Scott is open. How convenient, huh? Peter spoke teasingly. After all, you want to be with him, right? Hope's cheeks flushed, a mixture of embarrassment and denial evident in her reaction. I it's not like that. Scott and I are just friends. Nothing more. She stuttered out her denial unconvincingly. 
Peter's playful smirk grew wider. Hmm, are you sure about that? Those red cheeks of yours tell a different story. Hope's attempts to hide her feelings only made her blush deepen, giving away more than she intended. Mind your own business? She tried to sound intimidating, but it just wasn't working. Peter chuckled, patting her shoulder reassuringly. Hey, take your time. Love is a tricky thing. Once the topic of romance was officially put aside, Hope turned to Peter with a serious look on her face. What's up? He asked, wondering why she suddenly became so serious out of nowhere. Hope took a deep breath, gathering her thoughts before she spoke. She had long suspected that her father, Hank Pym, had lied about her mother's fate and now was the perfect opportunity to ask. The plane crash story never quite added up, and she knew there was more than he let on. With Peter being a high-ranking member of the Avengers and well-connected with the government, he seemed like the best person to approach for answers. Especially after seeing how him and Hank interacted. Hope felt that Peter knew something, and her father didn't want him to say. I need to. She began, her voice barely above a whisper, I need to ask you something important. About my mother? Peter's expression softened, realizing where this was going. He set aside his joking manner, giving Hope his full attention. Hope continued, her voice filled with a mix of vulnerability and determination. Hank always told me that my mom died in a plane crash, but I could never shake the feeling that he was hiding something. I? I knew he was lying to me. I just want to know the truth. Silence enveloped them for a moment as Peter considered his response. I know what happened to your mother, Hope, Peter said softly. And I'm more than willing to explain everything to you. You deserve to know the truth. Hope's eyes widened with a mix of anticipation and trepidation. She had carried this burden of uncertainty for far too long, and now, standing before her was someone who held the key to unveiling the secrets that had haunted her for years. Taking a deep breath, Peter began. I understand how important it is for you to know what happened to your mother, so I'll do my best not to leave anything out. During a mission with your father, your mother was forced to shrink herself to a subatomic level to disarm a Soviet nuclear missile. Peter explains, utterly shocking hope. Wait! She exclaimed. Are you telling me that it wasn't just my father? She always thought that her father did his Ant-Man work alone. Yup, she was a hero too, just like your father. She was called the Wasp. They worked as a team, Peter explained. What happened next? She asked, her breath hitched, a mix of pride and grief washing over her. Peter pressed on, wanting to provide her with the closure she had sought for so long. Nothing. Peter answered with a shrug. She disappeared into the quantum realm, never to be seen again. She could be dead or she could be stuck, waiting for someone to save her. Or she could be continuously shrinking, but that's probably the worst case scenario. Not including death, of course. Hope collapsed into a nearby chair, processing everything that she's been told. My mother could be alive. She asked. Peter nodded. Yes, it's one of the more likely possibilities, Instantly, Hope hopped to her feet and began pacing back and forth. Then we have to find her. But how the hell am I supposed to do that? Well, I'm almost positive that your father has been looking for a way to save her ever since the incident. Peter explains. So it might be best to work with him. Hope froze as she thought it over. No, he won't let me. And if I bring it up, he'll most likely try to stop me from finding her myself. She shook her head negatively. Hank Pym has been shielding his daughter from anything Ant-Man related for a very long time so she didn't trust him to actually let her help in any meaningful way that mattered. Maybe if he was the one to tell her, then some of that lost trust would have been regained, but sadly, that didn't happen. If that's the case, then we could try something else, Peter offered, as he pulled out a flash drive. What's that? She asks. This is a copy of Darren Cross research data. Everything that you would need to make your own working yellow jacket suit, Peter explained as he held out the drive. You could finally make your own Ant-Man suit. No more asking daddy for his, of course, Peter already copied all of Cross data onto his laptop, so the drive was useless to him now. Hope stared at the drive in shock. After all, she watched her father destroy all of the data in Darren's workstation, alongside his many yellow jacket suits, so she didn't know when Peter swiped a copy of it for himself. Though she didn't care. This was her golden opportunity. Wasp. Hope says, barely over a whisper as she takes the drive. It'll be a wasp suit? She would follow in her mother's footsteps. Good, but I just want to make one thing clear. Peter says, his voice turning deadly serious. What? She asks curiously. You must be extremely careful with the regulator and anything to do with entering the quantum realm. Actually, let me be even more clear. Peter says as he stares her straight in the eyes. I don't want you entering the quantum realm without a shit ton, and I mean a shit ton of research and testing. I will not be responsible for any idiocy. If you want your mother back, then do things correctly. Am I clear? The room turned silent as Hope froze like a deer in headlights, unable to move a single inch under Peter's glare. Why yes, I swear. Peter stood alone in the spacious laboratory, the hum of machinery and the faint glow of futuristic technology surrounding him. Hope had just left after their conversation, her mind brimming with possibilities and newfound purpose as the newest member of the Avengers. And with the yellow jacket data, she wouldn't just be a scientist. No, she would be a real member of the Avengers, like Scott. 
But more than any of that, she was ready to get to work and find her mother. The weight of responsibility settled on her shoulders, but she would do her best to rise to the occasion. Leaning against a nearby wall, Peter let out a sigh, his thoughts drifting towards the enigmatic and no doubt furious figure who had been silently eavesdropping on their conversation. I know you're here. Come on out. We need to talk. Peter called out, his voice reverberating through the empty room. A sudden tremor rippled through the air, accompanied by a faint buzzing sound. Peter watched in anticipation as a man in an old, worn-looking Ant-Man suit appeared in front of him. And as the mask swung open, Hank Pym's grumpy face stared back at him. Hank had been watching their entire conversation, like a fly on the wall. But now, with hope gone, it was time for the blowback from everything he just witnessed. He never planned on leaving the building in the first place. Hank simply needed to make sure that his daughter was settling in okay, like the extremely overprotective parent he is. So, when Tony appeared earlier, that gave him the perfect opportunity to start an argument and slip away. The aging scientist appeared stern and serious, his eyes fixated on the young Spider-Man that wasn't your secret to tell, nor was it your data to give away either. Hank's voice carried a mix of disappointment, anger, and concern. You've crossed a line today. Revealing the truth about Janet's disappearance to Hope, that was not your place, Peter straightened himself, meeting Hank's gaze unwaveringly. I know, and I'm sorry. But Hope deserved to know the truth, to have closure. And she needed to understand the risks involved. Because I don't doubt that she would have gone down this path either way. I only gave her a head start. Hank's brows furrowed, and his tone hardened. You don't understand. The pain and guilt I carry for what happened to Janet, it's something I wouldn't wish upon anyone, especially my daughter. I've done everything in my power to shield her from the truth. Peter's resolve didn't waver as he countered, I get it. But she's a grown woman, capable of making her own choices. And she has the potential to do great things, just like you. You can't keep coddling her forever. Hank's expression softened slightly, a mix of paternal concern and lingering regret etched across his face. You're naive. Hope is my daughter, and I've lost too much already. The consequences of tampering with the fabric of reality, she doesn't fully grasp the weight of it all. Peter took a step forward, his voice steady. Then be there for her, you old fool. Join the Avengers. Protect her and guide her while you still can. You're the only one who can teach her how to navigate all of this, to make the right choices. You don't have to shield her from it or leave her to figure it out alone. There's always a middle ground. There was a moment of silence, the air heavy with unresolved tension. Hank studied Peter intently, his gaze flickering between determination and doubt. Slowly, he exhaled, his shoulders sagging ever so slightly. You truly believe in her, don't you? Hank's voice held a mixture of resignation and hope. Peter nodded, his eyes unwavering. I think if you didn't coddle her for so long, then she would have been much more than Darren Cross' assistant. She's strong, intelligent, and she wants to find her mother. With your guidance, she can accomplish incredible things. A brief, contemplative silence enveloped the room, broken only by the hum of technology. Soon, Hank's expression softened as he realized what he's done. Years of his protection have encumbered his daughter, stopping her from reaching her full potential. After all, she graduated top of her class at Harvard with a master's degree in physics, engineering, and molecular biology, yet that lead her to be nothing more than Darren Cross' assistant. It's laughable. The genius daughter of two outstanding minds reverted to an errant girl for some megalomaniac. Fine. Hank muttered as he collapsed into a nearby chair. You're right. I should have told her the truth long ago. My coddling has only made matters worse. It's good that you've realized that. Peter nods. So, how about it? Do you want to join the Avengers? You can work alongside your daughter? Hank remained silent, unsure as to what he should do. One day later Hope Van Dyne stood in the center of her new state-of-the-art lab, the culmination of her dreams and aspirations. The Avengers welcomed her into their ranks, recognizing her exceptional skills and her unwavering determination to find her long-lost mother. Now, with access to their vast resources, she felt a renewed sense of purpose and a burning desire to make progress. So, this is your lab, huh? Scott asked as he walked around, poking everything in curiosity. Yes, and don't touch that. Hope exclaimed as she carefully placed some of her personal belongings around the room, family photos, fidget toys, figurines, etc. If you break anything, then I'm banning you from this room forever. Yes, ma'am. Scott muttered as he held his hands up and stepped away from the equipment. Hope knew that every detail mattered in her quest to recreate her mother's wasp suit. The flash drive Peter had handed her yesterday contained invaluable data, and she couldn't wait to delve into it and improve it, making it her own. As she reached for the flash drive, her fingers tingled with anticipation. This was the key that could unlock the secrets to her mother's whereabouts, the missing piece that could bring Janet back to their family. Plugging it into her workstation, which held a top-of-the-line Stark brand computer, she watched as the system recognized the device, and a multitude of files appeared on the screen. But just as Hope prepared to delve into the data, the imposing double doors to her lab swung open with a gust of air. Startled, the two turned around to find Spider-Man, entering the room, followed closely by her father, Hank Pym. The sight of her father in the Avengers headquarters was nothing short of a surprise. 
Just yesterday, he had declined the invitation to join them, stating his old age and reluctance to involve himself in their affairs. Hope's eyes widened as confusion mixed with curiosity. Hank, what are you doing here? She asked, her voice filled with genuine surprise. Peter smirked mischievously under his mask, stepping forward to answer on her father's behalf. Well, I figured you could use some extra help, and who better than your dad? He extended a hand toward the silver-haired scientist. May I present your new assistant, Dr. Hank Pym? Hope's gaze shifted from Peter to her father, her astonishment mounting with every passing moment. Hank Pym, the brilliant inventor and founder of Pym Technologies, was now standing before her, wearing a faint smile. Hope knew her father had his own reasons for declining the Avengers' invitation, yet here he was, offering his assistance with a smile. Her voice filled with a mix of surprise and skepticism, she addressed her father. Dad, why are you really here? I thought you wanted to distance yourself from all this. Hank's smile widened as he crossed the room to stand beside his daughter. Hope, my dear, I may have declined to be an Avenger, but that doesn't mean I'm willing to abandon you or your goals. Besides, I never agreed to be your assistant. He chuckled softly, his eyes shimmering with fatherly affection. Consider me your partner, your collaborator. Together, we'll find your mother. A surprised look flushed on her face. How do you know? She spoke but soon noticed Peter, waving at her from the doorway. I see. Telling her that her father, someone she already didn't trust very much, was spying on her yesterday probably wasn't a good idea. So, Peter would have to take the fall, and he didn't mind doing so. Although she wasn't happy with Spider-Man's big mouth, she couldn't exactly complain after everything he's done for her. Soon, a sense of warmth and gratitude washed over Hope as she realized the significance of her father's presence. Hank Pym, a man of immeasurable brilliance, experience, and knowledge, had chosen to stand by her side. It was just too good to pass up. After all, with his help, finding her mother would take a lot less time than she originally expected. Hope extended a hand towards her father, their palms meeting in a firm and reassuring grip. She looked into his eyes, a renewed determination blazing within her own. Fine. She whispered, her voice filled with heartfelt appreciation. Let's get to work. As Peter watched the exchange between the father and daughter, he couldn't help but smile, knowing that a formidable team was now assembled. Should we leave? Scott walked over to Peter and asked, as he didn't want to intrude on the family moment. Yeah, probably. Peter swung through the New York City skyline, his red and blue suit blending seamlessly with the evening sky. The cool breeze caressed his masked face as he navigated through the bustling streets, his heart pounding with anticipation. Tonight, he was returning home after finally settling Hank and Hope into the tower, eager to see Lily and the rest of his family. As he found a secure spot to open a portal, Peter stepped into his bedroom, his senses tingling as the portal closed behind him. Something was different, something made him feel an undeniable surge of pride. With swift movements, Peter pulled off his mask and turned to see Lily, his beloved daughter, standing in the center of the room, her eyes gleaming with pride and accomplishment. Lily, Peter called out, his voice filled with a mix of surprise and delight. What's going on? Are you up to something? He wondered if May or Grave sent her to get revenge for their last prank. Lily beamed, her petite frame brimming with confidence beyond her years. Dad, she exclaimed, bounding toward him. I did it. I finished the job you gave me. Peter's eyebrows arched in surprise, his curiosity peaked. Job? What job? With a triumphant grin, Lily began to recount her tale, her words pouring out with infectious enthusiasm. She spoke of how her father had tasked her with an incredible mission. To utilize the hand, the very ninjas he had subdued, to carry out the orders of their princess. Despite her young age, Lily had been the mastermind behind an intricate plan to uncover a hidden dragon graveyard nestled beneath Hell's Kitchen. Her bedroom had become her command center, a place where she strategized and guided the hand from the safety of her sanctuary. Through careful instruction, Lily had orchestrated the secret excavation of the dragon bones, the burial ground hidden away from the world. Peter listened intently, remembering exactly what she was talking about, his heart swelling with pride for his daughter. He loved the cute prideful smile that graced her lips as she vibrated with excitement. Truthfully, he thought it might take her longer, as he didn't know how big or deep the burial ground was, but an AI is just too overpowered. As Lily finished her recount of events, she looked up at Peter, her eyes sparkling with anticipation. Dad, she said, her voice filled with excitement, the hand is waiting for you. They've excavated all the dragon bones. They did it, just like I told them. Peter smiled warmly as he patted her head, his heart bursting with paternal pride. He took a moment to gather his thoughts. His daughter had not only completed the task he had assigned to her but had done it so quickly. After all, it's not easy to securely and secretly dig up the underground of a major city. Lily, I am so proud of you, Peter said. Lily's grin grew even wider, and she threw her arms around Peter in a tight embrace. Thanks, Dad. I couldn't have done it without you. Well, he did make her and tell the hand to follow her orders, so Lily isn't wrong, but without her involvement, it would have most likely taken far longer than this. Peter held his daughter close, savoring the moment before reluctantly separating from her. I should probably go pick up the bones, Peter said, excited to see how much elixir he would be able to make now. 
But before he could leave, Lily grabbed a hold of his arm. What's up? Peter turned back and asked. Dad? She began, her voice tinged with excitement. Can we go collect the dragon bones together? I want to see them. Peter's expression softened as he looked down at his daughter. He understood her curiosity and eagerness to see what was left of an extinct species. Well, technically they're endangered. Peter thought as there is a dragon in Kuanluan. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a few more hiding out somewhere as well. With a nod, he motioned for her to follow him. Come here. He replied, his voice filled with affection. I've got something for you first. Intrigued, Lily followed her father to his desk, where he reached into a drawer and pulled out a folded piece of clothing, gleaming with red and blue hues. It's a custom-made spider suit, like mine and your mom's, Peter explained, unfolding it for her to see. I thought it was about time you had one of your own. Especially if we're going to meet the hand. Try it on. Lily's eyes widened with delight as she took the suit from her father's hands. And just like his, it disappeared upon contact, but she wasn't surprised. Seconds later, the suit appeared on her body, replacing her normal clothes. It was a perfect fit, tailored to her small frame, adorned with spider web patterns and the iconic spider emblem. Insert picture of spider girl here, and just like her parents, Lily's suit came with a hood, which she could pull on whenever she wanted. Turning around, Lily stared in awe at herself in the mirror. It's so cool? She muttered in shock at how good she looked. She couldn't believe her luck, feeling an incredible surge of excitement coursing through her veins. After suiting up, Lily stood before her father, her heart pounding with anticipation. Peter's eyes met hers, and he smiled, a mixture of love and confidence radiating from his face. Now, my little spider girl, he said as he pulled his mask back on. Let's go collect those dragon bones, shall we? Lily's eyes lit up with joy as she grasped her father's hand. And with a wave of his free hand, Peter opened a portal to a tall skyscraper. Together, they stepped through the portal, but as they did, the bedroom door opened behind them, revealing Lily's grandmother, Grace. Lily, are you and Dash Grace poked her head in and froze on the spot, catching a glimpse of the two before the portal snapped shut, leaving the room empty. Instantly, Grace turned around and rushed down the stairs, a fearful and worried look on her face. MJ. May. She screamed. Peter stood atop the edge of a towering skyscraper, the bustling city spread out beneath him. A gentle breeze rustled his sleek red and blue suit, as he glanced over his shoulder, a warm smile forming on his face as he looked at his daughter, Lily. She stood beside him, her small frame adorned in her brand new spider suit, specially made by her father with all the bells and whistles. Lily's wide eyes reflected a mix of excitement and nervousness as she fidgeted with her clothes. This was a defining moment, a rite of passage for all spider heroes. Are you ready, Lily? Peter asked, his voice laced with a blend of encouragement and paternal pride. Because if we're going to pick up the dragon bones, then you're going to need to learn how to swing. His own heart raced with anticipation, mirroring the adrenaline he had felt during his own first time. Lily nodded, her voice barely above a whisper. I think so, daddy. The daddies always come out at times like this. With a gentle hand, Peter rested it on her small shoulder reassuringly. Remember, Lily, you have all the spider powers I have, including the organic web shooters. I know that I've been keeping you from using your powers too much, but now's the time to finally let loose. Trust yourself and your instincts. Her father's words brought a glimmer of determination to Lily's eyes. She took a deep breath, and her posture straightened, as though a newfound confidence began to blossom within her. Though that confidence couldn't fully erase the fear and nervousness she felt as she peered off the edge of the very tall building they were on. Peter's gaze shifted to the city, his eyes scanning for the perfect spot to initiate her training. He spotted a sturdy-looking fire escape in the distance, an ideal target for her first swing. See that fire escape over there? I want you to land on it, okay? He said, pointing with a gloved finger. Lily's eyes followed his gesture, and she nodded resolutely. Got it. Peter took a step back, allowing his daughter some space to prepare. He watched as she raised her arm, the sound of her organic web shooters firing into the air. Thin strands of webbing shot out, attaching themselves to the edge of the building, creating a sturdy line for her to start swinging from. Now, remember, it's all about timing and control, Peter advised, his voice calm. As you swing, keep your body loose and relaxed, just like you're floating on air. Lily nodded once again, her face a picture of determination, her eyes fixed on the fire escape in the distance. Taking a deep calming breath, Lily prepared herself. And with a swift motion, she propelled herself forward, her small body soaring through the open air. A mixture of fear and exhilaration coursed through her veins as she trusted her instincts, just as her father had instructed. Of course, Peter didn't sit still either. No, he rushed to follow after her, his heart pounding with a mixture of pride and concern. If she couldn't do it for one reason or another, then he would be right behind her, ready to catch her at any moment. He saw her adjust mid-swing, her movements becoming smoother, more controlled. Lily's expression transformed into one of pure joy as she arced through the sky, her laughter carried on the wind for him to hear. With a final twist and a graceful landing on the targeted fire escape, Lily came to a stop. Her chest heaved with exertion, a wide grin hidden under her mask. She had done it. She had swung like a true Spider-Man. Or rather, Spider-Girl. 
Peter's heart swelled with a mixture of emotions as he landed next to his daughter. He wrapped his arms around her in a tight embrace, pride radiating from his very being. You did it. Lily beamed up at him, her eyes sparkling with a newfound confidence. Hee hee. Of course, I did it. Separating for a moment, Peter looked down at his daughter in amusement. Feeling confident, are we? Then I guess you're ready to go again? He says as he shoves her off the fire escape. Ah. Uh. Lily screamed as she scrambled to shoot a web toward a nearby building. Daddy, I hate you. I love you too. Peter laughed as he dived off the fire escape, following his daughter's every move. Peter and Lily soared through the air, their bodies gracefully gliding across the New York City skyline. Their vibrant red and blue spider suits caught the attention of pedestrians below, eliciting awe and whispers of admiration. But as they approached their destination, a closed-off construction site in Hell's Kitchen, their suits swiftly morphed, the colors fading into a sleek, dark black. The transformation signaled a shift in their purpose, an imminent covert mission. After all, Spider-Man couldn't be seen with the hand. Even if they've been a force for good for a few years now. The duo landed silently within the confines of the construction site, their feet touching the cold concrete with barely a sound. The area was shrouded in darkness, broken only by the dim light of a few industrial light posts. Peter's keen senses detected a presence lurking in the shadows, and before long, they found themselves surrounded by a circle of masked figures. Each one donned the traditional garb of the hand ninja, their eyes piercing through the darkness as they knelt before the father and daughter. Years ago, Peter had subdued these very ninjas and emerged as their leader. A title he hadn't sought, but one he had embraced to ensure that the hand would never cause him any trouble again. The ninjas, bowing their heads, addressed him. Black Sky. They spoke the name they bestowed upon him. As the ninjas knelt, a familiar figure emerged from the shadows. Unmasked, his piercing gaze met Peter's, and he knelt before him, paying homage to the man who had reshaped the hand. This was Scythe, one of the fingers. Individuals whom Peter had strategically placed in positions of leadership within the hand to reshape the organization into something more than a ruthless killing machine. Scythe rose from his kneeling position, his gaze shifting from Peter to the young girl at his side. Princess, he addressed Lily, a note of reverence in his voice. Though this was the first time they had met in person, her invaluable aid and instruction helped in things like securing permits and acquiring the land for the excavation they were about to witness. Her remarkable hacking skills had proven instrumental to the hand's endeavors. With pleasantries exchanged, Scythe extended an arm toward the construction site. Allow me to guide you. He invited, his voice showing a mixture of excitement and respect. We've unearthed the dragon graveyard, thanks to the princess's efforts. It is a sight to behold. Curiosity flickered in Peter's eyes, but he turned to his daughter, offering her the choice. Lily's face lit up with anticipation, her young heart brimming with the same adventurous spirit that had driven her father ever since he arrived in this world. With a nod, she accepted Scythe's invitation, and the trio ventured deeper into the construction site, their steps echoing faintly in the night. Following Scythe, the father and daughter duo arrived at the entrance of a tunnel, which was illuminated by rows of wired lights. Lily, stood beside her father, her entire being vibrating with excitement and wonder. With each step, guided by Scythe, the duo ventured deep into the tunnel. Soon enough, the sounds of bustling city life faded away. The air grew cooler, carrying a faint scent of earth and mystery. Lily's small hand gripped her father's gloved fingers tightly, her anticipation reaching a whole new level. Finally, after walking for a few minutes, the tunnel opened up, revealing a vast and awe-inspiring cave. It seemed to stretch into infinity, adorned with ancient stalactites that hung from the tall ceilings. But it was not the cavern that captured their attention. It was what lay within. Peter's eyes widened, his breath hitching in his throat. There, strewn across the floor and partially hidden within the visible walls, lay the petrified remains of immense dragons. Their skeletal structures, though frozen in time, maintained an astonishing level of detail. It was as if these magnificent creatures had been waiting patiently for this moment to be discovered. Lily's infectious excitement bubbled over, and she darted off, her feet echoing softly on the cavern floor, weaving between the giant bones. She marveled at the massive ribcages that sprawled across the ground, the elongated spines that seemed to go on for miles, and the delicate wings that lay gracefully folded by their sides. Scythe smiled. Welcome to the Dragon Bone Graveyard, Princess, he said. Peter watched his daughter with a smile as well. He had known this discovery would captivate her, but he hadn't expected her enthusiasm to reach this level. He moved forward cautiously, his fingertips grazing the smooth surface of an enormous dragon skull. With a simple touch, Peter could feel the latent energy, chi, left behind in each bone. As Lily's exploration continued, Peter's gaze shifted to the surrounding walls, where even more dragons peeked out, as if they stood on their own two feet. Time seemed to stand still within the dragon-filled cave as the two marveled at their discovery. As Lily's laughter echoed through the cavern, Peter couldn't help but smile. His daughter looked like a little archaeologist, who just uncovered some dinosaur bones. Good work, Scythe, Peter said to the man standing beside him. Thank you, sir, Scythe replied dutifully. But we couldn't have done all of this without your daughter's help. Her assistance was invaluable. Either way, good job. 
Peter patted the man on the shoulder as he walked over to Lily, wondering what he should do to reward her. This is so cool. Lily exclaimed as he stood next to her. I know, right? Peter nodded in agreement as he doted on his excited daughter. Why don't we explore a bit more before packing up the bones? He asked. Okay, follow me. Lily leads the way, rushing around the cave with her father following close behind. After spending an hour ooing and aahing at the many dragon skeletons, Peter got straight to work. With a few simple spells, he was able to pack up the bones and safely send them through a portal, where they'll be stored for the time being. It didn't take more than half an hour. And by the time he was finished, the entire cave seemed to lose every ounce of wonder that it once held, leaving it completely empty. After emptying the cave, Peter and Lily bid farewell to Scythe and the Hand Ninja, leaving Hell's Kitchen behind. As they swung through the towering city, enjoying the moment for a little while longer, a piercing scream echoed through the air. Peter and Lily abruptly landed on a rooftop, their heads turning in unison toward the source of the sound. Wordlessly, their eyes locked, a silent understanding passing between them. Without a moment's hesitation, Lily dashed off in the direction of the anguished cries. Peter froze for a moment, unsure if he should allow his daughter to get involved in this. After all, this was only supposed to be a night out together, not some crime-stopping adventure. Shaking his head and taking a long breath, Peter pursued his spirited daughter. He knew she was still learning the ropes, quite literally, but he decided to let her do as she pleased. He wouldn't stop her. At least not yet. Instead, he would keep close and safeguard her from the shadows, ensuring her safety. Moments later, the duo arrived at a modest family-owned restaurant, its windows shimmering with warm, golden light. Above it lay a small apartment, an unsuspecting residence for the family who owned the restaurant below. Taking a more detailed look, Lily found a team of masked figures clad in ominous black attire, their every movement precise and deliberate. After breaking into the family home, the unknown team came storming out with a thrashing child in hand. Is this a kidnapping? Peter's eyes narrowed, his senses heightened. He absorbed every detail, noting the terror etched on the faces of the parents as they valiantly resisted their attackers. But these kidnappers possessed a cold, calculated efficiency that overwhelmed the desperate efforts of the innocent parents, rendering them defenseless. It was then that Lily sprang into action, her small frame ablaze with determination. Swift and nimble, she utilized her acrobatic skills to outmaneuver the masked criminals. With each well-placed strike, she subdued her opponents, her spider-like abilities lending her a formidable advantage. Damn. When did she get so good? Peter watched with a mix of awe and apprehension, positioned at a vantage point that allowed him to intervene if the situation spiraled out of control. AIs are just too overpowered. It just wasn't fair. In a flurry of movement, Lily managed to incapacitate the kidnappers, rescuing the frightened child in a matter of seconds. The parents, battered but relieved, rushed forward to grab their little girl, their gratitude evident from the tears in their eyes. They embraced their daughter tightly, grateful for the mini Spider-Man's intervention. Thank you. The mother cried. As the commotion subsided, Peter dropped down beside his triumphant daughter, a warm smile hidden under his mask. He patted her head affectionately, a blend of pride and concern radiating off of him. Good work. He praised softly in admiration. I don't think that I could find a single fault in the way you handled that situation even if I wanted to. Lily beamed up at him, happy to see that her father was impressed. As Lily was preoccupied with her father's words, Peter looked over at the kidnapper's target, wondering why these masked men would want to take her. Though, he wasn't left wondering for long. Just with a simple look, Peter instantly understood. She's a metahuman? His eyebrows raised in surprise. Which dumb bastard thinks that they can kidnap metahumans in my city? Achoo! Across the city, in an abandoned laboratory, a tall, athletic man with a menacing demeanor sneezed, his shaved head shining under the room's lights. Insert picture of Ajax slash Francis here, ooh! My spider senses are tingling. A handsome yet disheveled man spoke, strapped to a hospital gurney. Someone must be talking about you, Francis. Insert picture of Wade Wilson here, sensing her father's change in demeanor, Lily followed his gaze and noticed the little girl's mutation. Cute, she muttered. As far as physical mutations go, the little girl was pretty lucky for a metahuman. Peter wasn't sure if it would give her any useful powers, but the girl had two furry ears atop her head as well as a bushy fox tail behind her back. Maybe some wolverine-type powers? He wondered. After listening to the parents thank them over and over again, Peter handed them the contact information for Xavier's school. Though, they didn't look very interested in sending their daughter there. After all, she didn't seem to have any uncontrollable powers, nor does she face any sort of bullying in school since Spider-Man literally endorsed all metahumans. In fact, her mutation made her the most popular kid in school. So, why send their child to a boarding school, where they would only get to see her during breaks? Peter shrugged uncaringly. If they wanted to raise their daughter as they should, then he wouldn't get in their way. Actually, he would help. Once the small family returned to their apartment, Peter turned to the downed kidnappers. Lily, he said, his voice drawing her attention. Yeah. She looked up at him, tilting her head to the side. I need you to access their phones. We need to track where they've been. Access the GPS and mark their pathing for the past month. 
Peter instructed. Once you're done, find the location that they all have in common. They would most likely arrive at this location at a specific time, like clocking in for a job. Lily's eyes sparkled with a hint of excitement as she nodded, her youthful face reflecting an air of confidence beyond her years. Walking over to the defeated criminals, she effortlessly collected their smartphones. Laying them out in front of her, Lily quickly accessed their devices without touching them. Instantly, the screens lit up as the GPS app on each phone opened in tandem. And as the apps opened, lines quickly appeared, showing exactly where they've been. Completing her task with ease, Lily turned to face her father, her expression radiating accomplishment. Got it. She declared, her voice tinged with a touch of pride. Each of these guys has one location in common. It's most likely their base, probably some kind of lab for experimenting on metahumans. Peter's mind raced as he processed the information, piecing together the puzzle with his seasoned instincts. That's what I thought as well, he muttered, his voice laced with concern. Not only was he concerned but also annoyed. It's been a while since any large-scale crime has taken place in New York City. After all, this city is the birthplace of Spider-Man and the Avengers, so it quickly turned into a bit of a safe haven. Although crime didn't just disappear, crazy schemes like metahuman experimentation completely did, making him wonder why these people would even choose to operate here. Are they freaking crazy? Peter waved his hand, portaling the unconscious kidnappers to the tower's detention center. Lily, you should head home. You're still a bit too young to be dealing with stuff like this, no matter how extraordinary you are. Although she liked the compliment, Lily didn't agree with her father at all. Lily's eyes met her father's, determination burning within them. But I can handle it. She argued, her voice filled with conviction, I want to help. A mixture of pride and apprehension washed over Peter as he considered it. He knew her abilities surpassed those of a normal child or adult for that matter. But he also understood the importance of protecting her innocence. After all, almost every facility that kidnaps or experiments on metahumans is usually a bit of a horror show. After a moment's hesitation, he relented. All right, Lily, he said, his voice filled with a mix of resignation and trust, you can come along but you have to stay outside. Your job is simple. Watch the perimeter and detain anyone that's coming or going. Agreed. It wouldn't hurt to allow her some leeway while simultaneously keeping her away from the gruesome stuff. Lily's face beamed with a radiant smile. It may not be exactly what she wanted, but it was a start. Agreed. She replied, ready to head out. I'll do everything you say, and I won't let you down. Peter nodded. Good, now lead the way, he said as they took off into the night. In a dimly lit, not-so-sterile room, Wade Wilson, haggard from weeks of continued torture, found himself trapped inside an open glass chamber. Stood above him, Francis, also known as Ajax, smiled cruelly down at him. If this doesn't unlock your mutation, well, nothing will. He shrugged uncaringly. These straps are a bit itchy. Wade spoke in his usual infuriating manner. Do you mind loosening them for me? Ignoring the loud mouth lab rat, Francis continued. Now, what we're going to do is lower the oxygen concentration in there to the exact point you feel like you're suffocating. If your brain waves slow, meaning you're about to pass out, then we'll turn up the O2. If your heart rate slows, meaning you're able to catch your breath, we'll turn it back down. And that's where we'll leave you for the next few days? Come on, Francis, you can do better than this, right? Wade taunted, his body straining against the straps that held him down. What's the matter, can't handle a little name calling? Did all the kids on the playground make fun of poor little Francis? Wait. They didn't call you Franny, did they? Ajax's eyes narrowed, his patience wearing thin. I told you, Wade, my name is Ajax. You will address me accordingly? He replied, his voice cold and devoid of mercy. Wade's eyes sparkled with mischief, even in the face of imminent danger. Oh, come on, Francis, don't be like that. It's such a lovely name. I mean, it sounds like the name of a cat. You know the funniest part of all this? Francis asked, ignoring Wade's sharp tongue. You still think we're making you a superhero? You, a dishonorable discharge hook deep in some hooker whore? Did you really think you'd have a life with her? For the first time since his torture started, Wade's face lost its taunting air, hardening into a killer's glare. Francis continues, enjoying the new look he was receiving. You're nothing. This workshop doesn't make superheroes. We make super slaves. We're gonna fit you with a little collar and auction you off to the highest bidder. Who knows what they'll have you do? Slaughter freedom fighters, assassinate political rivals, set fire to a few orphanages? Maybe just mow the occasional lawn or perhaps wash the dishes. Without warning, the glass chamber began to close in on Wade, compressing the air around him. Panic surged through his veins as his chest constricted, and he struggled to catch his breath. The wall seemed to press against him, as he suffocated in the enclosed chamber. Can't, breathe, Wade gasped, his voice strained, his face contorted with pain. He fought against the inevitable, desperate to escape the tightening grip of the chamber. Ajax watched from outside, his expression devoid of compassion. Well, I'm heading home, he said, his voice filled with sadistic anticipation. I have a long day of fun all planned out tomorrow. Just for you. So I need my rest. Have a good night, Wade. As Ajax turned and walked off, leaving Wade to his torturous fate, Wade's eyes locked onto his retreating figure. 
Fear mingled with defiance, as he refused to let despair consume him. He mustered every ounce of willpower, refusing to give in to the suffocating darkness that threatened to claim him. The night wore on, and Wade remained trapped, his body racked with torment. Each gasp for air grew weaker, each moment of ease shorter, as the glass chamber mercilessly repeated its suffocating cycle. But Wade's spirit remained unbroken, his determination unwavering. What felt like hours turned into an eternity as Wade fought to stay alive, his thoughts wandered to the woman he loves. Vanessa. Her image flashed deep within his mind, replaying their time together. As he relived these beautiful and sometimes R-rated moments, Wade's will to live and see the love of his life once again grew to astronomical levels. And suddenly, something changed. An intense wave of burning pain shot through his entire body. His muscles spasmed and contorted as if they were fighting against an invisible force. His once handsome features contorted and morphed, taking on a grotesque and diseased appearance. Wade's smooth skin quickly changed into a patchwork of scar tissue, resembling the mottled flesh of a burn victim. As his body convulsed, his eyes caught sight of his reflection in the glass surrounding him. He couldn't tear his gaze away, even though he despised what stared back at him. A monster born of pain and suffering. Insert picture of Deadpool without suit here, and just as he stared in shock at his new self, a loud ear-piercing alarm filled the entire facility, followed by the sound of automatic gunfire. Although a commotion like this would usually spark hope in any captive's mind, Wade could only think of one thing. Vanessa will never love me like this. Under the cover of darkness, Peter stood with his daughter Lily near an abandoned hospital on the outskirts of New York City. Despite its supposed abandonment, the presence of heavily armed guards surrounding the desolate structure suggested otherwise. Although they would be hidden fairly well for normal people not to recognize their presence, Peter and Lily were a whole different story. As soon as they laid eyes on the place, their spider senses started tingling, informing the two of the danger in their surroundings. The night air hung heavy with an eerie stillness, adding to the tension that filled the atmosphere. Peter and Lily crouched on a nearby rooftop, their eyes scanning the perimeter of the hospital. The faint glow of the nearby streetlights cast long shadows over the cracked pavement, and the sound of sirens echoed in the distance, which was fairly normal for New York City. It was most likely going to be a gruesome sight inside, and Peter knew that bringing his young daughter along wasn't the greatest idea, but he also knew that she was stubborn and headstrong like her old man, so it was best to appease her even a little bit. With a glance, Peter signaled to Lily, reminding her of their agreement. Her role was to remain outside, vigilant and watchful, capturing anyone who tried to enter or exit the area. Though he knew she probably wouldn't have to act, he wanted to be sure no one slipped through the cracks. Lily nodded, understanding the importance of her task, even as her youthful excitement mingled with a hint of apprehension. This was her first real mission in the field, after all. Stay safe and don't do anything stupid, Peter said softly, his voice laced with concern. Remember, if you have any problems, call for me and I'll rush back out, okay? Lily nodded once more, determination shining in her young eyes. Yes sir. She gave him a mock salute. An amused smile played on Peter's lips as he watched his daughter take her position, her small frame disappearing into the shadows. He couldn't help but feel both proud and worried, knowing she was growing up in a manner far different from normal children. Though most children would probably kill to have Spider-Man as their father, especially since it comes with the added bonus of superpowers. Peter thought to himself. With Lily settled outside, Peter took a deep breath, stealing himself for what lay ahead. With his experience and power, this would most likely be a piece of cake. The only thing that he was worried about was the gruesome sights he may or may not find inside. No dead kids. No dead kids. No dead kids. He repeated in his mind, not in the mood to see something like that. Launching himself into action, Peter bounded toward the building with acrobatic grace, his every movement a testament to his years of training and experience. Without wasting a single second, Peter stealthily rushed to each hidden guard, knocking them unconscious with a single hit before rushing to the next and doing the same. Repeating this, he managed to incapacitate every armed guard that protected the hospital's perimeter. Meanwhile, just beyond the hospital's walls, Lily watched in awe as her father dispatched the guards with an effortless skill that didn't cease to amaze her. She watched as her father stepped out into the light of a street lamp and gave her a quick wave before rushing to the now unprotected building. Peter soared through the air and latched onto the hospital's walls, allowing him to scale its exterior with remarkable speed. As he reached the rooftop, he peered down through a shattered skylight, surveying the interior of the building. The scene below was a maze of dimly lit hallways, discarded medical equipment, and shattered glass, far from the facility that he expected to see. Maybe they used the lower floors? He guessed. Nonetheless, it was clear that nefarious activities were taking place within the supposed abandoned hospital. Determined to uncover the truth and put an end to whatever this was, Peter slipped inside unnoticed, blending with the shadows like a ghost. His enhanced agility and training in stealth allowed him to navigate the labyrinthine corridors without setting off any alarms or attracting unwanted attention. As Peter prowled through the shadows, he utilized his enhanced senses to detect the faintest of sounds, relying on his spider sense to alert him to any danger that might lie ahead. Soon enough, he encountered a group of armed guards patrolling one of the lower-level corridors, their weapons in hand. 
Without hesitation, Peter got to work, his lightning-fast reflexes and expertly shot webs rendering the guards incapacitated within seconds. Not wasting any time, Peter left these guards where they fell and moved swiftly through the dimly lit corridors, navigating the shadows with practiced ease as he made his way toward the lower floors, where he began to notice a new addition to each of the hallways. Security cameras appeared around every corner, watching for any anomalies, though Peter ensured he remained undetected them. After all, his suit made him invisible to any and all recording devices. As Peter descended into the sublevels below the basement, the absence of radio chatter seemed to catch the attention of the guards stationed in the security room. They grew suspicious, their senses heightened by the unnerving silence. Something was amiss. Realizing that their comrades had gone dark without any explanation, nor did any of them appear on the countless cameras, they knew something had to be wrong. With no other option, the guards activated the alarm system, the blaring sirens shattering the previously eerie silence. The sound reverberated throughout the halls, bouncing off the peeling wallpaper and broken equipment. Peter, unfazed by the sudden alarm, merely shook his head and shrugged. He had anticipated this turn of events. It was only a matter of time before his presence was discovered. Seeing as he didn't need to be stealthy anymore, Peter abandoned that approach, opting for a more direct and decisive strategy. He moved with unparalleled agility and reflexes, dodging bullets with ease as he incapacitated the guards one by one, making his way lower and lower into the facility. The abandoned hospital instantly erupted into chaos as armed guards scrambled to secure their positions. The echoing shots of gunfire filled the air, bringing fear to every guard who hadn't seen the enemy yet. And as he kept moving, Peter started to see signs of some seriously messed up shit. One entire floor was filled with old worn hospital beds, and many of these beds were occupied by bound men and women, who looked absolutely exhausted with clear signs of extreme torture visible on each of their bodies. And as soon as they saw him arrive in his iconic red and blue suit, their dead eyes instantly sparkled with signs of hope. Seeing this, Peter sighed in relief. Yes, they were in a horrible state, but so far it didn't seem like there were any children in this facility. Maybe that girl was their first underage target? Peter wondered as he turned to the many captives. Wait here while I clear the place out. As he disappeared from the captives view, the gunshots returned once again, though they soon grew distant as Peter made his way deeper into the abandoned hospital. They could only wait in anticipation, hoping that this wasn't some delusion brought on by the weeks and weeks of non-stop torture. Finally, after clearing out two more floors, where he found all sorts of sickening torture rooms, Peter arrived at a small room tucked away in the corner of the floor. And inside, trapped in a pod-like chamber of reinforced glass, a figure writhed in agony. His disfigured body filled the scars of immense suffering. He looked like a burned ball sack. Immediately, Peter froze as he caught sight of the man, his eyes widening in recognition. Damn me. It's Deadpool. Peter exclaimed in his mind, shocked that Wade Wilson actually existed in this world. Well, he did meet Dopinder a while back, so it made sense. Deadpool's lungs strained against the confines of his chest, struggling for every breath. Though he seemed to be acclimating to his torturous situation rather quickly, as the strain on Wade's face started to slowly ease up with each passing second. He must have just unlocked his powers. Peter surmised as he rushed up to the chamber, pulling it open. Good morning, sunshine. Did you have a good nap? Of course, since this was Deadpool he was dealing with, Peter decided to skip the normal pleasantries and went straight to the banter. Gasping for that sweet precious air that now filled his surroundings, Wade looked up at Peter, instantly realizing who he was. Asterisk heavy breathing asterisk it was alright? I'll give it a 6 out of 10 on Yelp. If there were chocolates on my pillow, then maybe it could have been a 7, but sadly the owners of this establishment aren't so accommodating. I know what you mean. Peter nodded understandingly as he reached over and tore the straps off of Wade's body. The second I walked into this place, the staff started shooting at me. Can you believe it? It's like they don't want any new customers. Smirking as he rose from his former torture device, Wade dropped the act. You know, I told Francis my spidey senses were tingling but he just didn't believe me. He said with a shake of his head. Exclamation point. Peter's eyes instantly widened as he heard this. Holy shit. Does he actually have 4th wall breaking powers? In the dimly lit room of the abandoned hospital, Peter, clad in his iconic red and blue Spider-Man suit, stared cautiously at his newest acquaintance. Though, thanks to his mask, Wade couldn't tell. Does he actually have 4th wall breaking powers? Peter wondered, hoping that Deadpool didn't know too much about him. You knew I was coming? He asked, playing it cool. Wade smirked as if he knew something that Peter didn't. No, how could I? It was just a feeling. I call it my Wade Tingle. Cool name, right? A slash N. Just to be clear, Wade's fourth wall breaking powers aren't something he can control and use at will. Think of it like a seer that has visions on occasion. Sort of. Also, his wall breaks won't happen all of the time. Moderation is key in my opinion. It makes it more funny slash interesting when it does happen. Okay, now he's just messing with me, Peter thought as he let out a sigh, giving up on that line of questioning for the time being. So, you good? Because you look like someone dunked their testicles in a deep fryer? It's not that bad, is it? Wade asks, his mood instantly dampening. 
You know, I feel like we're gonna be fast friends, so I'll give it to you straight. Peter says as he places a comforting hand on Wade's shoulder. You look like the child of a man who had sex with a rotten avocado. And to emphasize his point, Peter waved his hand and conjured a mirror in front of Wade so that he could take a close look at himself. I, his voice hitched in his throat. My face. My handsome, dashing face. My flawless, clear skin. I'm ugly. Yeah, sorry, bud. Peter consoled him as he vanished the mirror before Wade could spiral even further into depression. But look on the bright side, you can easily get a starring role in any horror film. Wade instantly turned to glare in his direction, as he could feel the smirk hidden under Peter's mask. Okay, sorry. That was too far. Peter raised his hands and apologized. But seriously, you do look like Freddy Krueger. He couldn't help himself. With a snap of his fingers, Peter swapped out Wade's shabby hospital gown and replaced it with a complete Freddy Krueger hollowed costume, including the finger knives. I really hate you right now, Wade said with a dead look in his eyes. Okay, okay, I'll stop, Peter said as he switched his clothes to a normal shirt and jeans. So, can you give me a rundown on what's been going on here? Seeing that the conversation was heading away from his horrid appearance, Wade was more than happy to explain everything. It all started in 1985, after listening to Wade's brief, yet descriptive, explanation, which also included parts of his life for some reason, Peter found no differences from the first Deadpool movie. Wade Wilson, a former Special Forces operative worked as a mercenary in New York City. How the hell did he not come up on my radar whatsoever? Peter wondered. Wade met escort-slash-prostitute Vanessa Carlyle at a local bar and they became romantically attached. One year later, Wade proposed to her and she accepted, but their happiness didn't last very long, as he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And though Vanessa remained unwaveringly by his side, Wade didn't want her to watch him die. He loved her far too much to put her through that. Soon enough, a recruiter from this facility approached Wade, offering an experimental cure for his cancer. And although he initially refused the offer, Wade eventually decided to leave Vanessa and undergo the procedure with hopes of returning to happily spend their life together. Sadly, those hopes were slowly crushed. At this very facility, Wade met Ajax slash Francis, whom he instantly resented. On the day they met, Francis injected Wade with a serum designed to awaken latent metahuman genes. Then he proceeded to have Wade subjected to weeks of torture to induce stress and trigger the mutation without much success. Until tonight, of course. Though Wade wasn't the only one subjected to this. Each person that Peter saw strapped to the beds upstairs went through the same exact torturous experimentation. Not to mention the countless other who have probably died as well. Wow, you got scammed, huh? Peter blurted out without thinking. Wade's eyes met Peter's masked face, his signature smirk playing at the corners of his lips. You know, Spidey, I've been through pretty messed up shit in my life, but this. This takes the cake. He raised a gloved hand, tracing the numerous scars on his face. Thanks for getting me out of there, buddy. Can't say I'll ever be pretty again, but I'll figure something out. Peter's gaze softened, turning empathetic. He knew the torment lurking beneath Wade's joking demeanor, the need for vengeance radiating from his very being. Wade, people like to say that revenge isn't the answer, but I just so happen to disagree. Those bastards need to pay for what they did to you and all of those other people too. Wade's eyes widened in surprise, his face portraying a mix of shock and amusement. Well, 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 Spidey. Who knew that the world's favorite do-gooder would say such scandalous things? Without another word, Peter conjured two gleaming Desert Eagle handguns, their metallic surfaces reflecting the dim light in the room. He held them out toward Wade, his proposition hanging in the air. You know, I didn't take you for the vengeance type, but I'm all in. So, what do you have in mind? Wade snatched the guns from Peter's grasp with one fluid motion, quickly making sure that each of them had ammunition. We'll clear out the rest of this facility together, and maybe, just maybe, we can make those bastards regret the day they laid a finger on you. Peter said, sparking a bit of excitement in his new friend. Whirling his new guns, a bloodthirsty smirk appeared on Wade's face. You had me at sweet revenge, Spidey. Let's give those baddies a taste of their own medicine. With a shared nod, the unlikely duo started clearing the rest of the floors together, descending into the bowels of the facility. As they moved through each hallway, the two dismantled the defenses of their enemies, like a well-choreographed dance. The guards they encountered were no match for the seamless combination of Spider-Man's agility and Deadpool's relentless precision. Watching Wade wielding his desert eagles was like watching Michelangelo wield a brush. Killing was truly his calling in life, whether the public would agree with it or not. Oh, that's gotta hurt. Peter muttered as he witnessed Wade shoot a man's arm off. But that wasn't all. No, he then proceeded to beat the poor guy to death with his own arm. And although Peter didn't plan on killing any of these people, especially in such gruesome ways, as his daughter was nearby, Deadpool wasn't exactly the type that spared his enemies any courtesy. So, with a single sigh, Peter joined Wade in slaughtering the remaining guards whilst making sure that his victims died a faster more painless death than the rest. Of course, Peter didn't mind killing the guards, as anyone who could work in a literal torture factory deserved nothing less. Together, they weaved through the corridors, leaving a trail of blood and death in their wake. 
and as they fought, Wade started to figure out what his metahuman powers were. Healing factor, extremely high, superhuman strength, low, superhuman speed agility reflexes, low, superhuman stamina, mid, superhuman durability, mid. If he didn't have to turn ugly to get these powers, and Francis wasn't such an obnoxious prick, then Wade might just be grateful for all the weeks of unending torture that he was forced to go through. But sadly, that wasn't the case. As they pressed on, the echoes of gunfire rang through the dirty hallways, punctuated by the occasional wisecrack from Deadpool. I disarmed him. A guy's arms were blown off, leaving him screaming in agony as he swiftly bled to death. Oh, now that's a facial. The blood from one dying guard splattered into the face of another, who Wade swiftly killed next. Look, Spidey. It's Michael Jackson. Wade fired bullets at a single guard's feet, forcing him to dance for their entertainment before putting a bullet in his forehead. It's safe to say that Wade was enjoying the first phase of his revenge to the fullest. And although Peter found most of the carnage a bit gross, he couldn't help but laugh at some of it. Their partnership was like an intricate ballet of carnage and finesse, as they made it to the last floor and killed the final guard. Hmm, it looks like none of the doctors or big shots were here. Peter said as they only ran into guards. Yeah, they all left after throwing me into that chamber. Wade says as they found a highly secure room filled with all sorts of equipment and a single workstation. We'll have to hunt down the rest? We. Oui. Peter asks as he walked over to a workstation and plugged a flash drive into the computer. Instantly, the PC lit up as all of its data was copied onto the drive. Yeah, I was thinking that you could use your superhero contacts to find Francis so that I can torture him until he agrees to turn me back to my former more stunning self. Wade explains his game plan. And if I refuse? Peter asked as he walked over to a nearby fridge, finding a bunch of vials filled with all sorts of colorful liquids. Shrugging to himself, Peter collected the vials and stashed them into a portal before turning to find two shiny desert eagles in his face. Then I'll just have to shoot you until you agree to help? Wade said with a smirk. Okay. Peter shrugged as the guns in Wade's grasp disappeared, disarming him with a single thought. Come on, hot. Wade grunted in surprise as he watched Peter walk off. Where are you going? I have to release the other test subjects upstairs and call for backup to deal with them. Peter stood and turns to look back over his shoulder. Are you coming or what? But what about Francis? Wade asks. I said okay. Peter nodded as he turned to walk down the hall, leaving Wade behind. I'll help you find him, but if you're going to be a superhero, then you need a cool name. Hey. Wade shouted as he rushed to catch up, walking alongside Peter. I am not a superhero. Yeah, you are. You just unlocked superpowers and helped me, a known superhero, take down a facility that illegally experiments on innocent people. Face it, you're a superhero? Peter says as he pats his new friend on the shoulder. Welcome to the club. The night air brought on a cold wind as Peter and Wade emerged from the dimly lit corridors of the abandoned hospital. The ordeal they had just faced was finally over, the echoes of their triumph fading into the shadows behind them. The building had been cleared of any and all nefarious individuals who had subjected Wade and many others to unspeakable tortures in hopes of activating their dormant X-gene and turning them into superpowered slaves. Outside, the moon cast a faint glow over the desolate landscape. Waiting patiently by the entrance, bathed in the pale light, stood Lily, Peter's ten-year-old daughter. Her eyes widened as she caught sight of her father and the mangled-looking figure beside him. Dad! Lily exclaimed, bounding toward them with unbridled excitement. You're back! Who's this guy? She looks at Wade in confusion and pity. The perks of being an AI allowed Lily to see Wade, not as the monster that he currently appeared to be, but as a man who was most likely tortured a great deal. After all, his face alone made him look like a burn victim. Peter smiled under his mask as he embraced his daughter. This is someone I want you to meet. His name is Wade Wilson. He helped me clear out all of the bad guys inside. Hi there, little lady. Wade condescendingly greeted Lily, his voice slow and overly loud, as if he were addressing someone mentally challenged or deaf. It was clear that Wade didn't have much experience with children, and his interactions reflected that ignorance. I'm Wade. Can you say Wade? He said, a touch of patronizing kindness in his voice. You must be Spider-Girl, huh? Your daddy here tells me you're one smart cookie. Lily tilted her head, scrutinizing Wade's peculiar behavior. She turned to her father, her voice tinged with concern. Dad, does he have something wrong with his head? Did those bad guys beat his brain into mush? Peter chuckled and shook his head, placing a reassuring hand on Lily's shoulder. No, sweetheart, Wade's just, well, he's an idiot. But don't worry, he's harmless. Well, that wasn't exactly the truth. Deadpool is extremely deadly, though Peter knew that he was harmless to her, as Wade would never harm an innocent person, especially a kid. As they continued their conversation, a familiar figure emerged from the shadows. MJ, Peter's girlfriend, and Lily's mother approached them, wearing her silk suit, with a mix of relief and frustration hidden under her mask. Her eyes bore into Peter with a steely gaze. Ahem. MJ cleared her throat, drawing everyone's attention. You took our daughter out at this ungodly hour? Do you know how much I've had to deal with since you left? The grannies have been pacing around the whole house in worry. I've had to listen to them complain for hours. 
The only reason that she knew where Peter and her daughter were was thanks for her place in the Avengers. As soon as Peter called for a team to come and clean up the hospital and help with the survivors, she was able to receive the information from Jarvis. MJ glared straight at Peter, clearly unhappy. Not only that, but you even gave her the spider suit without me? That's a big moment for our daughter that I would have liked to be there for. And I would have also liked to be there for her first day as a superhero, but that seems to have passed as well. Since MJ wasn't as overprotective as Lily's grandparent, she was mainly upset at the fact that she wasn't included. Peter glanced at MJ, realizing he had made a series of missteps in his eagerness to show his daughter the dragon graveyard. He knew he had some explaining to do. Ah, oops, Peter replied dumbly, his voice tinged with remorse. It was all a bit chaotic, and I didn't really think. I should have included you, I know. I'm sorry. MJ's frustration softened slightly as she knew that Peter wasn't purposely excluding her. She sighed, her anger giving way to concern. You're damn right you're sorry. But I'm just glad that nothing went wrong and our daughter is safe. Listening to my mother you'd think she would have been turned into minced meat by now, MJ said, clearly annoyed with Grace's overprotective nature. Though her protectiveness was certainly warranted. After all, Lily is only a child. MJ sighed once again. Let's talk about this later, okay? Someone needs to get to bed. She turns to Lily. It's way past your bedtime. Peter nodded, grateful that MJ didn't seem too mad at him. I'll follow you guys back in a bit. I need to find a place for Wade to spend the night. He glanced at Wade, who was watching the family-oriented exchange with a mixture of amusement and curiosity. Come on, MJ said, holding her hand out to her daughter. Let's get you home. It's been a long night. As they made their way into the darkness, heading back home to quell the boiling concern of Lily's grandmothers, Wade turned to Peter. Wow, she's a fiery one, isn't she? He says, giving Peter an approving nod. She reminds me of my sweet Vanessa. If only I could dash Wade was interrupted by the appearance of multiple black SUVs, which quickly sped into the parking lot, parked, and released countless armed agents in black suits. Sir. One of the more senior agents paced over to Peter and greeted him with respect. Peter nodded as he motioned at the hospital behind him. Inside you'll find everything I explained. Help the captives, detain any of the surviving guards, and clean up the rest of the scene as usual. I want a complete list of each captive's name and address along with any other needed information. Especially if they activated their ex-gene. Yes, sir. The man said as he turned and began shouting orders. Ignoring them, Peter turned to Wade. Okay, we should get moving. I need to find you a place to stay. The next day, Peter awoke alone in his bed after only a few hours of sleep. After finding Wade a hotel room, which was paid for with his Avengers company card, Peter bid him farewell and left to get some sleep. Thankfully, Grace and May were already in bed by the time he got home, which saved him from a very long lecture that will no doubt take place as soon as he leaves his room. Let's face the music, Peter thought as he climbed out of his warm bed and made his way downstairs. Instantly, he was met with the glare of two grandmas, who were ready and waiting for this very moment. Here we go. After spending an hour silently nodding his head up and down, doing his best to placate the angry grannies, Peter was finally free. Truthfully, the whole situation would have been much worse, but thankfully, Lily and MJ seemed to have spoken up for him beforehand, saving him from a much longer and no doubt louder lecture. And since he was free, Peter thought it best to give the angry women some space, so he donned his spider suit and portaled right into Wade's hotel room. Uh huh. Oh yeah, baby. Shaboink me. The sounds of a bed shaking alongside womanly moans echoed from the open bedroom down the hall. Turning his head, Peter stared straight into the open door and found a scene that made him want to wash his eyes out with bleach. Wade, who was completely naked, hid his face under a brown paper bag, on which he drew a goofy-looking face. He was tied to his bed and being ridden by a middle-aged prostitute. Liquor bottles filled the room and the smell of cigarette smoke clouded the air. I, Peter muttered, wondering if he should make his presence known before finally coming to a decision. I'm not dealing with this. Stepping back into the portal, Peter was once again met by the glares of Grace and May. You know what? Peter thought as he stepped back through the portal once again. I'd rather be here right now. He knew that May and Grace wouldn't be mad at him for long, as they were only worried for Lily, so for now he would simply allow them some time to cool down. Closing the bedroom door with a wave of his hand and opening all of the windows to vent the air, Peter grabbed the hotel's menu and ordered himself some room service while he waited for Wade to finish his business. What's on TV? Peter wondered as he took a seat on the couch. Though as he sat down, Peter could feel something sticky under him. Taking a closer look, he soon noticed that the couch, which was in pristine condition yesterday, was now covered in some unknown substances. Well, Peter could guess what it was but he didn't exactly want to think about it. This might just be the worst day that I've ever had. Francis, also known as Ajax, jolted awake in his dimly lit bedroom as the shrill sound of his cell phone pierced the silence. A slash N, the dreaded iPhone alarm sound. That shit gave me PTSD. Even if I hear it when I'm awake, I always feel anxious and jolt a bit, he fumbled for the device on his nightstand, squinting at the screen to read the incoming call. The caller ID displayed the number of one of his men. An emergency call at this hour could only mean trouble. 
Groggy and disoriented, Francis answered the call, his voice laced with annoyance. What is it? Can't this wait a few more hours? The voice on the other end was urgent, filled with a sense of panic. Ajax, it's bad. The Project X facility's been raided. They came in late last night. Dread washed over Francis as he sat up, fully alert now. Who? Who raided us? The man hesitated before responding, his voice trembling. I don't know for sure, but there are government-type agents in black suits and unmarked SUVs parked outside. They've cordoned off the entire area. They're taking everything. Equipment, bodies, surviving test subjects. Even some of our men were dragged out in cuffs. Francis was taken aback by the news. He had been at the facility just the night before. Thankfully, he had decided to leave early and get some sleep. The realization hit him like a lightning bolt. If he had stayed, he could have been caught in the crossfire. Though who knows? With his immunity to pain, enhanced strength, durability, and reflexes, Francis might have been able to fend off the attack. He is a metahuman after all. His mind raced with questions. Did they get the serum? Of course, he means the serum they were using to activate the dormant X gene in their test subjects. I don't know. Everyone inside the facility was either killed or captured. I only found out because I was on my way to work. I saw those men surrounding the place and knew something was wrong, so I kept driving. The man's response was tinged with uncertainty. Although it wasn't said out loud, both parties knew it was very likely that these agents took the serum, as well as their data, which would allow them to make it themselves as well. Francis clenched his fist, his anger building. Who were these people? How dare they interfere with his plans? He couldn't let them ruin everything he had worked for. And most importantly, he couldn't let the serum fall into somebody else's hands. Find out everything you can about these agents. Their identities, their organization. I want to know who they are, Francis demanded, his voice dripping with killing intent. The man on the other end understood the gravity of the situation. I'll do my best. One more thing, Francis added. Contact all surviving members. They need to disappear immediately. Who knows when these agents will come knocking? Yes, sir, the man replied. Without another word, Francis hung up the phone, his mind already spinning with thoughts of revenge. He couldn't let this setback discourage him. He would track down those responsible, unleash his wrath upon them, and retrieve what was rightfully his. With a determined stride, Ajax left his bedroom, ready to exact revenge and reclaim his plans from the clutches of those who dared to stand in his way. But before that, he needed to get moving. After all, his house would no doubt be compromised soon enough. He would have to abandon anything attached to his most recent identity and start all over again. At least until this unknown enemy was dealt with. As he dressed in his signature black attire, Francis pulled out his phone and texted his assistant, Angel Dust, a metahuman with adrenaline-based powers. Of course, the message was very cryptic but to them, it was easy to understand. They needed to go dark and meet up at a specific location. After sending the text, Francis didn't wait for a reply and tossed his phone into the crackling fireplace, where it sizzled and melted under the high heat. Quickly collecting some of his most precious belongings, Francis armed the house's security system and left. After Wade finally finished with his Lady of the Night, the two of them sat in the living room together. Of course, Peter made sure to cleanse his suit as well as the hotel room with every cleaning spell that he had in his arsenal. Though he still contemplated incinerating his suit and making a new one whenever the memory of sitting on that disgusting couch resurfaces. You couldn't just sleep for the night like a normal person? Peter asked, his mood prickly. And what about Vanessa? What the love of my life doesn't know won't hurt her. Wade shrugged. Besides, we aren't exactly together right now, so I don't count it as cheating. So, you'd be fine with her getting tied to a bed and plowed by some middle-aged dude? Peter asked. After all, you guys aren't exactly together, right? Instantly, the look of a killer appeared on Wade's face. Peter's words certainly seemed to strike a chord. I see your point. Wade conceded. Though now he was thinking about slaughtering every single man that dared to touch his fiancé while he was away. No doubt they would die spectacularly. That is if she decided to cheat on him, though she was a prostitute so it's a possibility. After all, she would need to earn a living. A slash N. I'll say this now because some people get triggered about this. She did not and will not cheat on Wade. Especially since Wade literally pulled the I'm going out to buy some milk and cigarettes only to disappear without a word of warning or goodbye. Anyway, get dressed and grab your guns, Peter said, changing the subject. Huh? Why? Wade asked. I found where Francis lives. Peter dropped a bomb on him, shocking his newest friend. Why didn't you say so earlier? Wade shouted as he rushed into the bedroom to find his clothes from yesterday. Originally, he wanted to go stalk his fiancée to see how she was doing, as he hadn't seen her in so long, but this was more important at the moment. After all, in Wade's mind, Francis was his key to fixing his grotesque appearance, which would allow him to reunite with Vanessa. Well, you were kind of busy. Peter shrugged. Stepping through a portal, Peter and Wade stood in front of an expensive modern house, their eyes scanning the area for any signs of their target. The setting sun cast an eerie glow on the secluded area, heightening the tension in the air. As soon as they arrived, Wade's impatience was already beginning to show. Come on, Spidey, what are we waiting for? 
Wade's fingers twitched as he cocked his dessert eagles, his trigger-happy nature on full display. Let's get in there and show this bald bastard what happens when you mess with the merc with a mouth. Peter sighed. Wade, we've been through this. That's a horrible superhero name. Anything more than two words is just too much. Before leaving, Peter gave him some superhero name ideas, though he made sure that each of them was either lackluster or a joke. After all, he didn't want to accidentally make Wade call himself anything but Deadpool. Alright, remember, you said that you need Francis to help you. We can't kill him, no matter what. Peter said, though he didn't believe that Francis would be able to do so. Wade nodded, though that didn't mean he couldn't torture the living hell out of him. With a determined look on his face, Wade stormed towards the front door, kicking it open with a sinister smirk on his face. Honey, I'm home. He yelled with the love of a returning husband. Peter followed closely behind, shaking his head at Wade's grand entrance. As they entered the house, Wade's voice reverberated through the empty rooms, demanding Francis to show himself. Each door swung open under the force of Wade's kicks, revealing nothing but deserted spaces. The house seemed devoid of any life besides the lit fireplace, showing that someone must have been here rather recently. Peter watched Wade's rampage with a mixture of amusement and detachment. He had already grown accustomed to the chaos that often accompanied his new friend's actions. As they reached the upper floor, the two soon realized that the house was completely empty. Peter shrugged, his disappointment evident. Looks like someone tipped him off. He must know what happened to his facility. Wade's shoulders slumped, his hopes of resolution fading away. He had wanted to finish this today, to quickly reunite with Vanessa as the man she remembered, not the disfigured monster he saw in the mirror whenever he had to take a piss. As they made their way back downstairs, Peter's spider senses suddenly went into overdrive. Something wasn't right. Peter couldn't help but notice a small security panel by the front door. It had been silently counting down this entire time, unnoticed by both of them. Staring at the security panel, his spider senses started tingling like crazy. Only two seconds remained on the countdown. Acting swiftly, Peter grabbed Wade's arm and waved his hand, creating a portal underneath them leading to the roof of a distant building. The sudden displacement left Wade momentarily bewildered as they landed on their feet, but realization quickly dawned on him as the house they had just been inside exploded in a spectacular display of destruction. Debris rained down as Peter and Wade stood on the rooftop, watching the flames and smoke rise into the evening sky. Luckily the house was a good distance from any other properties, so no one was hurt. Wade stared at what remained of the burning house. That bastard actually booby-trapped his own house? Peter nodded. I'll give the guy some credit. He has a big set of balls on him. You. Wade groaned in disgust. I can't get the image out of my head. He said, slapping himself in the face with one of his desert eagles. Go away. Go away. Wade Wilson walked through the entrance of Sister Margaret School for Wayward Children, a dimly lit bar tucked away in a quiet corner of the city. He wore a simple set of clothes with a paper bag adorned his head, a sad-looking frown drawn on the front alongside eye and mouth holes. With each step, he dragged his friend, Peter inside, who had been unsuccessfully assisting him in apprehending Francis, the sadistic man responsible for his ugly transformation. Inside the bar, Wade's heavy footsteps echoed against the wooden floor, the only sound breaking the silence were the many patrons inside, drinking and chatting amongst one another. And as they made it fully into the bar, panic instantly spread throughout the room as the criminal clientele caught sight of Spider-Man's unmistakable figure. In a flurry of movement, the customers abandoned their drinks and scrambled to escape, fearing that the arrival of the webslinger signaled their impending doom. What the? Hey! You didn't pay your bill. Weasel, the well-known bartender, and friend of Wade, called out in confusion, wondering why everyone was evacuating the place so abruptly. What the hell is going on dash, insert picture of Weasel here, as Peter's figure rounded the corner, Weasel found himself frozen behind the bar, his mind racing with thoughts of potential arrests. After all, almost everything about this establishment was illegal. It was practically a guild for mercenaries, where anyone could pick up or put out a contract for all sorts of dirty work. However, before fear could fully grip him, Wade slid onto a vacant stool at the bar. Sex on the beach? He ordered in a crestfallen tone. Recognizing Wade's distinct voice, Weasel's shock only increased. He was elated to see his friend alive and well, or as well as someone wearing a paper bag over their head could be. Wade! You're alive! His eyes darted to Peter, still uncertain of the famous hero's intentions. Don't worry about Spidey. He's not here on business, Wade quickly vouched for him. And yes, I'm alive. Did you think I would die so easily? If he's not here on business, then why is he here? Weasel asks as he continued to eye the hero warily. Wade gestured to Peter, who took a seat beside him at the bar. Spidey here saved me from some pretty nasty torture and the life of a slave that would have come afterward. Curiosity got the better of Weasel as he leaned over the bar, his gaze fixed on Wade's concealed face. Ah, uh, okay. I'm guessing all of this has to do with that creepy guy who you met with last month, but I just have a couple questions. Weasel leaned over the bar with a mix of concern and morbid curiosity. Why are you wearing a paper bag over your head? And where the hell have you been? After all, there had been a lot of people cashing in on their bets from the Deadpool, thinking Wade had met his demise. 
Wade's voice oozed with sarcasm, as per usual, as he explained that some so-called miracle workers had promised to cure his cancer, but instead, they had left him looking like a burn victim. His cancer was no longer an issue, but now he had a face that could launch a thousand nightmares. Can I see it? Weasel asked curiously. No. Wade swiftly refused as he chugged his drink through a small mouth hole in the paper bag. Come on. Weasel whined like a kid. Just show me already. You can't hide your ugly mug forever. No, it's dashed before Wade could say anything more, a mischievous grin spread across Peter's face as he reached over and yanked the paper bag off. Weasel's eyes widened, a mixture of shock and amusement taking over. You look like a burnt Mr. Potato Head. Unable to resist his comedic instincts, he couldn't help but crack a few jokes about Wade's unconventional appearance. It's like someone ran over a possum and then set it on fire. Weasel couldn't stop himself. Peter joined in. Like a mole rat with acid burns, he said, ignoring the glare that Wade was giving him. Like a hairless dog with skin cancer. Like a cat that wasted a few of its lives playing in a fireplace. Like a fish that got. Like a. Peter and Weasel went back and forth, roasting Wade's new appearance viciously. Are you done? Wade asked, fed up with both of them. Yeah. Weasel nods, staring at Wade in concern. Are you okay? He may have made some jokes, as that was the basis of their friendship, but that didn't mean he didn't care. Yeah, I'm good. Wade nods. I just need to catch the bastard that did this time me so he can fix it? Don't worry. Peter pats Wade on the shoulder a few times. He won't be able to run for long. We'll get him next time. With everything out in the open and the initial shock wearing off, Wade's attention shifted to a pressing concern. Where's Vanessa? He asks, staring straight at Weasel. I checked the apartment and she wasn't there. It had been almost a month since he last saw his fiance, and he had no idea where she might be. Weasel sighed. Well, since you disappeared without saying anything, she was obviously crushed and heartbroken, he explained. Wade's head dropped downward, staring at the bottom of his glass. Weasel continued, his tone growing more serious. After a couple weeks of waiting for you to come back, she ran out of money and had to start working again. She took a job at a pretty popular strip club. Last I heard, she was making a few thousand a night. Vanessa chose that path instead of returning to her former life as a prostitute. She didn't have the means or skills to support herself otherwise, and the choice between working at a minimum wage job or dancing her way to financial stability had been an easy one. Here, Weasel scribbled down an address on a piece of paper, passing it to Wade with a sympathetic look. That's where she works. As Wade took the paper, he felt a mix of emotions wash over him. Relief, anticipation, and a renewed determination to find the woman he loves and explain himself. But not before he was back to his old handsome self. I hate to say this because I know that you don't want her to see you like this, but... Peter spoke up, drawing Wade's attention away from the paper in his hand. What? Wade asks as he stashed the address in his pocket. Francis knows about Vanessa, right? Peter asked, receiving a nod in return. Then shouldn't we be moving her to a safe location? Francis may try to use her against you, especially when he learns that we're searching for him. The same thing happened in the first Deadpool movie. Wade was an idiot who forgot that his enemies could go after his loved ones at any time. Suddenly, realization dawned on Wade as he dropped his empty glass, which shattered on the wooden floor. Hey, you have to pay for that. Weasel admonished, as otherwise it would be taken out of his pay. Ignoring the angry bartender, Wade practically jumped out of his seat and rushed to the door. And of course, Peter was quick to follow him out. Wait. Weasel shouted. You didn't pay. Outside the bar, Wade found a good-looking car and broke it open before hopping inside and hot-wiring it. Seriously? Peter asked with a sigh. You know I can just portal us there, right? Wade froze for a moment before hopping out of the car and looking at Peter expectantly. Well, what are you waiting for? Let's go. His future wife could be in danger so he didn't have time to waste. The address? Peter said as he held out his hand. Here. In a dimly lit strip club bathroom, where the air was heavy with the stench of stale beer and sweat, a golden portal opened, revealing Peter and Wade, who was once again wearing his paper bag. We're here, Peter says as he holds his nose from the foul stench of the place. Though I wish we weren't. Unlike Peter, Wade sniffed the air without any trouble. Ah, the unhygienic stench of desperation and loneliness. This is definitely a strip club. All right, how are we doing this? Peter asks. Are you taking the lead or what? Because someone needs to explain to her what's going on. Well, Wade didn't sound very confident. I was thinking that we could kidnap her and hold her somewhere until Francis is taken care of. Peter just looked at him in silence for a moment. You would rather put the woman you love through a frightening kidnapping than simply tell her what's going on? Yes. Wade nods his head, unashamed by his answer. And you refuse to reveal yourself? Peter asked and received another nod in return. Sigh, why must you make everything so complicated? Peter leaned against the bathroom wall, his arms crossed, as he waited for Wade to finish adjusting his tactical suit. Although Peter didn't agree with this, as he knew it would be better to simply explain things to Vanessa, Wade refused to see things his way. So, they would be breaking the law today. 
Just as Wade wants, the two of them would kidnap his fiancée and move her to a safe location, where hopefully, Peter could either convince Wade to reveal himself or perhaps, trick him into doing so instead. Meh, he'll figure something out, Peter shrugged. Wade tugged at the straps on the suit, muttering to himself. Man, this thing is tight. Are you sure I won't suffocate in here? Insert picture of Deadpool suit, Peter rolled his eyes, his voice laced with impatience. It's designed for maximum flexibility and protection. You'll be fine. Just keep your focus on finding Vanessa. Peter didn't think it best for him to wear the paper bag for this, so he conjured up a normal tactical suit that matched the Deadpool aesthetic. It wasn't anything crazy like Peter's suit, but it would be enough for this. Wade adjusted the mask, his eyes narrowing behind the red and black fabric. Right. Vanessa. Gotta keep my girl safe from Francis. He straightened up and struck a dramatic pose. Don't worry, Spidey, the crimson chin is on the case. Please stop coming up with these shitty names. They just don't work. Peter couldn't help but chuckle. Just remember. We need to keep a low profile. No unnecessary violence. Wade grinned, a mischievous glint in his eyes. No promises, webhead, he said as he turned and left the bathroom. Shaking his head in annoyance, Peter discreetly activated the enchantment on his spider suit, watching as it transformed into a sleek, pitch-black form. Now unrecognizable as Spider-Man, he followed Wade out into the dimly lit club. They stepped out of the bathroom and into the pulsating atmosphere of the strip club. The bass thumped through the air, mingling with the voices and laughter of the surrounding patrons. Wade adjusted his mask once again, ensuring his face was hidden beneath its intimidating design. Men stood around the runway-styled stage, throwing money at practically naked women who danced on long shining poles for their pleasure. Other men sat in their own booths, accompanied by similar women, who fawned over them as if they were the most handsome men in the world. They certainly weren't. Meanwhile, the bigger spenders were invited into the back of the club, where secluded rooms were set up for private dances. Suckers, Peter thought as he watched these women expertly drain them dry of their money. As they navigated through the crowd, their eyes scanned the room, searching for any sign of Vanessa. The scent of perfume and alcohol mixed with the flashing neon lights created a surreal atmosphere. Wade's eyes widened as he spotted a door at the back marked employees only. He motioned for Peter to follow him, and they stealthily made their way toward it. Inside a nearby dressing room, a beautiful woman with long brown hair and matching eyes stood before a mirror, dressed skimpily, carefully applying her makeup. Insert picture of Vanessa here, the soft glow of the lights accentuated her beauty, but her expression carried a mix of weariness and uncertainty. Although she didn't return to prostitution, in a way, she was still selling her body to similar clientele, which was a bit disheartening when she thought about it. Though the money alone made this a far better job than anything else that she could be doing. Staring at herself in a tiny handheld mirror, Vanessa sighed. I just wish Wade was here. She thought sadly. Unbeknownst to Vanessa, a security guard, who was meant to be guarding the hall outside from any weird and overzealous patrons, watched her with lust-filled eyes. He had been watching her carefully ever since she started working here, waiting for the best moment to strike. Stalking up behind her unnoticed, as her mirror far was too small to show anything behind her, the rather muscular guard peered over her shoulder, admiring her exposed breasts. Unable to hold himself back any longer, he reached his hand out, his intentions clear. Suddenly, the door quietly opened and a red and black clothed head peeked inside. Instantly, Wade's rage bubbled to the surface as he burst into the room. Hands off, scumbag. He shouted, his voice filled with fury. The security guard stumbled backward, startled by Wade's sudden appearance. Who the hell are you? Wade cracked his knuckles, a wicked grin spreading across his face. I'm the crimson chin, mother schmucker. Not again. Peter rolled his eyes and let out a sigh. Without warning, Wade launched himself at the guard, a flurry of punches and kicks raining down upon him, leaving the guard reeling as he tried and failed to defend himself. Meanwhile, Vanessa leaped out of her seat and backed up into the corner, surprised by the sudden fight that broke out in the middle of her dressing room. Though before she ran over to cower in the corner, she was sure to hit a small emergency button under the table, which sent out a distress call to all security guards in the building. After all, being a stripper is a hazardous business. Clients can easily grow obsessive and delusional, leading to all sorts of unsavory situations. Bam, a red and black clothed fist smashed into the guard's face, sending him spiraling to the floor. Don't you ever. Wade exclaimed as he started stomping the guard's downed body. Try to touch her again. Vanessa wondered what he meant by that and why he seemed so protective of her. She felt that this masked man was familiar, though the mask muffled his voice, leaving her confused as to who it was. Peter leaned against the door frame, enjoying the show, though that was quickly ruined as a crowd of similarly dressed guards came running down the hall behind him. Quick to react, Peter turned around and swung into action. His movements were agile and precise as he incapacitated the guards one by one, using nothing but his inhuman speed to outclass them with ease. Uh -huh. Aha! Ugh! Off! Vanessa's fear only grew as she heard the screams of agony and pain that echoed from outside the door. Barely a minute passed before Peter returned, completely unscathed, with a pile of unconscious guards behind him. And when he returned, Wade was still stomping the guard that tried to get handsy with his fiancée. 
The floor was filled with blood and the man's head was partially caved inwards. Though he was still breathing. Stupid dumb stupid bitch. Wade never stopped insulting the guy as he continued to brutally assault him. I think that's enough, Peter said as Wade calmed down and returned to his senses. Nodding his head, Wade pulled out one of his desert eagles and aimed downward. And no. Wait, bang, the man tried to speak, but Wade didn't listen and simply pulled the trigger, piercing a bullet straight into his pants and blowing his unmentionables clean off. Aha. Uh -huh. The man let out a high-pitched scream as he rolled on the floor, holding his crotch in agony. Seriously? Peter asked in exasperation. What? He deserved it. Wade shrugged uncaringly. Exclamation point. Vanessa, wide-eyed in fear, watched all of this from the corner of the room, a lamp in hand ready to defend herself if need be. Fear mingled with confusion as she tried to comprehend the situation unfolding before her. Peter looked toward Wade, motioning for him to speak to her, but he just couldn't muster up the courage. Sighing in exasperation, Peter made a quick mental note to beat some sense into him later as he stepped up toward the frightened woman. Vanessa's voice trembled as she spoke, her trust wavering. Who are you? Why are you doing this? Look, we're not here to hurt you, Peter says, receiving a very skeptical look from Vanessa. Believe it or not. I don't care. We don't have much time right now, so just come with us and we'll explain everything, okay? Of course, she didn't believe a word that came out of Peter's mouth, staying firmly in the corner, ready to lash out at whoever came near her. Seeing that this wasn't working, Peter sighed and waved his hand. Sleep, he said and moved forward to catch her as her eyes dropped shut and her body collapsed into a deep slumber. What did you do to her? Wade asks in concern as he turns his desert eagle toward Peter. She's asleep, you idiot. Rolling his eyes at his friend's overreaction, Peter tossed Vanessa over to him. Exclamation point. Wade's eyes widened as he dropped his gun and scrambled to catch his fiancé in a princess carry. Don't throw her like that. She's not a sack of potatoes. Suddenly, the sound of police sirens echoes from outside the building. I think that's our cue, Peter says, ignoring Wade's glare as he opens a portal and steps through. Come on. Let's go. I'd rather not deal with the cops. Minutes later, when the police finally breached the building with a heavily armed SWAT unit, they found no sign of the perpetrators. Though they did find a badly beaten penisless man alongside a large pile of unconscious guards, leaving them no choice but to seal off the area in hopes of catching the fleeing perpetrators. Soft, dim light, cast gentle shadows across the spacious penthouse apartment, which just so happened to be one of the many shield slash avengers safe houses in New York City. Wade cradled Vanessa in his arms, her delicate form pressed against his chest as they made their way toward the master bedroom. With careful tenderness, he lowered her down onto the plush mattress, ensuring her comfort was tended to perfectly. As he settled Vanessa down, Wade couldn't help but let out a light-hearted grumble. Seriously? She gets these fancy digs, and I'm stuck in some plain hotel room? You're really playing favorites here, Spidey. Peter glanced at Wade. Come on. You know this is just a temporary arrangement until we take care of Francis. She needs protection, and this place was available. It has round-the-clock surveillance and agents at every possible entry point. She'll be safe here. Wade crossed his arms, pouting under his mask. I know, I know. You're right. Safety first and all that jazz. Besides, after what you did to that hotel room, do you really think that I'd ever let you stay in a place like this? Nope, from now on it's nothing but rundown motels for you. Peter says with a shake of his head. Come on. Wade whined like a kid. Give me a second chance. I promise that I won't jizz on the couch ever again. You did far more than that and you know it? Peter pointed an accusing glare at him. Now, lower your voice before she wakes up. Hearing Peter's warning, Wade shut his mouth and swiftly turned to make sure that she was still asleep. Sighing in relief, as she was still out cold, his voice softening. She's even more beautiful than I remembered. I need to fix myself before seeing her again. You know, for a badass mercenary you're really acting like a sissy, aren't you? Peter says matter-of-factly. Who the hell are calling a sissy? Wade turns to Peter, appalled that he would call him that. After all, Wade was the exact opposite of a sissy. He would gladly jump headfirst into danger for something as small as a chimichanga and a cold cherry ice to wash it down. I'm 100% fat, hairy, bastard. I got veins and all. Wade jutted his hips forward, turning the conversation in a rather gross direction. Really? Peter says in amusement as he gestures to Vanessa. Then wake her up and introduce yourself. Without a mask, of course, Wade looked toward his sleeping fiancé, freezing on the spot. Turning away from her, Wade looks at Peter once again. Fine, I admit it. I'm not a BBC. I'm a sissy. I just… I'm scared, okay? What if she's disgusted with me? I would be. Peter stepped closer, placing a comforting hand on Wade's shoulder. Wade, listen to me. Vanessa loves you. She's seen the person beneath that mangled face of yours. And if she can't accept you for who you are, then maybe she's not worth your time and love. Wade shook his head, his voice filled with doubt. But, she signed up to marry a handsome, dashing mercenary. This, he gestured to his scarred face, isn't what she signed up for. I don't even have hair anymore, for crying out loud. God, I loved my hair. Unbeknownst to Wade, Vanessa's eyelids fluttered open in the middle of their conversation, 
her eyes widening in shock at the conversation unfolding before her. Look at this. He removed his mask, revealing the face of a burn victim, scars marring his features. Would you love this? Vanessa's nearly jumped out of bed as her heart ached. What happened? She wondered in shock. At this point, she understood that Wade was the one who kidnapped her, though she didn't know why. She lay still, feigning sleep with her eyes closed once again, listening to Wade's heartfelt admission and the pain in his voice. Wade turned toward Vanessa, his eyes filled with love and longing, before silently leaving the room. The sound of objects being broken echoed through the safe house as he vented his frustration, leaving Peter and Vanessa alone in the bedroom. And he wonders why I didn't bring him here earlier? Peter muttered in annoyance, his gaze shifted to Vanessa, a knowing look in his eyes. He could see through her pretense, knowing she had been awake all along. After all, he was the one who woke her up to begin with. I know you're awake. He called out to her gently, breaking the silence that lingered in the room. Did you see him? Why yeah? Vanessa swallowed the lump in her throat, her eyes fluttering open. Peter approached the bed, his expression sympathetic. So, what do you have to say? Do you love him or not? Tears welled up in Vanessa's eyes as she contemplated her next move. She couldn't bear to see Wade in pain, but she also couldn't deny her own conflicted emotions. She looked up at Peter, her voice barely a whisper. What? What happened to him? Peter took a deep breath, preparing himself to share the truth. Well, he went on to explain everything that happened to Wade, from the reason that he left her to the weeks of torture and the awakening of his ex-gene. Nothing was left out. So, you two kidnapped me to keep me safe from this Francis guy? She asked incredulously. From her perspective, they could have easily just talked to her and explained the situation. Yeah, well, if you haven't noticed yet, Wade is a bit touchy about his appearance at the moment. He thinks you're going to treat him like the hunchback of Notre Dame, Peter explains. I, I would never. She stutters, looking offended by his assumption. Hmm, I guess we'll see, won't we? Peter says, unsure. After all, she still hasn't said whether she loves him or not, though that could be due to the fact that he left her without a word. Or because she was too shocked to think straight at the moment. Spidey. Wade called out from the living room. Let's just write her a note and leave. The longer we wait, the farther Francis gets. All right, give me a minute to write something. Peter replied and turned back to Vanessa. You have until we're finished dealing with Francis to get your thoughts together. There's enough food and drinks in the kitchen to last you a month. Cable TV on every TV and the Wi-Fi password should be written on the router. Ah, she didn't know what to say. Do not under any circumstances leave this apartment. Understood. Peter warns and receives a nod in return. Good, now pretend to sleep again. He's coming back. Vanessa's eyes widened as she swiftly threw herself back into bed. Seconds later, the sound of footsteps along the hardwood flooring echoed into her ears. What's taking so long? Wade peeked his head inside, seeing his fiancée fast asleep alongside Peter, who sat at the edge of the bed, scribbling a note on the nightstand. I'm just finishing up, Peter says as he finished writing and stood up, passing Wade as he walked out of the room. I'll meet you on the roof. I need to explain some things to the agents outside. Hesitantly staring at the love of his life, Wade couldn't stop himself from walking over and taking a seat at her bedside. His gaze never wavered from Vanessa's face as he traced the contours of her delicate features with his eyes, etching them into his memory. Wade swallowed hard, trying to gather his thoughts before he spoke. I love you, Vanessa. Wade's voice broke the silence, barely above a whisper. I never thought I could find someone like you. He reached out hesitantly, brushing a strand of hair away from Vanessa's face, careful not to disturb her peaceful sleep. But things have changed. I've changed, Wade continued, his voice tinged with sadness. I'm not the man you fell in love with anymore. A faint tremor coursed through Wade's hands as he fought to contain his emotions. He couldn't bear the thought of Vanessa seeing him in his current state, his scarred and disfigured appearance. I can't show myself to you like this, Wade admitted, his voice strained. I want to fix this, to find a way back to being the man you deserve. That's why I'm leaving, again. Vanessa's heart ached as she listened to Wade's words. She longed to reach out and comfort him, to tell him that his appearance didn't matter, that she loved him unconditionally. But on the other hand, she was hurt and heartbroken for weeks after he left without a word. Even now she still felt hurt by what he did. One moment he was there and the next he was gone, leaving her behind in the apartment they shared, where everything reminded her of him. And although she had the full context of the situation now, thanks to Peter, Vanessa wasn't ready to talk to Wade just yet. Everything was happening far too quickly and she needed some time to think before doing or saying anything. So Vanessa remained still, her eyes shut tight, pretending to be asleep. Wade stood up, his shoulders slumped as he let out a long sigh. He leaned down and placed a gentle kiss on Vanessa's forehead, his lips lingering for a moment. Goodbye, Vanessa, Wade whispered, his voice thick with unspoken sorrow. I promise I'll come back to you. I'll fix this. And when I do, I'll be the man you fell in love with again. With one last lingering look at Vanessa, Wade turned away, his footsteps growing fainter as he left the room. Once he was gone, Vanessa's eyes fluttered open, tears welling up, blurring her vision. I love you too, Wade, she whispered into the empty room. New York City Courthouse, 9 a.m. The atmosphere in the courtroom was heavy with anticipation as Scott Lang, 
accompanied by his lawyers Foggy Nelson and Matthew Murdoch, made his way to his seat. Hope Van Dyne, filled with unwavering support and affection for Scott, walked by his side. The tension between Nelson and Murdoch and the prosecutor sent by the district attorney's office was certainly palpable, and only intensified by the presence of numerous lawyers representing Vistacorp, their determination to bury the case evident. What was even more evident was the odd connection that Vistacorp seemed to have with the district attorney's office. As the proceedings began, the judge entered the room, prompting the bailiff to command the attention of everyone present. All rise. The Honorable Judge Judith Scheindlin presiding. You may be seated, she said as she took a seat and banged the gavel a single time. Court is now in session. Vistacorp's head lawyer wasted no time as he rose to his feet. Your Honor, this entire endeavor is a waste of your and the court's time, he argued, citing the lack of new evidence to justify such a step. There is nothing here that warrants re-examining Mr. Lang's case. And I find it odd that they would try doing so. Hearing this, Matt turned to look at the man, as if he could see him with his blind eyes. I find it odd that Vistacorp's entire team of lawyers found the time out of their busy schedules to attend such a small legal matter, he said, bringing attention to their weird interest in Scott's case. The judge turned to Matt. That's enough Mr. Murdoch. We aren't here to throw cryptic quips at one another. Do you have any evidence to present or not? After all, without evidence, they would have no ground to reopen the case. Truthfully, the evidence should have been filed with their motions to reopen the case, but everything was rushed thanks to Peter calling in some favors. The gears of the legal system started turning rapidly as soon as Spider-Man said the word. And since it was rushed, the judge called this meeting, where they would handle everything that would normally lead up to the reopening of a criminal case. Swiftly, Foggy and Matt rose from their seats, producing stacks of documents from their briefcases. Your Honor, we have piles of undeniable evidence of Vistacorp's unethical practices, their exploitation of vulnerable customers, and their complete disregard for the law. The room fell silent as Foggy addressed the court, his voice firm and unwavering. Matt chimed in, his tone assertive yet measured. Let's start with something juicy, shall we? He says as he picks up two documents, handing one over to the bailiff, who then brings it over to the judge. Holding the document in the air for all to see, Matt addresses the court. Your Honor, the document that you're looking at is proof of over 100 different cases of identity theft committed by Vistacorp and its high-level members. Not only did they illegally access customers' personal information, such as credit card details or social security numbers, they used that confidential information for their own financial gain. Wide-eyed, the head lawyer for Vistacorp stood from his seat once again. Your Honor, this dash I'm sorry, is it your turn to speak? The judge asks pointedly. And no, ma'am. He replies quickly. Then why are you talking? She asks as she returns to reading the document. My apologies, Your Honor. It won't happen again. He instantly takes a seat. Thank you, Your Honor. Matt says as he smirks tauntingly in the opposing counsel's direction. Though this isn't the only piece of evidence that we've been able to find while looking into Vistacorp. Fraud, price fixing, false advertisement, product tampering, pyramid schemes, insider trading, unfair debt collection, environmental violations, discrimination, data breaches, unfair contract terms, substandard product safety, exploitive pricing, wage theft. As Matt meticulously listed each and every wrongdoing committed by Vistacorp, which included the branch of customers that Scott had intended to help through his heist, Foggy slapped down document after document, emphasizing that they held all of the proof in their hands. Usually, it would take years and years to build up evidence like this, but thankfully, the Avengers have access to Jarvis and Peter has access to Lily. Hacking into some low-level company and gathering incriminating evidence is light work for the two AIs. Once his partner was finished, Foggy spoke up. This crucial evidence was withheld during Mr. Lang's initial trial. And had it been presented, it would have shed a completely different light on his actions. Instead of the crazed thief, who was only after the money of the company that fired him, our client would have been seen as a modern-day Robin Hood, stealing from dirty criminals and giving back to their victims. Objection, Your Honor. Vistacorp's lawyers reacted swiftly, objecting to the sudden influx of evidence. The leading lawyer stood up, his voice filled with disdain. This evidence is irrelevant and should not be considered. It's nothing but a fabrication. Vistacorp is a pillar of the community and would never partake in such unscrupulous activities. Oh, really? Matt says as he pulls out a folder and walks over to place it on the table in front of him. And as the head lawyer of Vistacorp opened it up, his eyes grew wide as his mouth hung open. What is it? The judge asks as the bailiff walks forward and holds out his hand. Aye it's, the man says as he held the folder tightly in his grasp. Hand it over, the bailiff says, giving the man no way out. Well, he did have one way out. Scrambling past his team, the man sprinted to the door, shocking everyone in the room. Stop him. The judge orders. I'll be holding him in contempt for every step he takes. And with one smooth motion, Matt pulled out his walking cane and threw it like a spear. Flying through the air with pinpoint accuracy, the long stick appeared between the fleeing lawyer's legs, entangling him perfectly. As he came crashing to the floor, the bailiff ran over and detained him alongside a few police officers who were called into the room. Soon enough, the bailiff brought over the file and gave it to the judge. 
Opening it up, the judge frowned as a look of pure disgust appeared on her face. I'll see that he not only loses his bar license but he's thrown in prison for the rest of his life. Foggy stood up once again, his voice dripping with determination. Your honor, as you can see, our evidence is absolutely relevant and reliable. It goes directly to the motive behind Mr. Lang's actions and demonstrates that he was driven by a desire to expose Vistacorp's wrongdoings, as well as the wrongdoing of its high-level members, and provide restitution to its customers. The judge, contemplating the arguments presented, nodded her head. She turned her attention to Scott's lawyers. Mr. Nelson, Mr. Murdoch, you've made a compelling case. Your motion is approved. Please don't forget to submit all of your evidence to the court before the first trial date. Hope, unable to contain her emotions, jumped out of her seat and wrapped her arms around Scott, happy for his victory. Though they still had to have the trial all over again, so this was only a minor battle, which would help them win the war that was coming. Scott awkwardly wrapped his arms around her waist, grateful for the support. This court is now adjourned. The judge calls out as she bangs the gavel one last time. Wait, your honor. You can't just dash another Vistacorp lawyer tries to argue. Did you not hear me? The judge asks as she stands from her seat. Your honor, I heard you but dash he continued to try to argue. Then are you dumb or deaf? She asks angrily. Because I'd like to know the reason when I file to have you held in contempt of court. I am sorry, your honor. While the judge was dealing with the idiotic lawyers on the other side, Scott's side was already on its way out. Although Foggy and Matt weren't the most seasoned lawyers, they knew that it was best to stay on the judge's good side, so they decided to leave as swiftly as possible. They only hoped that the opposing counsel would continue to dig themselves into a deeper and deeper hole. Wow. Scott muttered as the courtroom doors closed behind them. I actually think we can win this. Originally, he was a bit skeptical as he did commit the crimes that they sent him to prison for. Though, after going through that, a newfound confidence filled his entire being. Scott realized that he really had a chance at what Peter promised him. Matt smiled and placed a hand on his shoulder. We won't just win. We'll get your record expunged, get shared custody of your daughter, and take down Vistacorp, he said, full of confidence. I hope you're ready, Scott. Foggy smiled, happy with their first of many victories. Because now is when things get busy. Peter sat on a rooftop, his ghost laptop open in front of him while Wade crowded next to him, impatiently waiting for him to find their runaway bad guy. The wind rustled over their suits, adding an eerie atmosphere to the night. Peter's fingers danced across the keyboard, tapping into various databases, trying to find a trace of Francis after he went into hiding. Wade erratically tapped his up and down, his arms crossed impatiently. Any luck, Spidey? He asked for the 100th time, his voice tinged with irritation. Peter sighed as he could feel Wade breathing down his neck for the past hour. No, Wade. As I've told you countless times already, your arch nemesis knows what he's doing. He covered his tracks well. No digital breadcrumbs to follow so far. And if you want me to find any, then you need to be patient. Wade groaned dramatically. Seriously? This guy knows how to vanish better than my ex-wife. You were never married? Peter scoffed. How do you know that? Wade asked before covering his masked mouth and letting out a high-pitched gasp. Are you stalking me? Of course, Peter read Wade's file, so he knows everything that the government knows about his annoying friend. Yeah, I'm your biggest fan, Peter says sarcastically, trying to work with a loudmouth idiot constantly hovering over his shoulder. Can you give me some space? I need to focus to figure this out. Wade whined. Hey, I'm just trying to add a little spice to this snooze fest. Peter rolled his eyes and turned his attention back to his laptop. Maybe we can find some clues from the surveillance cameras in the area. When Francis left his house, he had to have passed some cameras. There might be footage of the direction he left in or the vehicle he took. With a new plan in mind, Peter got back to work, hacking into the surveillance network that covers the entire city. Isolating the area where Francis lived, he scrolled through the footage, but his hopes quickly faded. The screens displayed nothing but static as if someone had deliberately wiped them clean. Great, just great. Wade exclaimed, throwing his arms up in exasperation. Can't catch a break. Can we? Peter clenched his jaw, his patience wearing thin. He shot a glare at Wade, silencing him momentarily. Seeing Deadpool on the big screen, pissing off everyone around him, certainly hits differently when you're the target of his antics. Determined not to waste any more time, Peter let out a defeated sigh as he reached into his pocket and pulled out his phone, dialing a number. Wade leaned closer, trying to catch a glimpse of the screen. Who are you calling, Spidey? Some hotshot hacker to do your job for you. Peter ignored Wade's taunts as the call connected. Hey, sweetie. It's Dad. I need your help with something for me. Wade raised an eyebrow. Are you calling your daughter? Peter shot him a warning look, his voice carrying a hint of annoyance. Wade, I swear to Morgan Freeman. If you don't shut the hell up, I'm going to throw you off this building. Wade shrugged and leaned against the wall, his hands held up in surrender. Your family, your business? Meanwhile, Peter spoke into the phone, his tone filled with both urgency and affection. Yeah, sorry about that. I need you to hack into the smartphones of everyone near a certain address and help me track someone using the built-in cameras. You're looking for anyone who was around or was recorded at a specific time. 
Hopefully, you'll have better luck than me. Of course, Peter could have done this himself, but it would take far longer since he only has two hands. Lily, on the other hand, can interface the World Wide Web using her mind alone, which allows her to do the work of a thousand Peters at once. Wade scoffed. Oh, great. He's calling his kid for help now? Is she even old enough to use a computer? Should we get her a booster seat so she can reach the keyboard? As if on cue, Wade's complaint triggered Peter's breaking point. That's it, he thought. Without warning, he shot a web at Wade's face, which latched onto his mask. And with a simple tug, Peter forcefully threw him off the roof. Aya! Damn you! Wade's screams quickly faded into the distance as he landed with a loud thud in a nearby dumpster. When Wade finally climbed his way back up to the rooftop, covered in dumpster juices that stunk up his surroundings, Peter stood there casually waiting for him, his arms crossed. All right, Wade, Peter said, his voice tinged with satisfaction. My precious little genius found him. Or at least his last known location. After using smartphone camera footage from anyone in the area to follow Francis and the car that he stole, Lily was able to use the city surveillance system and stoplight cameras to follow his path throughout the city, leading all the way to an abandoned dock. And to add a bit more certainty to it, the entire area just so happens to be a dead zone for traffic and cameras. One of the very few in the entirety of New York City, to be exact. Wade wiped off the dirt and grime, his expression a mix of annoyance and admiration. Then that dumpster dive was totally worth it. Now, lead the way, Spidey. Waving his hand and summoning a golden portal, Peter stepped back and motioned toward it. Ladies first, suck my balls? Wade countered as he paced past Peter and stepped through. Atop a tall crane on an abandoned dock, Wade and Peter stepped out of a shining portal, glancing below at a huge rundown freight ship, which looked to be in the process of being remodeled into a secret base. And surrounding the makeshift base was a fenced-in perimeter, crawling with heavily armed guards in blacked-out tactical gear. Hey, Spidey, think you can handle a superhero landing? Wade's voice echoed through the night air, filled with mischievousness. Peter rolled his eyes beneath his mask. Wade, we're trying to be stealthy here. No unnecessary attention, remember? Although it wasn't likely, Peter didn't want to give Francis the opportunity to run again. Besides, you don't have what it takes to dash Peter spoke tauntingly, but it was too late. Wade leaped off of the crane as if he were an Olympic diver. Superhero landing. He shouted as he soared through the air, limbs flailing, and crashed onto the ground at the center of the fenced-in area. Peter couldn't help but wince as he saw and heard Wade's ankles snap upon impact. His feet turned to a sickening angle as the red and black-clad idiot fell to the ground in pain. Motherschmucker. The guards, who were on high alert, immediately turned their attention to the loud spectacle as men in towers shined bright spotlights onto his downed form. Nice going, Wade, Peter muttered to himself, shaking his head. Ignoring the pain, Wade managed to prop himself up on his elbows, a grin spreading across his masked face. Tada! See? Perfect superhero landing, he exclaimed triumphantly. With a sigh, Peter gracefully descended from the crane, landing silently beside Wade. His landing was nothing short of perfection, a testament to his years of training and experience. That's a superhero landing. Feel free to take notes. He shot Wade a knowing look before turning to the guards. The armed men, their weapons pointed directly at Peter, hesitated. Whispers swept through their ranks, fear evident in their eyes. They recognized the iconic red and blue costume, a symbol of dread that struck terror into the hearts of all criminals across the world. Spider-Man. One guard muttered, his voice trembling. What's he doing here? Another guard, his voice more confident, stepped forward. Doesn't matter who he is. Shoot him. But before they could react, Peter's agility took over. He darted forward, webs shooting from his wrists, disarming the guards with expert precision. His movements were fluid, almost dance-like, as he incapacitated them one by one, leaving no chance for a single bullet to be fired. Not even the alarm was raised. Meanwhile, Wade was busy snapping his ankles back into place, his healing factor working its magic. Within seconds, he stood tall once again, brushing off the mishap as if it never happened. All right, time to finish this the hell up, Wade declared, cracking his knuckles as he turned to the author. Cue the music. Optical Disc Gangnam Style by PSY plays Optical Disc. Open Gangnam Style, Gangnam Style, Na Jai Nun Da Surround Ingen Jagin Yoja Coffee, Hanja Eni Yo U R U L Anun Pum Kyo Kin Nun, Yoja Bami O Myun Sim Jang Yi Dugo O Jinan Yoja Kuran Banjunit Nin Yoja. Seriously? Wade asked as Peter continued to demolish the guards in the background. Suddenly the music stops as Wade could hear the sound of a button being pressed before another song filled his ears. Optical Disc Kung Fu Fighting by Carl Douglas plays Optical Disc O O O O O O Everybody is Kung Fu Fighting. That's more like it. Peter and Wade moved swiftly, their synchronized movements showing just how great of a duo they truly are. With fluid precision, they took down the last of the guards stationed outside the beached freight ship, ensuring that their assault remained undetected. However, their success was short-lived as the shrill blare of an alarm pierced the air, echoing through the desolate dockyard. Peter shot a glare at Wade, frustration evident in his voice. Seriously, Wade? 
We were supposed to be stealthy. If Wade didn't jump in earlier, Peter would have opened a portal to the top deck of the ship, sneaking them inside with ease. They would have found Francis by now. Wade nonchalantly shrugged, his masked face splitting into a mischievous grin. Well, Spidey, my way is a lot more fun. Besides, who needs stealth when you've got these bad boys? He brandished his gleaming desert eagles and promptly opened fire on the fresh wave of guards rushing out of the ship. As bullets flew, blood spilled, and bodies fell, Peter couldn't help but shake his head. He knew he couldn't argue with Wade's words. This was indeed more fun than sneaking in. Together, they fought their way into the belly of the ship, leaving a trail of death in their wake. After all, Deadpool wasn't the type of hero to spare his enemies, which Peter respected. It's not like these guys are innocent. Peter shrugged as Wade shot a guy in the neck, blowing his head off of his shoulders. Damn, those .50 cal rounds pack a punch? Their relentless progress led them to the ship's rooftop, where only two people awaited them. Standing there were Francis, the enigmatic leader of the latest Weapon X program, and his formidable subordinate, Angel Dust, a muscle-bound woman with short hair that matched her black clothes. Both of these metahumans, who were exceptionally confident in taking care of these intruders only a moment ago, practically recoiled in shock and fear at the sight of Peter's familiar red and blue spider-themed suit. Spider-Man. Francis muttered, his voice laced with disbelief. This isn't good. He would have gladly left already if he knew that it was Spider-Man who was behind the assault on his base. But no, Francis wanted to see who was after him, confident in his and Angel Dust's metahuman capabilities. Hey, Francis. I've heard a lot about you. Peters waved in their direction, a relaxed air radiating from him. Nice trick with your house, by the way. It was smart to use your security system as a trigger to blow it sky high. You're actually one of the more crafty criminals I've dealt with on this planet. Thanks. Francis answered, trying to figure out a way out of this. There was a car parked around the back and a helicopter behind him, but he knew that Spider-Man wouldn't allow him to get to either of them. All roads seemed to lead in one direction, a fight. And winning was his only option. Because any metahuman to ever be caught by the Avengers has disappeared completely, never to be seen again. This is one of the main factors that strikes fear in all superpowered criminals, as they can at least look forward to a possible escape when dealing with the criminal justice system. But when it comes to the Avengers, there's no trial, no jail, no prison. You just disappear. Of course, this would lead anyone to wonder whether the Avengers were killing off superpowered criminals, but that obviously wasn't the case. They simply rot in the tower's detainment floors. Meanwhile, Wade stood by Peter's side, his mask concealing a wicked smirk. Francis squinted, unsure which Avenger was stood next to Spider-Man and who might your friend be. Francis inquired, hoping to stall for some time to think. Without missing a beat, Wade removed his mask, revealing his scarred and disfigured face, a taunting smirk plastered all over it. Yup. Francis cringed at the sight of him, a mixture of surprise and disgust coloring his voice before, finally, realization struck. Wait. Wade? Is that you? Oh, Francis, my dear old friend. It's so good of you to remember me. Wade's eyes gleamed with a blend of amusement and menace. The guy whose face you ruined when you decided to play mad scientist? Tension hung in the air, thick with the weight of unfinished business and personal vendettas. Hey, mate. I'm guessing our last little experiment was a success. Francis greeted him tauntingly. But do you mind putting the mask back on? Your face is just so, ugh, you know? Seeing his nemesis wince at the sight of him, Wade kept his mask off out of pure spite. Nope, if I have to live with this ugly mug, then you have to live with it too. Wade sneered. Now, I'm going to tell you what the hell's about to happen. First, I'm going to kick the shit out of you, and second, you're going to help me fix this. He points to his face, forcing Francis to look at him. And maybe when you're done with my makeover, I'll let you go, after torturing you for a few weeks, of course, Wade said, a bloodthirsty smirk on his face. After all, it ain't revenge if you don't go through the same messed up shit that you put me through. Francis scowled but remained defiant. You think you can fight me? You're nothing but a lab rat, a barely passable experiment. Seeing how badly Wade wanted to fight him, Francis decided to lean into it. Because he would much rather fight Wade than Spider-Man. And maybe, through his fight with Wade, Francis could find a way out of this situation. Handing his desert eagles to Peter, who was standing beside him, Wade flashed a wicked grin. Don't worry, Spidey, I got this. It's personal. He stepped forward, motioning for Francis to come at him. Peter, understanding Wade's need for vengeance, moved to the side, giving the two adversaries space. He watched with a mix of amusement and anticipation, ready to intervene at any moment if necessary. Agreeing to the one-on-one -on -one fight, Francis pulled out two steel fighting axes, whirling them expertly in his hands. His eyes gleamed with a dangerous resolve. Realizing Wade was weaponless, Peter raised his hand and conjured a pair of Deadpool-style swords, the iconic katanas. Here. He tossed them to Wade, who deftly caught them with a flourish of his own. Both Francis and Angel Dust watched the katanas appear in shock, wondering how Peter did that. All right, let's get this dash as Wade was ready to go, focusing his gaze on Francis, Angel Dust began walking toward Peter. Her intense gaze burned with an unspoken challenge. Peter raised a hand, attempting to defuse the situation. 
Hey, let's not fight, okay? Let Wade and your boss settle this. But Angel Dust disregarded his words, her muscles tense and ready for combat. He didn't know what was going through her mind, but he did know one thing. She wanted to fight. Sorry about her. Francis spoke up in her stead. She's a bit of a battle junkie. As he spoke, Angel Dust threw a powerful punch in Peter's direction, charged with superhuman strength. Peter's reflexes kicked into gear, and he effortlessly caught her fist midair, shocking bother her and Francis, who knew exactly how strong those punches really were. Any normal person would have been instantly crushed under the force of her fist, but Peter was far from ordinary. Remember when you wake up that it was you who started it? Peter said as he swiftly backhanded her across the face, sending her flying backward. She crashed into the parked helicopter, knocking it over as she fell unconscious from a single hit. Wade, witnessing the exchange, couldn't help but speak up. Well, that was anticlimactic. Francis couldn't help but nod in agreement, his gaze lingering on the broken helicopter, which he couldn't use to escape anymore. What can I say? I've had some practice. Peter shrugged nonchalantly, settling back into a relaxed position. Now, why don't you two settle your little vendetta so we can all be done with this? I promised my daughter that I'd be back by morning and it's almost sunrise. Spider-Man has a kid? Francis was shocked. That type of information would sell for a lot. Though he didn't have much time to dwell on it, as Wade crept closer and closer, katanas gripped tightly in each hand. With Angel Dust neutralized and Peter on the sidelines, all attention returned to the imminent clash between Wade and Francis. The tension between the two grew thicker, anticipation hung in the air, and the stage was set for a battle that would certainly be entertaining. The deck of the ship was drenched in an eerie silence as Wade stood face to face with his arch nemesis, Francis. Their eyes locked in a deadly dance of hatred and determination. The stench of blood and violence lingered in the air, a reminder of the carnage that had unfolded on their way up to the deck. Francis looked at Wade in curiosity. So, besides the ugly makeover, what else did you unlock in that chamber? He asked. Wade grinned sadistically. Want to know my powers, huh? Why don't you come and find out? I promise you'll enjoy the experience. I'll even shave the pubes off that bald head of yours, he taunted, whirling his razor-sharp blades in each hand. Francis chuckled, a sinister gleam in his eyes. Ah, Wade, how I've missed our time together. Too bad it's about to end. He replied, his voice laced with a sadistic edge. But don't worry, I'll make sure to pay a visit to that whore of yours once we're done here. What was her name again? Eh, it doesn't matter, does it? I'm sure I'll learn it after a little playtime with her before, you know. In an instant, Wade's anger flared to a dangerous level. Without a word, he lunged forward, his katana slashing through the air with deadly precision. But before his blades could reach Francis, two steel axes appeared, expertly deflecting the blow and sweeping toward Wade's exposed arm. Ugh. Wade grunted as an axe dug into his arm. Bastard. He yelled, tugging his arm back, dislodging the axe. Watching the blood spill from Wade's arm before his injury began to close, disappearing in a matter of seconds, Francis' eyes widened in realization. Healing, huh? Aren't you a lucky little lab rat? Some curses come with a blessing? Wade said, his deformed face still exposed. Without another word, both sides rushed forward. In a whirlwind of movement, Wade and Francis displayed incredible skill and precision. They dodged, parried, and counterattacked with deadly grace, their weapons singing through the air with each strike. Meanwhile, Peter watched from a distance, conjuring a comfortable seat for himself and a bag of tacos. He munched on the spicy snack, his eyes fixated on the combatants like a spectator at a thrilling UFC fight. I need something to drink, he thought as a can of ice-cold Coca-Cola appeared in his hand. Yeah, that's the stuff. Back to the fight, Wade lunged forward, his blade slashing through the air with deadly precision. However, Francis swiftly sidestepped, narrowly evading the lethal strike. Retaliating, he swung his axes in a fluid motion, aiming at his opponent's exposed shoulder. Of course, Wade learned his lesson after the first injury. Deftly twisting his body, he evaded the oncoming axes with graceful agility, leaping and spinning into the air as he swung down at his enemy. And in return for the axe to his arm, Wade's blades managed to rake their way across Francis' face, disfiguring his skin with two long bleeding cuts. Exclamation point. Francis quickly retreated a few steps, wiping the blood that fell into his eyes. Thankfully, his pain receptors were fried long ago, allowing him to fight on without any problems whatsoever. Looking sexy, Franny. Wade comments as he flicks the blood off his blades. Red is definitely your color. A scowl marred Francis' bleeding face as the fight escalated and blows were exchanged in rapid succession. Wade spun on his heel, executing a series of intricate slashes aimed at Francis' torso. Though his opponent's reflexes proved equal to the task as Francis twisted and turned, parrying each strike with his axes, the sharp clang of metal resounding through the night. Soon enough, Francis seized an opportunity and lunged forward, attempting to deliver a devastating strike to Wade's midsection. But Wade, ever resourceful, twisted his body in a nimble maneuver, narrowly avoiding the brunt of the blow. And as he did, he retaliated with a swift kick, catching Francis off guard and sending him stumbling backward quickly regaining his footing, a determined glint in his eyes. 
Francis launched himself at Wade, axes whirling through the air with deadly accuracy. But Wade reacted with lightning-fast reflexes, his katanas acting as an impenetrable wall against the onslaught. The constant clash of steel echoed across the deck, each strike met with an equal measure of skillful defense from both sides. As the battle raged on, the combatants traded blow after blow in a frenzied dance of violence. Blood stained the steel of their weapons as well as each of their bodies as the fight grew increasingly intense. Though only Wade remained unharmed, his healing factor saving him from any and all injuries. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Francis breathed heavily as blood continued to leak from his body. Although he has the upper hand when it comes to strength, as time went on, Francis started to slow down from both loss of blood and exhaustion. Of course, Wade was getting tired as well, but certainly not to the same degree as his opponent. And after a moment of stillness between the two, Wade's sword sliced through the air once again, aiming for vulnerable spots, while Francis' axes swung with unyielding force, seeking to overpower his opponent. Both fighters showed varying signs of weariness, their movements slightly slower, their breathing labored. But their determination remained unwavering. Wade, with a surge of adrenaline, launched himself forward, his katanas whirling in a deadly arc. And Francis responded in kind, axes spinning in a last-ditch effort to subdue his foe. The clash of steel intensified, sparks flying with each meeting of blade and axe. Their movements became a blur of motion, each combatant striving to gain the upper hand. Sweat mingled with blood, coating their bodies as the battle waged on. Until finally, the fight reached its peak, each warrior pushing themselves to the limit. Their strikes became wild, and desperate, as fatigue threatened to overtake them. Especially Francis. In a final display of ferocity, both Wade and Francis lunged at each other, weapons colliding with a resounding clash. For a moment, the world stood still as they locked eyes, the weight of their rivalry heavy in the air. And in this exchange, Wade's relentless assault managed to knock the axes out of Francis' hands, forcing him into a defensive position. Francis, now unarmed, ducked, dived, and dodged, evading Wade's relentless onslaught of killing blows. However, Wade's persistence paid off as he managed to slice open his opponent's kneecaps. Francis' eyes widened as he collapsed to the floor, unable to hold his body's weight anymore. And as he fell, Wade was quick to trap him on his back, his katana blades forming a scissor-like formation just a hair's thickness away from his exposed neck. Looking down at his most hated nemesis, his voice seething with rage, Wade ordered, You made me like this, Francis. And now you're gonna fix it. His hideous face was a foot away from his opponent's. Out of nowhere, Francis burst into laughter, the sound echoing through the empty deck. Fix you? Oh, Wade, my dear guinea pig, you must be delusional, he mocked, his eyes filled with malevolence. No one can remove a metahuman's mutation. It's permanent. You'll look like an old man sag nut sack for the rest of your life. Shock registered on Wade's scarred face. His hopes shattered in an instant. Francis continued to laugh, savoring Wade's despair. If you want to be pretty again, then I suggest you pay a visit to a plastic surgeon. That's the best you're ever going to get, he taunted, his words laced with sadistic glee. As began to realization sink in, Wade's grip on his katanas tightened. A mixture of rage and acceptance burned in his eyes unable to control himself, Wade pushed all of his weight down on bother swords, decapitating Francis in an instant. Slice, the swords descended with a sickening sound as blood sprayed out, sending his severed head rolling. Well, that went as I expected. Peter muttered as his chair and snacks disappeared. You alright? He asked as he walked over. Standing behind Wade, Peter got a good look at Francis' motionless body as well as his severed head, which was still smiling up at Wade, as if he had somehow won in the end. That's not creepy at all. Peter commented as he waved his hand and portaled Angel Dust to a cell back at the tower. I'll have someone from S.H.I.E.L.D. deal with her later. Once she was gone, Peter placed a hand on Wade's shoulder, breaking him from his dejected state. Come on, let's go and get something to eat. I heard there's a good Mexican place nearby. Do they have chimichangas? He asked, like a sad child. Wade had no idea what to do anymore. All of his hopes were set on Francis, but now he was left with nothing. Sure. Peter nodded. And we'll even get some ice cream on the way home, okay? Picking himself up off the floor, Wade sullenly followed after Peter, leaving the ship full of dead bodies behind. Peter and Wade sat in an empty Mexican restaurant a few blocks away from where Francis just died, the remnants of their battle still lingering in their minds. Peter munched on a taco, the enchantment on his suit allowing him to eat with his mask on. Wade, on the other hand, had his mask pulled up, still covering his nose and eyes, as he devoured his fifth order of chimichangas, eating to fill the void in himself. The pain of his disfigured appearance weighed heavy on his mind, believing that he could never be with his beloved fiancé ever again. As they sat in the booth, Peter listened attentively as Wade whined about all of his woes. What am I supposed to say, Munch, she'll never love me like his, Chomp, how the hell am I supposed to live like this? Wade went on and on, constantly stuffing his face the entire time. Meanwhile, the restaurant staff couldn't help but stare in awe and disbelief at the sight of Spider-Man, the world's most popular hero, casually dining in their humble establishment. Some took discreet pictures and videos, not wanting to disturb the heroes in their private moments. 
though they were quick to post them online, sharing one of the greatest encounters in their entire lives. After all, who can say that they cooked for the most famous person in the world? Look, Wade, Peter said earnestly, trying to console his friend. I understand that you're afraid of how Vanessa will react, but if she truly loves you, then she'll be able to see past it. Beauty isn't just about physical looks. It's about the person you are inside, the connection you share. You need to talk to her, let her know what happened. Give her a chance, Wade sighed, his stuffed mouth muffling his voice. Fine. I don't have a plan B. I don't have a way to be the man she fell in love with, so I should just give up and let her decide. Although Wade didn't have a plan B, that didn't mean that there wasn't a plan B set up for him. Peter could think of at least three spells that could help Wade just off the top of his head, whether it be through body morphing, beautification, or simple illusions. But he wouldn't be doing any of that just yet. In Peter's humble opinion, if Vanessa is so superficial that she would ditch the man she was about to marry because of his appearance, then she wasn't worth Wade's time to begin with. He'll gladly reveal that he can help with Wade's little problem as soon as he and his fiancé figure themselves out. If they end up together again, then it won't be because Wade is handsome. And if they don't, then maybe that's for the best. Peter nodded his head. Good, life is unpredictable. Sometimes things don't go according to our expectations, so we have to dive in and see for ourselves, after a moment of contemplation, Wade nodded slowly. You're right. I can't hide forever. And if that beautiful succubus of mine is as crazy as I remember, then she'll love me. I think. Congratulations, Wade. Peter smiled, proud of Wade's decision. You're not acting like a sissy anymore. Feeling a renewed sense of determination, Wade pushed his pile of empty plates aside, sucked down the last of his soda, let out a loud belch, and stood up from the booth. The restaurant staff watched with wide eyes as Spider-Man and some unknown hero prepared to leave. Some mustered the courage to approach them for autographs, surprising Wade, whose ego boosted through the roof in an instant. Though when it came time to sign his name, Wade froze, unsure of what to put down as he hasn't chosen a hero's name yet. Ultimately, he ended up writing a quick squiggle, which no one would be able to decipher no matter how hard they tried. And once the autographs were signed, the two were on their way, leaving behind a happy group of employees. Though they wouldn't be happy for long. Seconds after Peter and Wade left, the street outside the restaurant was swarmed with cars and pedestrians who came running down the block at full speed, hoping to get a glimpse of Spider-Man and the never-before-seen hero beside him. And as chaos descended upon their small restaurant, they all regretted posting the pictures and videos of Spider-Man, wishing that they'd kept them to themselves. At least until after work. Safe house. Tired of waiting for Wade, who stood frozen at the front door, Peter grew impatient and opened the door, pushing him inside the penthouse. The shield guards outside the door watched the whole exchange with interest, wondering what was going on. Though they wouldn't ask. After all, anything involving an Avenger was way above their pay grade. Inside, the sun was rising on the horizon, casting a warm glow over the room as they entered. The aroma of breakfast cooking in the kitchen filled the air. Wade and Vanessa locked eyes for a moment, their gazes filled with a mixture of longing and uncertainty. She instinctively knew that now was the time to come to a decision. Francis was most likely dead and now it was time for Wade to reveal himself as Peter said. Finally, Wade mustered the courage to speak. Hey, Ness, he began, his voice filled with a mix of nerves and affection. I? I need to tell you something. Recognizing the voice behind the mask, Vanessa's anger simmered beneath the surface as she walked over to Wade, delivering a swift punch to his face. She wouldn't be pretending to sleep this time around. Now was the time for action. I totally deserve that. Wade shook his head and turned back to her, a faint smile hidden under his mask. Though she knew him well enough to know that he was smiling right now. Unfazed, Vanessa landed another punch, this time harder than before. Wade nodded in acknowledgement, his resilience evident as he easily shrugged off the blow. Okay, that too, he admitted, rubbing his jaw. With frustration mounting, Vanessa raised her knee, aiming to strike him where it hurt the most. But Wade reacted swiftly, catching her leg just before impact. Maybe not that, Wade interjected, a hint of amusement in his voice. He was not about to let his family jewels suffer any harm. Meanwhile, Peter leaned against the wall and watched in both interest and concern. He didn't know whether Vanessa would take him back, but he hoped for the best for Wade. Start talking. Vanessa glared at him, her voice laced with impatience and concern. Wade took a deep breath, bracing himself to explain the unexplainable. I'm so sorry for leaving and taking so long to come back. It's been a rough few weeks, he began, his voice filled with remorse. As Vanessa listened to his words, her anger softened slightly, understanding the ordeal Wade had endured, thanks to Peter's explanation after her kidnapping. Wade went on to explain that he had wanted to reveal himself sooner but the man behind the mask he currently wore wasn't the same anymore. Vanessa, already aware of the situation, reached up and grasped the edges of Wade's mask, surprising him as she pulled it off to reveal a picture of Chris Pratt duct tape to his face. Who is this? Vanessa asked, curious and puzzled. Wade chuckled softly. That's who I'd want to play me in my superhero movie if Ryan Reynolds was busy or dead. God forbid, he added, making a religious cross motion. 
After the playful exchange, Vanessa unceremoniously ripped the piece of paper off Wade's face, fully exposing his disfigurement. Wade winced in pain as the duct tape was abruptly removed. Careful! That's my money maker? Not anymore, Vanessa comments as she takes in his appearance. A moment of silence hung in the air as the two lovers stared at each other, Wade anxiously trying to discern Vanessa's response. A slight frown crossed her face, causing Wade's heart to sink as he started rambling. Look, if you don't like it, we can try some masks or I can find a good plastic surgeon. It can be fixed, I promise. Just dash, but before he could finish, Vanessa reached up, cupping his face tenderly between her hands. Her eyes sparkled with love and acceptance. It's certainly not the prettiest, Vanessa began, her voice filled with sincerity, but it's still a face I'd be more than happy to sit on. Wade's eyes widened, a mischievous grin spreading across his face. Well, I'm not the same down there either, he motioned toward his nether regions with a playful gaze, I've got a super penis. He paused, waggling his eyebrows. The healing factor keeps me going and going. Vanessa's curiosity was piqued, and a mischievous glint appeared in her eyes. Is that so, she teased. Without missing a beat, Wade wrapped his arms around her, pulling her into his chest. Maybe I should go? Peter thought as the two started making out right in front of him as if he weren't there. Yeah, I just remembered that I have to get home dash as he spoke, both Wade and Vanessa reached over and grabbed random stuff from the kitchen counter, hurling it at him as if to say what are you still doing here? Of course, their lips didn't separate the entire time. And they weren't even looking in his direction. After nearly getting hot in the head with a few plates and a toaster, Peter swiftly made his way to the door. And as he left, the sounds of destruction inside the apartment grew louder and louder. Is everything okay, sir? One of the guards asked as he stepped out. Sighing in exasperation, Peter nodded his head. Yeah, just kick them out once the noises stop and send an invoice for any damages to Tony. He ordered as he walked off. Why yes, sir, hours later, the once pristine and perfect penthouse apartment was completely destroyed. The air was thick with the scent of cigarette smoke and lingering sexual tension, as if the room itself held the memories of everything it just endured. The walls, once adorned with elegant artwork and photographs, now bore the scars of fierce battles, with gouges and deep cracks marring their once pristine surfaces. Shattered glass from broken windows littered the floor, glinting ominously in the dim light that filtered through the tattered curtains. Furniture, once stylish and meticulously arranged, now lay overturned and broken. The remnants of a shattered coffee table were scattered across the room, mingling with torn upholstery and broken wooden frames. The once plush carpeting was stained with splotches of liquor, wine, blood, and all sorts of unknown bodily fluids, evidence of what looked like a fierce confrontation that could have taken place. In the midst of the wreckage, surrounded by shards of random household objects, Wade and Vanessa lay naked, nestled on top a pile of ripped couch cushions, pillows, and stained blankets. Both of them had blissful smiles plastered all over their faces. I love you. Vanessa admitted as she drifted off to sleep, her head lying on his chest. Wade froze for a moment before lovingly brushing the hair off of her forehead. I love you too. Wade, wearing normal clothes with his disfigured face uncovered for all to see, stood outside the luxurious penthouse, staring at the line of guards in front of him. The deafening silence that followed their passionate reunion was abruptly shattered by the authoritative voices of the S.H.I.E.L.D. security team. Just as Peter ordered, they rushed in as soon as the sounds of moaning and destruction came to an end, waking the couple from their sleep and throwing them out in the middle of the night. And as they stood outside with nothing but their clothes on their backs, Wade's phone buzzed with a new text message question mark. Pulling out his phone, he couldn't help but feel aggrieved. Spidey, your ban from expensive safe houses now includes Vanessa. Go home or find a motel. I'll call later. Love, the skeet shooter face blowing a kiss Wade glanced at his fiancée, Vanessa, her eyes filled with a mixture of amusement and embarrassment as she peeked over and read the text. The penthouse, once a pristine haven, now lay in ruins, a monument of their reckless lovemaking. Shield agents stood across from them, their stern expressions betraying their annoyance at the couple's antics. After all, they were forced to listen to this couple's activities from morning to night. Come on, babe, Vanessa said, a mischievous glint in her eyes. We should probably leave before they start charging us for property damage. Wade smirked, wrapping his arm around her waist as they walked off, unashamed. Their journey back to Wade's former apartment was filled with laughter and stolen kisses, as they reminisced about their time together before he disappeared. Entering the dimly lit apartment, Wade's eyes fell on the remnants of their life together, a collection of dusty memories scattered across the room. He couldn't help but feel a pang of nostalgia. Vanessa, sensing his emotions, wrapped her arms around him, her voice filled with warmth. We'll make new memories. She whispered. Wade smiled, his fingers gently tracing the curves of her face. As they settled into a comfortable routine, Vanessa perched herself on the couch, idly scrolling through baby names on her phone while Wade occupied himself in the kitchen. Hey, how about Richard? Vanessa called out, her voice floating from the living room. As soon as they settled into the apartment again, the idea of having a baby was thrown around and both sides seemed interested at the very least. Wade chuckled, expertly arranging frozen dinosaur-shaped chicken nuggets onto a baking tray. Richard? Really? 
I mean, we could call him Harry Richard Wilson. He replied, his voice dripping with sarcasm. Harry Dick Wilson. Vanessa giggled, her laughter infectious. Though, the sound was abruptly cut short as a wave of unease washed over Wade. He froze, his senses on high alert, as he detected the faint sound of multiple footsteps approaching their door. Vanessa, get down. Wade ordered, his voice tinged with urgency, as he retrieved a long kitchen knife from the drawer. Without hesitation, Vanessa leaped over the couch, disappearing from sight, hiding herself on the floor. Wade tightened his grip on the knife as he creeped over to the side of the door. The familiar adrenaline rush of battle coursed through his veins. And then, without warning, the door exploded inward, shards of wood and debris flying through the air. Standing in the doorway was a team of heavily armed Russian gangsters, their menacing presence filling the room. Wade's eyes narrowed, his determination etched onto his scarred features. He gripped his gleaming kitchen knife tightly in his scarred hand, his senses on high alert. Five burly figures, covered in tattoos, had barged in uninvited. They were armed to the teeth with an assortment of weapons, prepared for a battle against a man of Wade's caliber. Vanessa lay behind the worn-out couch, her wide eyes filled with fear. She held her breath, praying for Wade's safety. The tension in the room was palpable as the armed assailants stepped inside one by one. Wade's face split into a manic grin as he twirled the knife in his hand. Please take off your shoes. This is an Asian household, he said, revealing himself as he appeared in front of them. With lightning speed, Wade lunged forward, slashing his knife at the leading gunman's wrists, causing him to drop his shotgun. Seeing their target, the gangsters quickly spread out and opened fire, attempting to encircle him. But Wade was a whirlwind of death and chaos. He darted between them, his movements fluid and unpredictable. You're tracking dirt into our love nest. How rude. Deadpool quipped as he stabbed an assailant in the eye, causing him to drop to the floor with a blood-curdling scream, cradling his bloody eye socket. The other gangsters reacted quickly, their eyes filled with rage. They continued to unleash a barrage of gunfire, bullets tearing through the apartment, leaving holes in the walls and furniture. But Deadpool's agility was insane compared to theirs. He twisted and contorted his body, narrowly evading every projectile. Dodging another spray of bullets, Wade vaulted onto a nearby countertop, using it as a springboard. He somersaulted through the air, landing behind one of the gangsters. And with a swift, precise motion, he thrust his knife into the man's heart. Oops, did I ruin your favorite jacket? Deadpool remarked, a maniacal chuckle escaping his lips. Seeing this, two gangsters charged at him simultaneously, hoping to hold him down and finish him off for good. Luckily, Wade saw this coming from a mile away and parried them off, his knife slicing through the air. He delivered a swift kick to one of them, sending him crashing into a bookshelf, while his knife found its mark in the throat of the other. The room descended into chaos as the remaining gangster tried to make a hasty retreat. But Deadpool was relentless. He pursued him, leaping over furniture and debris, closing the distance between them. Running away? I thought we were just getting to know each other. Deadpool taunted, his voice echoing through the apartment. With a savage swipe, Wade expertly threw the knife into the final gangster's leg, stopping him in his tracks. The man screamed as he fell to the floor, writhing in pain. Wade loomed over him as he pulled the knife from his leg and held it teasingly above his head. Oh! It's slipping, he jokingly gasped as the knife fell from his fingers. The pointy end descended, cutting through the air before embedding itself into the last intruder's open mouth, ending his life soon after. The room fell into an eerie silence, broken only by Vanessa's shallow breaths and the normal chaos of the city outside. Wade stood amidst the carnage, his body covered in blood, victorious. Looks like date night just got a little more exciting, babe, he quipped, his voice tinged with dark humor as he turned to his fiancée. Vanessa slowly stood from her hiding place behind the bullet-riddled couch, her heart pounding in her chest. She takes in the sight of the lifeless Russian gangsters sprawled across the apartment, their blood staining more than just the carpet. Relief washed over her as she realized that Wade managed to protect them both. Wade's eyes widened as he watched Vanessa emerge unharmed. A wave of pure relief flooded through him, but before he could fully process the situation, a chilling sound echoed in his ears, the distinct click of a gun being cocked. Instinctively, his body whirls around, his mind racing to assess the new threat. Standing in the doorway, an unnoticed figure comes into view. Another gangster, an unexpected reinforcement who must have been waiting outside for one reason or another. The intruder's cold eyes were fixed on Wade and Vanessa, his finger tightening on the trigger of his pistol. Without a moment to spare, Wade acted on pure instinct. He twisted his body and hurled the bloodstained kitchen knife he had used earlier toward the new arrival. However, the unexpected movement from the Wade caused the assailant's aim to shift away from Wade and towards Vanessa, who stood there defenseless. Fear gripped Wade's heart as time seemed to slow down. He watched in horror as the trigger was pulled, anticipating the tragic outcome. But just when all hope seemed lost, a sudden blur of red and blue appeared. A gloved hand, vibrant in very familiar colors, wrapped effortlessly around the barrel of the assailant's gun, morphing the metal under its grip. In an instant, the bullet inside was constricted and stopped in its tracks. And before the stunned assailant could react, the knife that Wade had hurled earlier found its mark, embedding itself deep into his chest. 
With a grunt of shock and pain, the man crumpled to the floor, slowly choking on his own blood. Heaving a sigh of relief, Wade's gaze turned toward the source of their salvation. And right on cue, everyone's friendly neighborhood Spider-Man stepped into view, revealing himself. Yo. Vanessa stood in the wreckage of their apartment, still shaken from the recent attack. Wade let out a sigh as he rushed over and pulled her into his chest, snaking his arms tightly around her waist. He was just happy that she was alive. For a second there, he knew that she was going to die, but that feeling suddenly disappeared as soon as Peter arrived. Speaking of Peter. The sound of footsteps walking all over the apartment could be heard, accompanied by the sounds of his phone taking pictures of every dead assailant's face. Spidey, Wade called, refusing to release his fiancée. You came at the perfect time? That's what she said. Peter smirked under his mask as he turned to his phone. Jarvis, find everything you can about these guys. I have a friend who's going to want to pay their boss a visit. Yes, sir. A voice replied loud enough for Wade and Vanessa to hear. Thank you, Spider-Man. Vanessa spoke, knowing that she wouldn't be alive right now without him. Peter raised an eyebrow and shrugged. Ah, it was nothing. I just happened to be passing by. He replied. But I'm glad I could help. Are you okay? Vanessa leaned into her fiancé, her voice trembling slightly. Yeah, I am now. She said, calming down quickly. Peter nodded. Well, I'm glad I got here in time. Of course, Peter wasn't just passing by. He watched Deadpool 2 and knew that Vanessa was due to die sooner or later, so he sneakily placed a few spells to alert him of any danger. And the second his spells went off, Peter rushed over to save the day as usual. This isn't a movie. He thought as he swore to do all he could to make sure that Wade doesn't lose the love of his life. As the adrenaline began to fade away, Peter's curiosity took hold. So, any idea on who these guys are? He asked, gesturing towards the lifeless bodies of the gunmen. They don't seem like your average run-of-the-mill burglars. Vanessa turned to Wade, knowing that nothing she's done in her entire life could have angered men with this much firepower. They had to be after him. After all, Wade was a prolific mercenary before meeting her, making it almost certain that one of his jobs angered the wrong person. Wade scratched his head, thinking back on his past exploits. I've made a lot of enemies in my line of work. He mused as if he were reliving happy memories. But given their firepower, tattoos, and accents, my guess is they're connected to the Russian mob. I'll have to start there. Okay, we'll see what Jarvis has to say first. Peter says as he pulls up a chair and takes a seat. Wade turned to face Peter, an idea formed in his mind. Hey! He began, a mischievous grin appearing on his face. You wanna join in on the fun? We could get some drinks from Weasel and go out on the town. Maybe compete for who can get the most headshots. Peter paused for a moment, considering the offer. Well, I do have a knack for getting involved in these things. He admitted with a chuckle. Sure, let's do it, but let's keep the killing to those that deserve it. Before they could leave, Peter's gaze shifted to Vanessa. Wade noticed this and realized that leaving her behind was no longer an option. The apartment obviously wasn't safe anymore. His paranoia had reached new heights, fearing for her safety whenever he was away. Seeing this, Peter spoke up. Wade, since this place isn't safe anymore, how about I offer some help, he said. I can offer you an official position in the Avengers. We have countless empty apartments in the tower, and it's free for any member. But, uh, try not to destroy it, okay? He really doesn't want to give Wade an apartment, as his track record with such places was horrendous, but if it could keep Vanessa safe and guarantee his recruitment, then he can make the sacrifice. Maybe if it's their apartment, they won't trash it? Peter hoped. Wade hesitated, not wanting to become what he referred to as a do-gooder. However, the prospect of a secure home for Vanessa intrigued him. After all, the safest place on the planet just so happened to be the Avengers Tower. Eh. Wade let out a hesitant grunt. I can still kill bastards, right? Peter nodded his head, grinning under his mask. Sure, but you'll need to follow a few guidelines, he said, causing Wade to whine in annoyance. First, only kill those that deserve it. Second, never kill in front of the public, especially when there are cameras around. And if for some reason you do, then be sure to destroy the footage. Not all Avengers are against killing. The only reason you haven't heard of it is because we do it discreetly. Understand? Wade became contemplative, slowly waving towards a decision. Seeing that Wade still wasn't fully convinced, Peter quickly scribbled some numbers on a piece of paper and passed it over. That's how much you'd be paid as an Avenger. Wade's eyes widened as he glanced at the number. Exclamation point. Is this for real? Vanessa asked as she peeked at the paper, her jaw dropping in astonishment. Peter nodded. Yeah, and that's only for new recruits. Your pay will increase every year. Instantly, a bright smile appeared on Wade's lips, and Peter swore that he could see dollar signs flashing in his eyes. How could I say no? Wade beamed excitedly. I've always looked up to heroes like you and the Avengers, saving people and sending the bad guys to prison. If the world needs me, then I'll gladly rise to the occasion. He said, lying out of his ass to secure the massive payday before him. Right? Peter stared at him, not believing a word that left his mouth. Do me a favor and save this energy for the other Avengers, okay? Ha! Huh? Wade grunted, his fake hero persona disappearing just as fast as it came. Yeah, whatever. He shrugged. 
With their agreement settled, Peter opened a portal, revealing an empty apartment in the Avengers Tower. After packing a bag, Vanessa walked through to settle into their new home, while Wade and Peter stayed behind. And just as she left, Wade and Peter still had some time before Jarvis gave them the info about their dead gunman, so Peter took the opportunity to talk to Wade about something important. Hey, I've actually been meaning to tell you something. Peter quickly explains his ability to fix Wade's appearance. So, you're telling me you've got a way to fix all this ugliness? Wade asked, shocked. Peter nodded. Yeah, I've come up with three possible solutions. It's up to you to choose which one you want to pursue. Wade leaned in, his curiosity peaked. All right, lay him on me, webhead. Peter's gaze turned distant as he explained, the quickest option is an illusion. I studied at Kamartaj and Dash before he could continue, Wade raised his hand like a good student. Yes, Mr. Wilson, what the hell is Lamar Lodge? He asked, butchering the name of an ancient world protecting organization. Just think Hogwarts but better and without the whiny kids, Peter says as he continued. There, I learned a thing or two about magic. I can create an illusion that will make you appear normal again. However, beneath that illusion, you'll still be the same. It's like a temporary fix, a band-aid until we find a more permanent solution. Wade's eyes widened, a glimmer of hope in his scarred face. An illusion, huh? So, people wouldn't be able to see the real me. Peter nodded, his expression serious. Exactly. People would see you as you were, but it wouldn't change the reality underneath. Wade chewed on his bottom lip, mulling over the option. Okay, what's the second one then? Peter's tone shifted, his voice tinged with anticipation. The second option involves body morphing and beautification magic. It's a more long-term solution, but it will take time. I need to work on the spell beforehand, meticulously planning every aspect of the transformation. It won't be a quick fix, but it could potentially give you a permanent change. Wade scratched his chin, his fingers tracing the jagged scars. Permanent, huh? That sounds tempting. But what about the third option? Peter's expression darkened, his voice tinged with caution. That's the riskiest option. Given your cancer and your crazy healing ability, it's hard to predict how your body would react to it. But basically, we would turn you something called the extremist serum. The process could fix your appearance. Though I'm not 100% sure. For all I know, it could cause more problems. Wade's eyes narrowed as he absorbed the information, a mix of excitement and hesitation swirling within him. So, you could have done this the whole time? He suddenly realized that while he was whining and complaining about his appearance, Peter was hiding his ability to fix it. Peter sighed, his gaze softening. Yeah, Wade, I could have helped. But I chose not to. I didn't want the reason Vanessa chose to stay with you to be because you were handsome again. I didn't want your relationship to hinge on something as shallow as appearances. I wanted her to love you for who you are, and it seems like I made the right choice. Wade's breath caught in his throat, and he looked down at the floor, lost in his thoughts. Vanessa's face flashed in his mind, her acceptance and love radiating from her eyes. Wade realized that his fear of denial had dissipated, replaced by a newfound sense of security. Do I even want to fix it anymore? He wondered. And as silence descended on Wade's destroyed apartment, Peter's phone went off with a message from Jarvis. In the penthouse of a thumping nightclub, Sergei Valishnikov, a middle-aged Russian man, covered in tattoos, lay tied to a bed, his body glistening with a sheen of sweat. Above him stood a provocative dominatrix, holding a leather whip in hand, matching her skin-tight outfit. Though just before she could crack the whip once again, their playful encounter came to an abrupt halt as the shrill ring of a phone shattered the sexual atmosphere of the dimly lit room. Sergei's eyes narrowed, annoyance etched across his face. With a slight nod, the woman withdrew a ball gag from his mouth and answered the call, placing the phone against his ear. Sergei growled into the receiver, his voice laced with hostility. Who the hell is calling at this hour? This better be important. Are you busy, Sergei? A familiar voice resonated through the speaker, causing Sergei's eyes to widen in recognition. Instantly, the hostility melted away, replaced by subservience and fear. And Mr. Fisk, my apologies. I wasn't expecting your call. Wilson Fisk, the notorious kingpin of crime, spoke with a calculated calmness. Did you complete the task I assigned to you? Sergei cleared his throat, desperately trying to compose himself. Yes, Mr. Fisk. I sent my best men to take care of him, just as you ordered. He's probably dead by now. There was a momentary silence on the other end of the line, causing Sergei's heart to race. Very well, Sergei. I trust you did your best. We shall discuss the details later. However, I must remind you of the consequences of failure. Fisk's voice remained cool and collected. Sergei's eyes widened, his mind racing. Fisk has many criminal enterprises under his belt, one of which is the Russian mob. He took hold of this organization through the blackmail of its leader, Sergei Valishnikov. And it wasn't just Sergei's masochistic tendencies that Fisk knew about either. The type of information that Fisk had on Sergei could get him hunted by the FBI and ousted from his own organization. So, how could Fisk not know what he was engaged in at this very moment? This knowledge sent shivers down his spine as he stammered into the phone. I assure you, Mr. Fisk, I will not fail you. I'm loyal. You know that? Fisk's voice grew colder, laced with a veiled threat. Remember, Sergei, 
I have ways of learning things. You should be more careful about what you indulge in during your private time. Respect and loyalty are not negotiable in our alliance. Stop. He spoke the word as if it were a joke. Fail me, and I can't guarantee that your secrets won't become public knowledge. Fear gripped Sergei's heart, his breath catching in his throat. Please, Mr. Fisk, I beg you. I'll do whatever it takes to prove my loyalty. He begged, his voice trembling. Without another word, Fisk ended the call, leaving Sergei pleading with the silence, a freaked out dominatrix standing beside the bed. As the weight of the kingpin's power hung heavy in the room, suddenly, the sound of gunshots and screaming seeped through the walls from outside. Sergei's eyes widened, realizing that he was trapped, restricted to the bed by his sexual preferences. Unlock the cuffs. Quickly. Quickly. He turned to the cowering dominatrix, who just moments ago was confidently beating him with a riding crop. Unable to contain her panic, the woman ignored Sergei's pleas for help and rushed out of the room, where she found a hallway filled with dead bodies and two pitch-black figures walking her way. Minus ten minutes earlier, after reading the information from Jarvis, Peter turned his phone to Wade. Do you know this guy? He asked. On the screen was a picture of a Russian man alongside his name. Sergei Valishnikov. Squinting his eyes at the phone for a moment, Wade shook his head. Nope, never seen him before. Really? Because these guys? Peter gestured to the dead bodies laying all over Wade's apartment. Worked for him? Nope, he looks like a side character though. And I don't usually hang around with the lower class, Wade says nonchalantly. My crowd is more along the lines of Ryan Reynolds, Tom Cruise, Denzel Washington. Okay, Peter muttered, stopping Wade before he could name any more celebrities. Then let's go ask him why his men came knocking at your door, he said, opening a portal. Instantly, the loud music and ground-shaking bass of a nightclub echo from the portal. After you, Peter gestured as he snapped his fingers, using the reality stone to cover Wade in a blacked-out version of his Deadpool suit. Hee hee, let's kill some Cossacks. Wade laughed as he grabbed his swords and stepped through. Shaking his head at Wade's excited behavior, Peter stepped into the portal as his own suit turned black as well. I need to get used to going undercover whenever Wade is involved. After all, he didn't want to ruin the perfect poster boy reputation that he spent years carefully cultivating. Stealthily maneuvering their way through the upper floors of the club, away from the nightly party going on downstairs, Peter and Wade went looking for their target, silently taking out any random guards they found along the way. Their blacked-out suits blended seamlessly with the shadows, allowing them to move unnoticed. As they reached the top floor, they found themselves facing a long, narrow hallway. Peter's enhanced senses tingled with the anticipation of danger as he saw a large group of heavily armed Russians gathered at the end of the hallway, a single door behind them, which they seemed to be guarding. Their menacing presence was matched only by the malevolent glint in their eyes. And the moment their gazes locked onto the intruders, the air erupted with the deafening roar of gunfire. Looks like we found our Rusky. Wade said, a wicked smile dancing across his masked face. Peter's reflexes kicked into high gear as he sensed the first bullet whizzing toward him. He gracefully dodged it, his body twisting with an unnatural agility. Using his spider sense, he anticipated the next onslaught of bullets and moved with blinding speed, evading each lethal projectile. Insert Matrix GIF here, Wade, on the other hand, welcomed the hail of bullets with a twisted delight. His regenerative abilities made him virtually invincible, allowing him to withstand the onslaught without flinching. With two katanas in hand, he charged forward, deflecting bullets with deadly precision. And as far as the ones he couldn't stop, Wade would simply take the hit and hope they exited out of his body on the other side. Or else he'd be playing a fun game of operation with Vanessa tonight as she fished the stray bullets out of his body. Though he may have to find a metal detector, as the wounds will heal, leaving no indication as to where he should be looking. But that's a problem for later. As they closed in on the Russian mobsters, Peter's hands shot out, unleashing a volley of webs, expertly ensnaring the guns in their hands. With a quick yank, he disarmed them, sending the firearms clattering to the floor. Dance, anyone? Wade called out, whirling his swords in an intricate display of skill. With a flurry of blows, he slashed through the armed men, slaughtering them swiftly and efficiently. His swordsmanship was unmatched, every movement calculated to create the biggest mess of blood, guts, and other body parts as he could. Peter, who wasn't nearly as messy and excited about killing as Wade, relied on his acrobatic prowess, using the walls and ceiling to his advantage. He launched himself into the air, somersaulting over the dying mobsters, and delivered lightning-fast punches and kicks. His enhanced strength allowed him to quickly kill his enemies with a single blow, rendering them dead within seconds. It was the least he could do. After all, the only other option awaiting them was a blood death from Deadpool himself, so he decided to give them some mercy instead. As the fight raged on, the hallway became littered with fallen bodies. The once formidable group of Russians now lay dead at the hands of the dynamic duo. Peter and Wade fought in perfect synchronization, their movements fluid and precise, like a well-rehearsed ballet of violence and death. With the last mobster dispatched, the hallway fell into an eerie silence, the only sound that remained was the dripping of blood from the mess that Wade made. It was everywhere? They stood there, surveying their handiwork, a victorious gleam in Wade's eyes reflecting his sense of accomplishment. 
That was a piece of cake, Wade quipped, flicking the blood off his katanas. And just before Peter could reply, the door across from them swung open and a curvy dominatrix came rushing out. But just as she arrived, the woman froze in fear at the scene she just walked into and let out an ear-piercing shriek. Aha! She yelled before swaying on her feet and collapsing onto the floor. Right into a large puddle of blood. Ah! Wade grunted as he didn't expect that. Is she alive? Walking over, Peter checked her pulse and found nothing wrong. Yeah, she just fainted, he said, quickly portaling her over to a nearby hospital. Come on, let's meet the boss. Stepping up to the now open door, Peter and Wade halted in their steps as they found a very odd scene in front of them. That explains the dominatrix? Peter muttered as they laid eyes on a naked cowering mob boss, who was tied to a bed with a ball gag hanging around his neck. You! Wade groaned as he took a sniff of the musky air in the room. Somebody's been getting kinky in here. The dimly lit room was filled with tension as Peter and Wade, clad in their blacked out suits, stood across from Sergei, the cowering naked mob boss. Sergei was still strapped to the bed, the fear evident in his eyes as he unleashed a barrage of threats and warnings. Get back! Do you know who I am? Touch me and your entire bloodline won't survive the night. He attempted to assert his authority even in the face of danger. Wade chuckled, seemingly unaffected by Sergei's desperate words. With swift precision, he drew his katanas and plunged them into the bed, just centimeters away from Sergei's exposed private parts. The sharp blade sent a clear message that Sergei wasn't in control right now. Instantly, Sergei's blustering facade crumbled, and he began to realize that his threats were only hurting his already dire situation. Wade, his mask still on, listened intently, relishing the power he had over this guy's balls. A slash N, he really is a sick freak, isn't he, face with raised eyebrow? Hey! I heard that. Wade peered up at the ceiling and shouted, sounding offended. Who are you talking to? Peter asks, wondering if this was one of his fourth wall breaks. Nothing. Wade clicked his tongue as he turned back to their captive. Fat damn author. Look, it'll give you anything. Do you want money? I have millions. Just let me go and it's all yours, okay? Begging for mercy, Sergei offered anything he could think of to secure his survival. As well as the safety of his precious family jewels. How can I refuse your generous donation? Wade happily accepted as he took a seat at the man's bedside. However, before he would accept any kind of offering, Wade knew he needed answers. Removing his mask, he revealed his scarred face and cold eyes, ensuring that Sergei understood the gravity of the situation. Why did you want me dead? Wade demanded, his tone laced with a dangerous edge. He made sure the katanas remained in place, serving as a constant reminder of the pain Sergei would face if he refused to cooperate. Sergei's eyes darted nervously, not recognizing Wade as the target he was tasked to eliminate by Wilson Fisk. W what happened dash Sergei quickly stopped himself and rephrased his question. I mean, who are you? Wade Wilson. He reveals his name. You sent your men to my house? They're dead by the way. I'll send you the bill for the mess they made. Immediately, fear washed over Sergei, torn between the danger posed by these intruders and the repercussions he would face from his own boss. Just the thought of Fisk tightened his lips, unsure whether to remain silent or divulge the information he possessed. As Wade continued to press Sergei, veiled threats barely contained, the mob boss relented. L look, if I talk, I'm in big trouble. He offered a cryptic hint, making the two wonder who wielded enough power to silence him like this. Sergei knew his life hung in the balance, but he also knew that revealing too much could lead to dire consequences. If he talks now, Kingpin will kill him. And if he doesn't talk, then these masked men will probably kill him as well. Both roads lead to death and he couldn't do anything about it. While the conversation unfolded, Peter seized the opportunity to investigate further. Snatching Sergei's phone, he deftly scrolled through the most recent calls and contacts, hoping to uncover evidence of the person responsible for ordering the hit on Wade. Every passing second was crucial as they sought to untangle the web of intrigue surrounding them. Just as Peter began to find valuable information, the sound of a gunshot echoed through the room. Startled, he turned to witness Wade holding his smoking desert eagle, a lifeless Sergei sprawled on the bed. Shock registered on Peter's face as he realized the missed opportunity to extract more information. You should have kept him alive, you idiot. Peter chastised, his disappointment palpable. He knew more than he was saying. Wade shrugged nonchalantly, his annoyance evident. He outlived his usefulness. Besides, he almost killed Vanessa. He deserved a lot worse. Peter sighed, recognizing Wade's impulsive nature. Returning to the phone, Peter went to Sergei's calls and tapped on the most recent number, which called him only 15 minutes ago. Suspicious, Peter thought as the phone began to ring. What are you doing? Wade asks as Peter held his finger to his masked lips, motioning for him to keep quiet as he turned on the speakerphone. Sergei? A deep raspy voice answered. Is the job done? Is he dead? Wade reacted quickly and snatched the phone out of Peter's hand. Hello? Sergei? Fisk called out over the receiver, irritated. Wade grinned beneath his mask, his eyes narrowing as he recognized the voice. Well, hello there, buttercup, he replied, his voice dripping with sarcasm. Don't worry about little old Sergei, your underling didn't suffer for too long. 
As a former member of New York City's underworld, Wade has taken a few jobs from Kingpin, so he could at least recognize the voice. Though he doesn't know the Kingpin's real name or what he looks like. And as he found out who was behind his death order, Wade realized what this was about. So, you're still mad about that time in the Bronx, huh? It's been almost four years, you know? Most people would have moved on by now. Moved on? Fisk nearly shouted from the other end, understanding exactly who he was talking to right now. Not only did you protect the target I paid you to kill, but you even killed my men when they came to do the job that you couldn't. Well, I told you no kids. Wade shrugged as he spoke. So, Mr. Big Shot Kingpin, how about we have a little chat? I'd love to meet up in person. Somewhere private. Just you and me. He offered, threateningly. Kingpin's voice grew cold and menacing. You have no idea who you're dealing with? Oh, I know exactly who I'm dealing with. Wade shot back, his tone growing more serious. You wanted me dead, and you put my fiancé's life at risk. Now it's time for you to bend over and take your punishment like a man. A sigh crept through the receiver as Kingpin spoke. Have a good night, Wade. And make sure to keep that fiancé of yours safe. New York is a very dangerous city, after all. Suck my balls. Toodles. Wade replied cheerfully as the call came to an end. Who was that? Peter asked, feeling as though the voice was familiar. Kingpin. Wade reveals as Peter's eyes widen in realization. He's a big player in this city. I've taken a few jobs from him in the past. The last one ended in a small disagreement. A man in his mid-twenties stood at the entrance of the gate to Kuenluan, his gaze unwavering as he guarded its mystical barrier. Standing at an average height, his athletic build exuded a sense of agility and strength honed through years of intensive martial arts training. His face bore traces of his arduous life, with a rugged handsomeness that spoke of both resilience and determination. His complexion, kissed by the sun, boasted a healthy glow that hinted at his time spent in the secluded city of Kuenluan. Deep, piercing blue eyes shimmered with a mix of curiosity and a hint of sorrow, reflecting the weight of his responsibilities and the losses he had endured. Insert picture of Danny Rand here, the air was still, the only sound being the soft rustling of leaves in the breeze. The gate, a monumental structure of ancient stone, stood imposingly before him. It had been fifteen years since he had last witnessed its opening on the day he arrived, and he had grown accustomed to the solitude of his duty. As he stood there, lost in his thoughts, a hawk suddenly soared across the sky, catching Danny's attention. His eyes followed its graceful flight as it disappeared into the distance. A sense of anticipation surged within him, as he knew that the hawk was leaving Kuan Lin. The gate was open again. The rare event was about to occur, and he had a fleeting opportunity to leave his post and venture out into the world beyond. Danny's hand tightened as his fist began to glow in a yellow light, his mind racing with conflicting emotions. He had spent his entire life training and preparing for this moment, dedicated to protecting Kuenluan from any threat that may come through the gate. Yet, a part of him yearned for something more, a chance to explore the outside world and find his purpose beyond the confines of the mystical city. A solemn smile tugged at the corners of Danny's mouth as he slowly turned his back to Kuenluan, his eyes lingering on the gate one last time. Farewell, he whispered, his voice filled with both gratitude and sorrow. With a decisive step forward, he began his journey, following the hawk's path. Days later, Danny stood on the deck of a large freight ship. The wind blowing his dirty blonde hair as he stood tall, his bare feet planted firmly on the metal deck. He continued to wear the simple attire of a monk, a testament to his dedication and training in Kuenluan. His gaze was fixed on the vast expanse of the open sea, endless possibilities stretching out before him. The rhythmic rocking of the boat brought a sense of calm to Danny's spirit. He closed his eyes, embracing the tranquility of the moment. The boat sailed steadily onward, carrying him toward his new destiny. Finally, the iconic skyline of New York City appeared in the distance. Danny's eyes widened with a mix of nostalgia and excitement. The boat slowly approached the bustling harbor, its engines humming in the background. With each passing moment, the anticipation within him grew stronger. Danny took a deep breath, savoring the scent of the city he had longed to return to for so many years. The boat came to a halt, and he stepped onto the dock, feeling the solid ground beneath his feet. As he took his first steps toward the towering skyscrapers, a sense of familiarity washed over him, a sense of belonging. He looked up at the cityscape, the shimmering glass and steel reflecting the sun's rays. I'm finally home, Danny murmured, a sense of purpose radiating from his every word. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.